October 13th. Golden Ticket. That night, after the visit from the far keep, Marion went into her house and didn't come out again, as far as I could tell. The next day, I stopped by to see if she was okay. She didn't answer the door, and she wasn't at the library either. The day after that, I brought her mail up to the porch. I tried to look in her windows, but her shades were drawn, and the curtains too. I rang the bell again today, but she didn't answer. I sat down on her front steps and leafed through her mail. Nothing out of the ordinary, bills. A letter from Duke University, probably about one of her research grants. And some kind of returned letter, but I didn't recognize the address. King's Langley. Why was that familiar? My head felt foggy, like there was something at the edge of my memory I couldn't reach. That would be mine, I believe. Liv sat down on the step next to me. Her hair was braided and she was wearing cut-off jeans and a periodic table t-shirt. On the surface, Liv seemed the same. But I knew the summer had changed things for her. I never asked you if you were okay after that scene at the library with the council. Are you all right, I mean? I suppose... But what happened at the Temporis Porta scared me more. She looked scared, and far away. Me too. Ethan, I think it was the future. You walked through the door and you were transported to another physical place. That's the way a time portal operates. The far keep hadn't felt like a dream, or even a vision. It was like stepping into another world. I just wished that world wasn't the future. Liv's face clouded over. Something else was bothering her. What is it? I've been thinking. Liv twisted her selenometer nervously. The Temporis Porta only opened for you. Why didn't it let me through? Because bad things keep happening to me? That's what I was thinking, but I didn't say it. I also didn't mention that I'd seen my English teacher in the future. I don't know. So what do we do? The only thing we can, we make sure Marion doesn't go to the far keep. I looked up at her door. Maybe we should be glad she won't come out of the house. Guess I should have known nothing good would come out of sneaking around in Amma's pantry. Except the preserves... Liv smiled weakly. She was trying to distract me from the one thing I could never get away from, myself. Cherry? Strawberry. She said it in two syllables. Strawberry. With a spoon, straight out of the jar. You sound like Ridley. All sugar, all the time. She smiled when I said it. I meant to ask you... How are Ridley and Link and Lena? Ah, uh, you know, Ridley's tearing up the school. She's a cheerleader now. Liv laughed. Siren, cheerleader. I'm not up on American culture, but even I appreciate the similarities. I guess. Link is the biggest big man on campus you've ever seen. The girls hang all over him. He's a real chick magnet. How is Lena? Happy to have her uncle back, I bet. And you? She didn't look at me, and I didn't look at her. When she finally spoke, she looked up into the blazing sun instead of at me. That's how much she didn't want to say it to my face. It's hard for me, you know. I find myself thinking about you. Things I want to tell you, things I think are funny or odd, but you aren't there. I wanted to drop Marion's mail and bolt down the steps. Instead, I took a deep breath. I know. The rest of us are all still together and you're alone. After everything we went through, we bailed on you. It sucks. I finally said it. It had been bothering me since the day we came home to Gatlin, the day Liv disappeared into the tunnels with Macon. I have Macon, 
He's been wonderful to me, almost like a father. She twisted the bits of string that were always tied to her wrist. But I miss you and Marion, and not being able to talk to either of you is horrible, actually. I don't want to get her into any more trouble, but it's like being told you have to give up ice cream or prawn crisps or Ovaltine. I know. I'm sorry it's all so weird. What was weird was this conversation. It was so much like Liv to be the one brave enough to have it. She looked sideways at me and half smiled. I was thinking after I saw you yesterday. It's not like I can't speak to you without trying to kiss you. You're not that irresistible. Tell me about it. I wish I could print up a sign and tape it to my forehead. I officially do not want to kiss Ethan Waite. Now please let me be friends with him. Maybe we could make t-shirts that say platonic or not dating, unattracted. Liv took the returned letter out of the pile with a sigh. This was me feeling sorry for myself a few weeks ago. I wrote home and asked if they'd have me back. I realized I knew next to nothing about Liv's family. Home, home? Your family? Just my mother. My father's long gone. You know, the glamorous life of a theoretical physicist. But no, this was a feeble attempt to get her to send me to Oxford, actually. I turned the university down to come here, and it seemed like it was time for me to go. Or, at least, it did then. And now? I didn't want her to leave. Now I feel like I can't leave Marion until this whole mess is sorted out. I nodded, picking at my shoelaces. I'd be happy if she would just come out of her house. But I didn't want to think about the future she might be facing if she did. I know. She isn't at the library either. Maybe she needs some time. Of course, Liv had been making the same rounds I had. We were so alike in more ways than one, more than being the only mortals in the equation. You know, you were pretty brave back there in the library. She smiled. Wasn't it amazing? I was quite proud. Then I got in bed and cried for about ten hours straight. I don't blame you. It was hardcore, and she'd only seen the half of it, the far keep, was so much worse. Last night, I started in just as she said, You know, I have to go. My timing was off, as usual, and our sentences tripped over each other. We sat there for a minute while the awkwardness set in. Still, I couldn't bring myself to leave. She stood up, brushing off her shorts. I'm glad we had a chance to catch up. Me too. As she walked down the carefully kept path that led to Marion's gate, I had an idea. Not a perfect idea, but a decent one. Wait up! I pulled a folded orange flyer out of my pocket. Take it. Liv unfolded it. What's this? An invitation to Savannah Snow's party after the basketball game against Somerville on Saturday night. It's the hottest ticket in town. That was hard to say with a straight face. How did you and Lena get invited to a party at Savannah's house? You underestimate the combined powers of a former siren and a lincubus. She put the paper in her pocket. So, you want to add an expelled keeper in training into the mix? I'm not sure we'll actually go, but Link and Ridley definitely will. You should come, too, and hang out, like old times. She hesitated. I'll think about it. Think about it? Won't it be a little awkward if you and Lena are there? Of course it would. Why would it be awkward? I tried to sound convincing. Why do people say things like that? I don't know how comfortable Lena will feel around me. She searched the sky as if the answer was hidden in the unbroken blue universe. 
Which is why we need those T-shirts, I suppose. I jammed my hands into my pockets, trying to come up with an answer to that. You brought Macon back. You stood up for Marion. Lena respects you and what you did to help both of us. You practically live at Ravenwood, under it at least. You're like family. She narrowed her eyes, studying my face as if she didn't quite believe me, which made sense since part of it wasn't true. Maybe. Possibly. That's the best I can do under the circumstances. I'll take that as a yes. I have to get back. Macon's waiting for me, but I'll consider going to the party. She took a key out of her pocket and held it up. It was a crescent key, like the one Marion had. Now Liv could open the outer doors that connected the mortal and caster worlds. There was something right about that. She waved and disappeared around the corner while I turned back to the dark house, shades still drawn. I left the mail in a pile on the rocker by Marion's door and hoped it would be gone in the morning. I hoped my memories of the temporis porta would be gone even sooner. You did what? Please tell me you're joking. We were at the Cineplex, standing in line for popcorn. Lena wasn't as happy about the whole making peace with Liv thing as I had hoped. Actually, she was exactly as unhappy about it as I'd predicted. But if Liv decided to come to the party, Lena was going to find out that I was the one who had invited her. It was better to take the hit now. An angry girlfriend was one thing. An angry caster girl meant you could lose a limb or step off a cliff. I had planned to tell Lena about finding the Temporis Porta with Liv last night, but considering her reaction to the party invite, it seemed better to wait on that one. So I had to come clean about the rest. I sighed and repeated my argument, even though it was going to get me nowhere. If you had anything to worry about, would I invite Liv somewhere I might be going with you? Don't you think I'd make some kind of secret plans? What kind of secret plans? I shrugged. I don't know, because I don't have any. But let's say that you did. But I don't. This was going downhill fast. Ethan, this is hypothetical. This is a trap. I knew better than to engage in hypothetical questions with a girl. We reached the counter and I pulled out my wallet. Well, Lena looked at me like I was crazy. The usual. The usual. What was the usual? My mind was totally blank. The usual, I repeated dumbly. She gave me a look and then turned to the cashier. Popcorn and milk duds, please. Are you okay? Yeah, I just blanked. I don't know. The cashier slid Lena's popcorn over the counter and looked at me. I scanned the list on the wall. And how about popcorn and hot tamales? Hot tamales? They don't have red hots, L. You thinking about someone I know? I shrugged. Of course I was. Ama wasn't making egg rolls with her cleaver or pie filling with the one-eyed menace. Her sharp number two pencils were in the drawer, and I hadn't seen a crossword puzzle on the kitchen table in weeks. Ethan, don't worry about Ama. She'll come out of it. Ama's never gone dark for this long before. We have a bottle tree in our front yard. Since Abraham showed up at your house? More like since school started. Lena dumped her milk duds into the popcorn tub. If you're this worried about it, why don't you ask her? You ever try to ask Ama something? Yeah? No? Maybe we need to go see this Bacor for ourselves. No offense, El, but he's not the kind of guy you want to take your girlfriend to see. 
and I'm not sure an actual caster would be safe there. The whole cheer squad passed by us. Ridley was walking with some guy I didn't know, who had his hand in the back pocket of her stretchy skirt. He wasn't from Jackson. Somerville was my guess. Savannah was hanging on Link, who was staring at Ridley while she pretended not to notice him. Emily walked behind them with Charlotte and Eden, and you could see the rage on Savannah's face. She wasn't the one holding up the pyramid anymore. You sitting with us? Link called out as he passed. Savannah smiled and waved. Lena looked at the two of them as if they were walking down the street in their underwear. I'm never going to get used to that, she said. Me neither. Did you explain to Rid about the last four rows of the cineplex? Oh, no. So we ended up wedged between Link and Savannah and Ridley and the guy from Somerville in the last four rows. The credits had barely started before Savannah was whispering and giggling into Link's neck, which as far as I could tell was just an excuse to get her mouth up near his. I elbowed him as hard as I could. Ow! Ridley's sitting right there, man. Yeah, with that tool. You want her crawling all over him like that? Ridley wasn't the kind of girl who got mad. She got even. Link leaned forward, looking past Lena and me to where Ridley was sitting. The Somerville tool already had his hand on her leg. When she saw Link watching, she snaked her arm through the guise and tossed her pink and blonde hair. Then she pulled out a lollipop and began unwrapping it. Link shifted in his seat. Yeah, you're right. I'm going to have to kick his... Lena grabbed the sleeve of his shirt before Link got up. You're not doing anything. Just behave, and she will, and then maybe you can actually start dating like normal people and stop this stupid game. Shh, the Somerville tool shot us a look. Shut up. Some of us are trying to watch the movie. Yeah, right, Link yelled back at him. I know what you're trying to watch. Link gave me a pleading look. Please let me go outside and beat the crap out of him before I miss any of the good parts. You know I'm going to end up doing it anyway. He had a point, but he was a lincubus, and the rules were different now. You ready to let Ridley beat the crap out of Savannah? Because you know she'll do it. He shook his head. I don't know how much more of this I can take. Rid's driving me nuts. For a second... The old Link was back, hung up on the girl who would always be out of his league. Maybe that was it. Maybe he would always think Ridley was out of his league, even though his league had changed. You have to ask her to Savannah's party, as your date. It was the only way to defuse this particular bomb. You kidding me? That's like asking for an open war with the whole squad— Savannah already has me doing all this extra stuff, coming over early to set up and everything. I'm just calling it like I see it. I dug into my hot tamales popcorn. My mouth was burning, which seemed like a sign. Time to keep it shut. I wasn't giving out any more advice. By the end of the night, Link had beaten the crap out of the Somerville tool in the parking lot. Ridley called Link every name in the book, and Savannah stepped in. For a minute, it looked like there was going to be a serious catfight, until Savannah remembered her arm was still in a sling and pretended the whole thing was a big misunderstanding. When I got home, there was a note taped to my front door. It was from Liv. I changed my mind. See you at the party. XO Liv. X-O. That was just something girls wrote at the end of notes, right? Right. I was dead. October 18th. A real bad girl. 
It took more than a little convincing to get Ama to let me go to Savannah Snow's party, and it wasn't like she wouldn't notice if I tried to sneak out. Ama never went anywhere anymore. She hadn't gone home to Waiters Creek once since she pulled the tarot spread that sent her into a voodoo queen's crypt. She wouldn't admit it, but when I asked her why she never went back home anymore, she got defensive. You think I can leave the sisters to keep an eye on themselves? You know Thelma hasn't been the least bit clear herself since the accident. Oh, Miss Alma, quit your fussin'. I only get the eensiest bit confused now and again. Thelma called from the next room, where she was straightening the couches just so. Aunt Mercy liked one pillow and two blankets. Aunt Grace liked two pillows and one blanket. Aunt Mercy didn't like used blankets, which meant you had to wash them before she'd let them near her. Aunt Grace didn't like pillows that smelled like hair, even if it was her own. The sad thing was, since the accident, I knew more about their pillow preferences and hiding places for coffee ice cream than I ever wanted to know. The accident. The accident used to mean my mom's car crash. Now it was polite southern code for Aunt Prue's condition. I didn't know if it made me feel better or worse, but once Amma started invoking the accident, there was no getting her to change her mind. Still, I tried. They don't stay up past eight o'clock. How about we all hang out and play Scrabble together, and then all go out once everyone is asleep? Amma shook her head as she pulled trays of cookies in and out of the oven. Snickerdoodles, molasses, shortbread, cookies, not pie. Cookies were for delivery. She never fed cookies to the greats. I don't know why, but the greats weren't much for cookies, which meant she still wasn't talking to them. Who are you baking for tonight, Amma? What, you're too good for my cookies now? No, but you took the paper doilies out, which means these aren't for me. Amma started arranging the cookies on the tray. Well, aren't you a smart one? Taking these down to county care. Thought those nice nurses might want a cookie or two to keep them company these long nights. So, can I go? You're simpler than I thought if you're thinking Savannah Snow wants you anywhere near her place. It's just a regular old high school party. She lowered her voice. There's no such thing as a regular old high school party when you're taking a caster and an incubus and a worn-out siren with you. Turns out Amma could even whisper a pretty fierce scolding. Then she slammed the oven door and stood there with an oven-mitted hand on each hip. Quarter incubus, I whispered back, like that changed anything. It's at the Snow's house. You know what they're like. I did my best impression of Reverend Blackwell. Fine, God-fearing folk. Keep a Bible right next to the bed. Amma glared at me. I gave it up. Nothing's gonna happen. If I had a nickel for every time you've said that, I'd be living in a castle. Amma covered the cookies in plastic wrap. If the party's at the Snow's house, why are you going anyhow? Didn't even invite you last year, as I recollect. I know, but I thought it would be fun. I met Lena on the corner of Dove Street because she'd had even less luck with her uncle and ended up sneaking out of her house. She was so afraid Amma would see her and send her back home that she parked the hearse a block away, not like her car was hard to miss. Macon had made it clear no one was going to any parties, not while the order was still broken, especially not at the Snows. Ridley had made it equally clear she was going. How did they expect her to fit in as a mortal if she wasn't allowed to do normal things with her new mortal friends? Things were thrown. In the end, Aunt Dell caved even if Macon didn't. 
So Ridley had walked right out the front door while Lena was left to find a way to sneak out. He thinks I'm in my room sulking because he wouldn't let me go out. Lena sighed, which is where I was until I figured out my exit strategy. How did you get out? I asked. I had to use like 15 different casts, hiding, blinding, forgetting, disguising, duplicating. Duplicating? You mean you cloned yourself? That was a new one. Just my scent. Anyone who casts a revelation on the house might be fooled for a minute or two. She sighed. But there's no fooling Uncle Macon. I'm dead when he finds out I'm gone. You think it's bad living with a seer? All Uncle Macon wants to do is practice his mind-hunting skills. Awesome. So we have all night. I pulled her closer to me, and she leaned her back up against her car. Um, maybe longer. There's probably no way I'll get back inside tonight. The place is bound a thousand times over. You can stay with me if you want to. I kissed her neck, working my way up to her ear. My mouth was already burning, but I didn't care. Why are we going to this stupid party again when we have a perfectly good car right here? She pushed up onto her toes, kissing me until my head was pounding as hard as my heart. Then she pulled back, ducking away. Aunt Mercy and Aunt Grace would really love that, wouldn't they? It would almost be worth it to see the looks on their faces when I came down to breakfast in the morning. Maybe I could wear one of your towels. She started to laugh, and I pictured it all right. Only the shrieking in my head was so loud, I gave up. Let's just say the language could get a whole lot stronger than Fanny. I bet they'd call the derned police. She was right. Yeah, but I'm the one they'd have arrested for compromising your virtue. Then I guess we better pick up Link before you have the chance. I couldn't remember the last time I'd set foot in Savannah's house, but I started to feel uncomfortable the minute we walked up to the stairs. There were pictures of her everywhere, wearing sparkly tiaras and all kinds of Miss Aren't I Better Than You sashes, posing with her cheer uniform and pom-poms, and a whole row of what I guess were supposed to be modeling headshots, featuring Savannah in bathing suits with fake eyelashes and too much lipstick. From the looks of it, she'd been wearing lipstick since she got out of diapers. Turns out the Snows didn't really need party decorations. Past the table covered with a hundred basketball cupcakes, past the punch bowl with little plastic basketballs frozen into the ice ring, past the chicken salad sandwiches made into basketballs with little round cookie cutters, Savannah was the biggest decoration of all. She was still wearing her cheer uniform, but she had written Link's name on one cheek and drawn a giant pink heart on the other. She stood in the middle of the backyard, waiting, smiling, generally lighting up the place as if she was the Christmas tree at a Christmas party. And the minute Savannah saw Link, it was like someone had flipped the switch that turned on all her lights. Wesley Lincoln! Hey there, Savannah. Savannah was hoping for some serious sparks between them, but she didn't have a chance. When it came to Link, there was only one girl who could cause that kind of spark, and it was only a matter of minutes until she arrived and really lit up the place. More like an hour. That's when Ridley got there and ratcheted things up a notch, or two, or two hundred. Evening, boys. Link's head whipped around when he saw her, and he broke into a smile about a mile wide, confirming what I knew all along. Ridley was still under his skin, and pretty much everywhere else. I knew what that kind of radar felt like. It was the way I felt about Lena. Uh-oh, this isn't good, El. I know. Come on, I think it's going to get ugly. 
I took Lena's hand and turned to leave, and there was Liv. Lena shot me a look. Crap. With everything else going on, I'd forgotten all about giving Liv the invitation. Lena, Liv smiled. Liv? Lena sort of smiled. I didn't know if you were coming. Really? I left Ethan a note. Liv smiled at me pointedly. Really? Lena shot me a look that said I'd be hearing about this later. Liv shrugged. Well, you know Ethan. Don't you? That's what Lena heard. Yeah, I do. Lena wasn't smiling anymore. I started to panic and noticed the punch table a good fifteen feet away. That seemed like a safe distance. I'm going to get something to eat. Anybody want anything? Nope. Liv smiled at me like everything was fine. Not a thing. Lena smiled at me like she was about to kill me. I escaped as quickly as I could. Mrs. Snow was standing by the punch bowl talking to two men I'd never seen before. They were both wearing university caps and collared shirts. It's a surprise, Mrs. Snow told them. That's why my daughter wanted to throw this little get-together. She wanted you to be able to talk to Wesley in a casual environment. That sure was kind of your daughter, ma'am. Savannah's a very thoughtful girl, always putting others first. And her boyfriend Wesley is a real talented basketball player. That's why my husband asked y'all to come up. And Wesley comes from a good, church-going family. His mother's got a hand in everything that goes on in this town. I froze at the table, a chocolate basketball jammed halfway into my mouth. They were college scouts, and they were here to meet Link. I looked across the yard to where Link and Savannah were dancing, and Ridley was circling like a shark. Rid would make her move any minute now, striking so fast that there would be nothing left but blood in the water. I took off, nearly knocking over the punch bowl in the process. Sorry, Savannah, I need to talk to Link for a minute. I grabbed Link and hauled him out Savannah's back gate. What the hell? Link looked at me like I was crazy. There are scouts in there from the university. Mrs. Snow set this whole thing up for you, and if you let Ridley get near Savannah tonight, you're going to blow everything. What are you talking about? He looked confused. Basketball. College recruiters. It's your ticket out of here. He shook his head. Nah, dude, you got it all wrong. I don't want a ticket out of this town. I just want a ticket out of this party. You what? He was already shaking his head and walking back to the party. It's not Savannah. It never was. It's Ridley, good or bad. He looked at me like he was telling me he had a fatal disease or something. I can't shake it. Shake what, Shrinky Dink? Ridley was standing with her back against the gate. Unlike the rest of the girls on the squad, she wasn't wearing her cheer uniform. Her green dress was so tight in some places and slit so high in others, you weren't exactly sure where to look. Link moved closer to her. Come on, Rid, I want to talk to you. That's not what your little girlfriend said. She said you didn't want to talk to me. In fact, she told me to get the hell off her property. Savannah's not my girlfriend. I tried to pretend I didn't know what was about to happen. I tried not to listen or care, but I could hear the desperation in Link's voice. It's never been anyone but you. What are you talking about? She froze, but it was too late. Link couldn't stop himself. Sometimes I think crazy things, like I want to be with you forever. We could live in an RV and see the world. I mean, the parts you can drive to, and you could write songs and I could play them at gigs. Can't you see it?
Ridley's face looked like it was about to crack into a thousand tiny pieces. I don't know what to say. Say you'll be my girl, the way it used to be. I could see her wavering, and I realized how hard it must be to be her right now, because she wasn't the Ridley she used to be, any more than he was the Link he used to be. Nothing was the same, not for anyone. Then she noticed Lena and Liv watching from one side, and me standing there on the other, her face clouded over. Ridley wasn't going to crack, especially not in front of us. What are you on, Shrinky Dink? Come on, Rid, you're my girl. Stop pretending you don't feel the same way about me. I'm a siren. I'm nobody's girl. I don't feel anything, and I don't fall in love. I can't. She started to back away. It's always been just a gig. Rid, you're not a siren anymore. You're never gonna be one again. Ridley spun around, her blue eyes raging. That's where you're wrong. I'm not going to be stuck in this pathetic excuse for a town forever, and there's no way I'm traveling the world in some crappy trailer with you. I have plans. Ridley! Link sounded miserable. Big plans. And I can tell you right now, they have nothing to do with you. She turned to face the rest of us. Any of you! Link looked like she'd slapped him in the face. For a guy who spent most of his time joking around, I'd never heard him lay it out like that to a girl. As Ridley walked toward the gate, Link kicked the lawn chair next to him, sending it flying. Across the yard, Savannah saw her chance and took it. She smoothed her blonde hair and pushed her way through the crowd to Link. She slid her hands up his t-shirt. Come on, Link, let's dance. The next minute, they were dancing and Savannah was all over him. Lena, Liv, and I stared as if we were watching a three-car pileup on Route 9. You couldn't turn away. Liv scrunched up her nose. Should we be letting this happen? Lena shrugged. I don't see what we can do to stop it, unless you want to go over there. No thanks. That's when Savannah, who clearly didn't realize she was dancing with a heartbroken guy whose hopes and dreams of true love and record deals and RV parks across the country had just been shattered, moved in for the kill. The three of us collectively held our breath. Right there under the twinkling lights, Savannah took Link's face in her hands and pulled him toward her. Bollocks, Link hid her face. This is bad. Lena didn't want to look either. We're screwed. I braced myself. The kiss lasted for a full twenty seconds, until Ridley happened to look over her shoulder. You could probably hear the sound a half a mile away. Ridley was standing behind the gate at the edge of Savannah's backyard, screaming so loud that everyone at the party stopped dancing. She was holding her scorpion belt, her lips moving as if she was casting. She can't be, Lena whispered. I grabbed Lena's hand. We have to stop her. She's lost it. But it was too late. A minute later, everything turned into complete and total chaos. I felt the cast rip through the party like a wave, and you could almost see it hitting one person and moving on to the next. You could tell where it had hit from the angry expressions and the shouting left in its wake. One minute, couples were dancing. The next, they were fighting. Guys were shoving each other while unsuspecting victims tried to move out of the way until the cast hit them, and then they were the ones doing the pushing and yelling. I heard the punch bowl shatter on the floor, 
but I couldn't see it through the crowd of cheerleaders pulling each other's hair and basketball players tackling each other. Even Mrs. Snow was screaming at the college scouts, giving them enough pieces of her mind to keep them from ever crossing the county line again. Lena's eyes went dark. I can feel it. A furor. She grabbed Liv and me, pulling us toward the gate. But it was too late. I knew as soon as it hit, because Liv turned and slapped Lena across the face as hard as she could. Have you lost your mind? Lena held her cheek, which was already turning an angry shade of red. Liv pointed at her, the heavy black selenometer turning on her wrist. That is for all the whining, princess. What? Lena's hair started to curl, her green and gold eyes narrowing. Liv went on. Poor beautiful me. My gorgeous boyfriend is so in love with me, but my heart is broken because, hey, that's how beautiful emo girls like me are supposed to act. Shut up. Lena looked like she was about to punch Liv in the face. I heard thunder rumble in the sky. Instead of being happy that a great guy loves me, I'm going to slap on some more black nail polish and run off with some other gorgeous guy. That's not what happened. Lena swung at Liv, but I caught her arm. Rain started to fall. Liv kept talking, and, wait for it, I'm the most powerful caster in the universe, in case the rest of you lowly mortals didn't already feel like total crap. Are you crazy? Lena screamed at her, but it was hard to hear over all the chaos. My uncle died. I thought I was going dark. Do you know what it feels like to hang out with a guy when you have feelings for him? Help him look for his girlfriend who doesn't want to be found? Watch him break his own heart and yours over some stupid caster girl who doesn't give a rat's ass about him? Lightning ripped across the sky, the rain pelting us like hailstones. Lena lunged for Liv. I moved in front of Lena, holding her back. Liv, that's enough. You're wrong. I had no idea what Liv was doing, but I wanted her to shut up. Feelings for him? At least you finally admit it. Lena was screaming. I don't admit anything except that you're a bloody little bitch who thinks the world orbits around your pretty little curls. That was it. Lena wrenched her arms free and slammed her hands into Liv's shoulders. Liv fell backward, hitting the ground hard. Lena wasn't going to let her have the last word. Or the last hit. Okay, little miss, I'm not here to steal your boyfriend, Lena imitated Liv's voice. Really, we're just friends, even though I'm smarter and blonder than the rest of you combined. And did I mention my cute little British accent? Liv kicked mud at her, but Lena moved out of the way just in time. Lena didn't stop there. And if that's not enough, let me martyr myself so you can spend the rest of your life feeling guilty. Or maybe... I can spend all my time with your uncle, so he can think of me as the daughter he never had. Oh, wait, he already has one of those. But who cares? Because if Lena has it, I'm going to try to take it. Liv scrambled to her feet and tried to slip past me. I held on to her. Stop it! You're acting like idiots! It's a cast! You don't even realize who you should be mad at. And you do? Lena screamed, trying to reach around me to grab Liv's hair. Of course I do, but the only person I'm angry at isn't here. I bent down and picked up Ridley's scorpion belt from the muddy grass. I handed it to Lena. It's Ridley, and she's gone, so I have no one to yell at. I heard the beater's engine gunning. 
I pointed out the gate, and we watched the beater peel away from the curb. Actually, I think there's someone even angrier at her than I am, and it looks like he's taking off to find her. You really think this is some kind of cast? Lena looked at Liv. No, I think we always fight like stray dogs in the street when we try to socialize at parties. Liv rolled her eyes. See, there you go, having to be the smart one all the time. Lena tried to pull free, but I clamped down harder on both of their arms. It's a furor, you moron, Liv snapped. I'm a moron? I said furor before this whole thing started. I pushed them both through the gate in front of me. You're both acting like morons. And now we're going to get in the car and go up to Ravenwood. And if you two can't say something nice to each other, don't say anything. But I didn't have to worry, because if there was one thing I had figured out about girls, it was that pretty soon they would give up trashing each other. They'd be too busy trashing me. That's because he's afraid to make a decision, Liv said. No, it's because he doesn't want to upset anyone, Lena snapped. How would you know? He never says what he's thinking. That's not it. He never thinks about what he's saying, Lena fired back. Enough! I pulled through the crooked iron gates of Ravenwood, furious at both of them, furious at Ridley, furious at how the year was turning out. Furor, that was the right name for it, whatever this was. I hated feeling this way, and I hated it even more because I knew the feelings were real, even if it took a spell to bring them out into the open. Lena and Liv were still fighting when we got out of the car. Even though they knew they were under the influence of a cast, they couldn't help themselves, or maybe they didn't want to. The three of us walked toward the front door, and I stayed between them, just in case. Why don't you give us some space? Lena pushed in front of Liv. Ever heard of a third wheel? Liv pushed her back. Like I wanted to come here, so once again I'm supposed to clean up your mess. Then you'll forget all about me until next time. I wasn't listening anymore. I was looking at Ridley's window. I saw a shadow pass in front of it, behind the curtains. All I could see was a silhouette, but I could tell it wasn't Ridley. Link must have gotten here first, except I didn't see the beater. I think Link's in there. I don't care. Ridley has a lot of explaining to do. Lena was halfway up the staircase when I crossed the threshold. I sensed the change immediately. The air itself felt different, lighter somehow. I looked back at Liv. Her expression looked the way I felt, confused, disoriented. Ethan, does something feel weird to you? Yeah. It's the furor, Liv said. It's broken. The magic can't pass the bindings. Ridley, where are you? Lena was steps from her cousin's door. When she reached it, she threw open the door without knocking. She didn't seem to care if Link was in there or not. But it didn't matter. The guy in Ridley's room wasn't Link. October 18th. Hostage. What the hell? I heard his voice before I saw him, because he probably wasn't expecting to see me in Ridley's room any more than I was expecting to find him here. John Breed was sprawled out on Ridley's pink shag carpet, with a video game controller in one hand and a bag of Doritos in the other. John? Lena was as surprised as I was. You're supposed to be dead. John Breed? Here? It's not possible. Liv was shocked. John dropped the bag and jumped to his feet. Sorry to disappoint you. I stepped in front of Lena and Liv protectively. 
I know I'm disappointed. Lena didn't need protecting. She pushed past me. How dare you come into my house after everything you did? You pretended to be my friend when all you wanted to do was take me to Abraham. Thunder rumbled outside. Every word you said to me was a lie. That's not true. I didn't know what they were going to do. Bring me the Bible, the Book of Moons, whatever you want. I'll swear on it. We can't do that, since Abraham has it. I was pissed off, and I didn't want to listen to John play dumb. It was a new tactic, and I was still trying to adjust to the fact that he was hanging out in Ridley's bedroom eating Doritos. Lena wasn't finished. If that wasn't bad enough, you turned Link into... You! Lena's hair was curling, and I hoped the room wasn't about to catch fire. I couldn't help it. Abraham can make me do things. John was pacing. I... I can't even remember most of what happened that night. I crossed the room until I was standing right in front of him. I didn't care if he could kill me. Do you remember dragging Lena up to that altar and tying her down? Do you remember that part? John stopped pacing and stared at me, his green eyes searching mine. When he spoke, I could barely hear him. No. I hated him. The memory of his hands on Lena, of almost losing her that night. But he looked like he was telling the truth. John dropped down on the bed. I black out sometimes. It's been that way since I was a kid. Abraham says it's because I'm different. But I don't believe him. Are you saying you think he has something to do with it? Liv pulled out her red notebook. John shrugged. I don't know. Lena looked at me. What if he's telling the truth? What if he's not? None of that explains why you're in Ridley's bedroom, Lena said, or how you got into Ravenwood. John stood up and walked over to the window. Why don't you ask that manipulative cousin of yours? He sounded pissed off for a guy who had just been caught breaking and entering. Lena's expression darkened. What does Ridley have to do with this? John shook his head, kicking a pile of dirty clothes. I don't know. How about everything? She's the one who trapped me here. I don't know if it was the way he said it, or because we were talking about Ridley, but part of me believed him. Back up. What do you mean she trapped you? He shook his head. Technically, she trapped me twice, first in the arc light and then in here when she let me out. Let you out? Lena looked stunned. But we buried the arc light. And your cousin dug it up and brought it here. She released me, and I've been stuck in this house ever since. This place is bound so tight, I can't get any farther than the kitchen. The bindings. It wasn't keeping something out of Ravenwood. It was keeping someone in, just like I thought. When did she let you out? Sometime in August, I guess. I remembered the day Lena and I came in here to go down into the tunnels. The rip I thought I'd heard. August? You've been in here for two months? Lena was losing it. You're the one who's been helping Ridley. That's how she's casting. John laughed, but it sounded like bitterness more than anything. Helping her? Thanks to your uncle's library, she's been using me as her own personal genie. Consider this dump my bottle. But how did she keep Macon from finding you? Liv was writing down every word. An occultatio, a concealment cast. Of course, she made me do it. He banged the wall with his fist, revealing the black tattoo that snaked its way around his upper arm. Another reminder that he was dark, no matter what color his eyes were. 
Lena's uncle has a book about almost everything, except how to get out of this place. I didn't want to listen to him complain about the way he'd been treated. I'd hated John since the first time I saw him last spring, and now he had shown up to ruin our lives again. I looked over at Lena, whose face was unreadable, her thoughts closed off. Was this the way she felt about Liv? Except Liv hadn't tried to kidnap my girlfriend and lead most of my friends to their deaths. That's funny because I've got a few bottles hanging on a tree in my front yard, and I'd love to stuff you into one of them, I said. John appealed to Lena. I'm trapped. I can't get out of here, and your nutbag cousin promised to help me. But she needed me to do a few things for her first. He ran his hand through his hair, and I noticed he didn't look as cool as I remembered. In his wrinkled black t-shirt and five o'clock shadow, he looked like he'd been watching soap operas and eating a lot of Doritos. Ridley's not a siren. She's an extortionist. But how have you been helping her if you can't leave Ravenwood? Liv asked. It was a good question. Have you been teaching her to cast? John laughed. Are you kidding? I turned cheerleaders into zombies and some party into a rumble. You think Ridley could pull off a furor? She can barely tie her own shoes as a mortal. Who do you think has been doing her math homework all year? Not me. Lena was softening, I could tell, and it was killing me. He was like a painful, nasty infection that wouldn't go away. Then how is she casting if you didn't teach her? John pointed to the belt around Lena's waist. That thing. He yanked on an empty belt loop at the top of his jeans. It acts as a conduit. Ridley wears the belt, and I do the casting. The creepy scorpion belt. No wonder she never took it off. It was her lifeline to the caster world and John Breed, the only way she could have any power of her own. Liv shook her head. I hate to say it, but it all makes sense now. It did make sense, but that didn't change anything for me. People lied, and John Breed was a liar, as far as I was concerned. I turned to Lena. You don't actually believe any of this. There's no way we can trust him. Lena looked from Liv to me. What if he's telling the truth? He knew about the cheerleaders and the party. I think I agree with Liv. It all makes sense. You two are going to start agreeing now? Ethan, it was a cast. A furor cast makes people uncontrollably angry. Sure seemed real to me. I looked at John, skeptical. There's no way to know for sure. John sighed. I'm still in the room, you know. Lena glanced at the door. Well, there is one way. Liv looked at her, nodding. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Hello? John looked at me. Are they always like this? Yes. No. Shut up. Reese was standing in the middle of Ridley's room, her arms crossed disapprovingly. In her sweater set and pearls, she looked like she had been shipped in from some other, more proper southern family. She wasn't happy about being used as a human lie detector, and seemed even more annoyed to see John Breed in her sister's room. Maybe Reese had some misguided fantasy that Ridley was going to become a Girl Scout like her, now that she was mortal. But once again, her sister was bringing her down by association. Come to think of it, it was too bad that D.A.R. had the whole bloodline requirement. Reese could have founded her own chapter. If you think I'm keeping this a secret, you two are crazier than my sister. This is so over the line. Neither one of us wanted a lecture from Reese, 
But Lena didn't give up. We aren't asking you to keep it a secret. We want to know if he's telling the truth before we tell Uncle Macon what's been going on. Lena was probably hoping John was lying, that Ridley hadn't been hiding a dangerous incubus stolen from the grave and channeling his powers. It wasn't clear which was worse. Because you're about to be grounded for the rest of your life? Reese asked. Something along those lines. Reese tapped her foot impatiently. As long as we're clear, you are telling Uncle Macon, or I will. Of course she would. She couldn't pass up a good grounding. I was worried about more than her ratting us out. Are you sure this will work since... Since what? Reese snapped. Since my powers have been a little inconsistent? Is that what you're trying to say? Great. An angry Reese was never a good thing. I... I just meant... Are you sure you'll know if he's lying? It was too late to backpedal now. Reese looked like she wanted to tear my head off. Not that it's any of your business, but I'm still a Sybil. Whatever I see in his face is the truth. If my powers are off, I won't see anything. Lena slid between us. You're in over your head. I've got this. Thanks. I've been dealing with Reese the Beast a lot longer than you have. It's an acquired skill. Reese... Lena took her hand, and I could see her hair begin to curl. I winced. Casting at a caster was almost never a good idea. You're the most powerful Sybil I've ever met. Don't try that on me, Reese pulled her hand away. I'm the only Sybil you've ever met. But you know I trust you no matter what. Lena smiled encouragingly at her cousin. Reese frowned at both of us. I looked away, misfiring powers or not. I wasn't looking into the eyes of a Sybil if I could help it. I noticed Liv hadn't said a word or looked in Reese's direction either. One shot. Then you're telling Uncle Macon either way because this whole thing shows, once again, why you should not be allowed to cast when you're underage. She folded her arms again. It took me a while to figure out that was a yes. John hopped off the bed and walked over to where Reese was standing. Let's get this over with. What do I have to do? Reese stared into John's green eyes, studying his face, as if it held all the answers we were looking for. You're doing it. John didn't move. He stared back at Reese, letting her absorb his thoughts and memories. Reese turned away before he did, shaking her head as if she didn't like what she'd seen. It's true. He didn't know what Abraham and Seraphine were planning, and he doesn't remember what happened that night. Ridley let him out of the arc light, and he's been here ever since, doing my sister's dirty work. John looked at me. Satisfied? Wait, how is that possible? Reese shrugged. Sorry to disappoint you. He's not evil. He's just a jerk. Sometimes it's a fine line. Hey, John looked less smug now. I thought you were supposed to be the nice one. Where's that famous Ravenwood hospitality? Reese ignored him. I should have been relieved, but Reese was right. I was disappointed. I didn't want John to be one of Seraphine and Abraham's pawns. I wanted him to be one of the bad guys. That's how I saw him, how I would always see him. More than anything... I wanted Lena to see him that way. Lena wasn't thinking about John. We have to talk to my uncle. We have to find Ridley before she does anything stupid. Right. If I knew Ridley, she was probably hitchhiking her way out of Somerville by now. After the stunt she pulled tonight, she knew Lena would go straight to Macon. 
and Ridley wasn't big on facing the music. I think it's a little too late for that. Lena bent down and flipped back the corner of the pink shag carpet. Let's go. You sure about this? I don't want to, you know, wake him up or something. I also didn't want to see the look on his face when we told him that Ridley had turned Savannah Snow's house into a 30-on-30 boxing match using the charmed belt of an incubus we were all looking for who just happened to be living in Ridley's bedroom. Lena opened the trap door. I doubt he's asleep. Liv shook her head. Lena's right. We have to tell Macon. Immediately. You don't understand. We've been... She faltered, looking at Lena. Your uncle has been trying to find John Breed for months. Lena nodded. It wasn't a smile, but it was something. Let's go. John ripped open another bag of Doritos. While you're down there, can you ask him to let me out of here? Ask him yourself, Lena said. You're coming with us. John looked down into the darkness that led into the tunnels below us, then back at me. Never thought you'd be rescuing me, mortal. I wanted to kill him or punch him in the face. I wanted to make him pay for everything he'd done to Lena and Link, all the trouble Abraham had caused because of him. But I would leave that to Macon. Trust me, I'm not. He smiled, and I stepped into the air, feeling for the rough solidity of the steps I would never see. October 19th. The Ultimate Weapon. I knocked on the door of Macon's study, and it swung open. I didn't need to worry about waking him up, though. A miserable-looking Link was already sitting at the table. Macon waved me in. Link has filled me in on everything. Luckily, he came straight here before he hurt anyone. I hadn't considered the damage a raging incubus could inflict. What part of everything do you know? I stepped inside. That my niece snuck out of the house, he looked at me pointedly. Not a wise decision. No, sir. Macon was already angry, and I didn't want to tell him something that was going to make him even angrier. He crossed his arms. And that Ridley somehow managed to cast a furor? A whole lot angrier. I know you're upset, but there's something more important I need to tell you. I glanced at the door. Or maybe you should see for yourself. John Breed. Macon loomed over him. This is quite an unexpected turn of events, all things considered. John was standing just inside the door of the study, as if he was going to make a break for it, mortal style. In Macon's presence, his smart-ass attitude was gone. Link was staring at John like he wanted to tear him apart, what the hell is he doing here? I felt bad for Link, being stuck in the same room with John. He had to hate John even more than I did, if that was possible. Lena couldn't look at her uncle or Link. She was ashamed of Ridley and herself for not figuring it out sooner. But more than anything, I knew she was worried about her cousin, no matter what she'd done. Ridley stole the arc light out of Uncle Macon's grave after we buried it. She freed John, and she's been using his belt as a conduit to channel his powers until now. Belt? Liv pulled out her little red notebook. The one Lena's wearing. The disgusting belt with the scorpion trapped inside. Macon held out his hand. Lena unclicked the buckle and handed the belt to him. Link turned on John. What did you do to her? Nothing. Ridley's been ordering me around since she let me out of the arc light. Why would you agree? 
Even Macon was incredulous. You don't strike me as particularly selfless. I didn't have a choice. I've been stuck in this house for months now, trying to get out. John slumped against the wall. Ridley wouldn't help me unless I found a way for her to cast. So I did. You expect us to believe that a powerful hybrid incubus allowed a mortal girl to trap him in her bedroom? John shook his head, frustrated. This is Ridley we're talking about. I think you all have a bad habit of underestimating her. When she wants something, she finds a way to get it. We all knew he was right. He's telling the truth, Uncle Macon, Reese said from where she was standing by the fireplace. You're absolutely sure. Reese wasn't about to bite Macon's head off the way she had done to me. I'm sure. John looked relieved. Liv stepped forward, her notebook in hand. She had no interest in why Ridley may or may not have done something. She wanted the facts. You know, we've been looking for you, she told John. Yeah? Bet you're not the only ones. Liv and Macon convinced John to sit down at the table with the rest of us, which meant Link refused to. He leaned against the wall next to the fireplace, sulking. All the Linkubus hype aside, John had changed Link in ways I would never really understand. And I knew something else John didn't know. As much as Link loved driving all the girls crazy, it didn't really matter. There was only one girl Link wanted, and none of us knew where to find her. Abraham has gone to great lengths to locate your whereabouts, literally tearing this town apart. What I need to know is why. Abraham doesn't do anything without a reason. Macon was asking the questions while Liv wrote down John's responses. Reese was sitting across from John, watching for any trace of a lie. John shrugged. I'm not really sure. He found me when I was a kid, but he's not exactly a father figure, if you know what I mean. Macon nodded. You said he found you. What happened to your parents? John shifted uncomfortably in his seat. I don't know. They disappeared. I'm pretty sure they ditched me because I was, you know, different. Liv stopped writing. All casters are different. John laughed. I'm not a regular caster. My powers didn't manifest when I was a teenager. Liv stared at him. He pointed at her notebook. You're going to want to write this part down. She raised an eyebrow. Subject displays combative attitude. I could imagine it on the page. I was born this way, and my powers have only gotten stronger. Do you know what it's like to be able to do things no one else your age can? Yes. There was a trace of something in Liv's voice a mix of sadness and sympathy. She had always been smarter than everyone around her, designing devices to measure the pole of the moon, or some other thing no one else cared about or understood. Macon was studying John, and you could see the former incubus in him sizing up this strange new one. And exactly what sort of powers do you have? aside from being impervious to the effects of sunlight. Standard incubus stuff, amplified strength, hearing, sense of smell, I can travel, and girls are pretty into me. John stopped and looked at Lena as if they shared a secret. She looked away. Not as much as you think, I said. He smiled at me, enjoying Macon's protective custody. I can do other things, too. 
Liv searched his face. Like what? Link's arms were crossed, and he was staring at the door, pretending he wasn't listening. But I knew he was. Like it or not, he and John would always be connected now. The more Link knew about John, the more he would be able to figure out about himself. John looked at Reese, then at Lena. Whatever it was, he didn't want to say. Random stuff. Macon's eyes flickered. What random stuff? Perhaps you could elaborate. John gave up. It sounds like a bigger deal than it is, but I can absorb other casters' powers. Liv stopped writing. Like an empath? Lena's grandma could borrow the powers of other casters temporarily, but she never described it as absorbing anything. John shook his head. No, I keep them. Liv's eyes widened. Are you saying you can steal the powers of other casters? No, they still have their powers, but I have them too. Sort of like a collection. How is that even possible? Liv asked. Macon leaned back in his chair. I would be very interested in hearing the answer to that question, Mr. Breed. John glanced at Lena again. I wanted to jump across the table. All I have to do is touch them. What? Lena looked like he had slapped her in the face. Is that what he'd been doing with his hands all over her on the dance floor at Exile? Or when she had climbed onto the back of his stupid motorcycle that day at the lake, siphoning her powers like a parasite? It's not like I do it on purpose. It just happens. I don't even know how to use most of the powers I have. But I'm sure Abraham does. Macon poured himself a glass of dark liquor from a decanter that had appeared on the table. Never a sign things were going well. Liv and Macon looked at each other, a silent exchange. I could see the wheels in Liv's mind turning. What could Abraham be planning? With a hybrid incubus who can collect the powers of other casters, Macon answered. I'm not entirely sure, but with those capabilities at his side, Abraham would have the ultimate weapon, and mortals wouldn't stand a chance against that sort of power. John whipped around to face Macon. What did you say? Would you care for me to repeat? Wait. John cut Macon off before he could finish. He closed his eyes as if he was trying to remember something. Casters are an imperfect race, polluting our bloodlines and using their powers to oppress us. But the day will come when we wield the ultimate weapon and eradicate them from the earth. What kind of crap is that? John had Link's attention. Abraham and Silas used to say it all the time when I was a kid. I had to memorize it. Sometimes when I got in trouble, Silas made me write it over and over for hours. Silas? Macon stiffened at the mention of his father's name. I remembered the things my mom had said about Silas in the Arclight visions. He sounded like a monster, abusive and racist, trying to pass his hatred on to his sons, and apparently to John. Macon looked at John, his eyes darkening to a green so deep it was nearly black. How did you know my father? John raised his empty green eyes to meet Macon's. His voice was different when he finally answered, not powerful or cocky, not John Breed at all. He raised me. 
October 24th. The One Who Is Two. After that, Macon and Liv spent most of their time grilling John about Abraham and Silas, and who knows what else, while Lena and I pored over every book in Macon's study. There were also old letters from Silas encouraging Macon to join his father and brother in the battle against the casters. But aside from that, there were no clues to John's past, no mentions of any caster or incubus capable of anything close to John's abilities. The few times we were allowed to join the Inquisition, Macon watched Lena and John's interactions carefully. I think he was worried that the strange pull John had wielded over Lena in the past might return. But Lena was stronger now, and John annoyed her as much as the rest of us. I was more worried about Liv. I had witnessed the reaction of the mortal girls in Gatlin the first time John walked into the Dairy Keen, but Liv seemed immune. I was used to the ups and downs of living in the place between the caster and mortal worlds, but these days were all downs. The same week John Breed turned up at Ravenwood, Ridley's clothes disappeared out of her room, like she was gone for good. And a few days later, Aunt Prue took a turn for the worse. I didn't ask Lena to come with me the next time I went to county care. I felt like being alone with Aunt Prue. I don't know why, just like I didn't know much about anything that was going on with me these days. Maybe I was going crazy. Maybe I'd been crazy all along, and I didn't even know it. The air was freezing cold, as if they found a way to suck the Freon and the power from all the air conditioners in Gatlin County and pipe it into county care. I wished it was this cold anywhere but here, where the cold wrapped itself around the patients like corpses in a refrigerator. This kind of cold never felt good, and it definitely never smelled good. At least sweating made you feel kind of alive, and that smell was about as human as you could get. Maybe I'd spent too much time considering the metaphysical implications of heat. Like I said, crazy. Bobby Murphy didn't say a word when I walked up to the front desk, didn't even look me in the eye, just handed me the clipboard and a pass. I wasn't sure if Lena's shut-the-hell-up cast still affected him all the time, or only when I was around. Either way, it was fine with me. I didn't feel like talking. I didn't look in the other John's room or the unseen needlepoint room, and I walked right past the sad birthday party room. I held my breath as I passed the food-that-wasn't-food room before the smell of insure hit. Then I smelled the lavender, and I knew my Aunt Prue was there. Leah sat in a chair by her bed, reading a book in some kind of caster or demon language. She wasn't in the standard county care peach uniform. Her boots were propped up on a hazardous waste disposal container in front of her. She'd obviously given up trying to pass for a nurse. Hey there. She looked up, surprised to see me. Hey, yourself. It's about time. I've been wondering where you've been. I don't know. Busy. Stupid stuff. Freaking out and chasing down hybrid incubuses and Ridley, my mother and Mrs. English, and some crazy thing about some crazy wheel. She smiled. Well, I'm glad to see you. Me too. That was all I could manage. I gestured at her boots. They don't give you a hard time for all that? Nah, I'm not really the kind of girl people give a hard time. I couldn't make any more small talk. Talking was getting harder and harder every day, even with people I cared about. Do you mind if I spend some time with Aunt Prue? You know, alone? Of course not. I'm going to run out and check on Bade. If I don't get her house trained soon, she'll have to sleep outside, and she's really an indoor cat. 
She tossed her book onto the chair and ripped out of the room. I was alone with Aunt Prue. She had gotten even smaller since the last time I was here. Now there were tubes where there hadn't been, as if she was turning into a piece of machinery an inch at a time. She looked like an apple baking in the sun, wrinkling in ways that seemed impossible. For a while I listened to the rhythmic pulsing of the plastic ankle cuffs on her legs, expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting, as if they could make up for not walking, not being, not watching Jeopardy with her sisters, not complaining about everything while loving it all. I took her hand. The tube that ran into her mouth bubbled with her every breath. It sounded wet and croupy, like a humidifier with water inside it, like she was choking on her own air. Pneumonia. I overheard Amma talking to the doctor in the kitchen. Statistically speaking, when coma patients died, pneumonia was the grim reaper. I wondered if the sound of the tube in her throat meant Aunt Prue was getting closer to a statistically predictable end. The thought of my aunt as another statistic made me want to throw the hazardous waste bin through the window. Instead, I grabbed Aunt Prue's tiny hand, her fingers as small as bare twigs in winter. I closed my eyes and took her other hand, twisting my strong fingers together with her frail ones. I rested my forehead against our hands and closed my eyes. I imagined lifting my head up and seeing her smiling, the tape and tubes gone. I wondered if wishing was the same thing as praying, if hoping for something badly enough could make it happen. I was still thinking about it when I opened my eyes expecting to see Aunt Prue's room, her sad hospital bed and her depressing peach walls. But I found myself standing in the sunshine, in front of a house I'd been to a hundred times before. The sister's house looked exactly the way I remembered it, before the vexes tore it apart. The walls, the roof, the section where Aunt Prue's bedroom had been, they were all there, not a white pine board or a roof shingle out of place. The walk leading up to the wraparound porch was lined with hydrangea, the way Aunt Prue liked. Lucille's clothesline was still stretched across the lawn. There was a dog sitting on the porch, a Yorkshire terrier that looked suspiciously like Harlan James, except it wasn't. This dog had more gold in his coat, but I recognized him and bent down to pet him. His tag read, Harlan James III. Aunt Prue? The three white rocking chairs were sitting on the porch with little wicker tables between them. There was a tray on one of them with two glasses of lemonade. I sat in the second rocking chair, leaving the first one empty. Aunt Prue liked to sit in the one closest to the walk, and I figured she would want that chair if she was coming. It felt like she was coming. She'd brought me here, hadn't she? I gave Harlan James III a scratch, which was strange since he was sitting in our living room, stuffed. I looked at the table again. Aunt Prue! She startled me, even though I was expecting her. She didn't look any better than she had lying in her hospital bed in real life. She coughed, and I heard the familiar noise of the rhythmic compressions. She was still wearing the plastic cuffs around her ankles, expanding and contracting, as if she was still in her bed at county care. She smiled. Her face looked transparent. Her skin was so pale and thin that you could see the bluish purple of the veins beneath it. I've missed you, and Aunt Grace, Aunt Mercy, and Thelma are going out of their minds without you. Amma, too. I see Amma most days, and your daddy on the weekends. They come by to talk a lot more regular than some people. She sniffed. I'm sorry. Things have been all wrong. 
she waved her hand at me. I'm not going anywhere. Not just yet. They got me on house arrest, like one of them criminals from the TV. She coughed and shook her head. Where are we, Aunt Prue? Don't reckon I know. But I don't have much time. They keep you pretty busy round here. She unhooked her necklace and took something off it. I hadn't seen her wearing the necklace in the hospital, but I recognized it. From my daddy. From his daddy's daddy. From way before you were even a thought in the mind of the good Lord. It was a rose hammered out of gold. This is for your girl, to help me keep an eye on her for you. Tell her to keep it with her. Why are you worrying about Lena? Now don't you go worrying about that. You just do as I tell you. She sniffed again. But Lena's fine. I'll always take care of her. You know that. The thought that Aunt Prue was worried about Lena scared me more than anything that had happened in the last few months. All the same, you give it to her. I will. But Aunt Prue was gone, leaving only half a glass of lemonade and an empty rocking chair, still rocking. I opened my eyes, squinting into the brightness of my aunt's room, and I realized the sun was coming in sideways, much lower than when I'd arrived. I checked my cell. Three hours had passed. What was happening to me? Why was it easier to slip into Aunt Prue's world than to have a simple conversation in my own? The first time I spoke to her, it didn't seem like any time had passed at all, and I couldn't have done it without a powerful natural at my side. I heard the door open behind me. You all right, kid? Leah was standing in the doorway. I looked down at my hand, uncurling my fingers around a tiny gold rose. This is for your girl. I wasn't all right. I was pretty sure nothing was. I nodded. Fine, just tired. I'll see you around, Leah. She waved me off, and I left the room with the weight of a backpack full of rocks on my shoulders. When I got into the car and the radio started playing, I wasn't surprised to hear the familiar melody. After seeing Aunt Prue, I was relieved, because there it was, as right as the rain that hadn't fallen in months. My shadowing song. Eighteen moons. that meant, was tied to fixing the order. And what did it have to do with the wheel of fate, the wheel that was a she? Who could be powerful enough to control the order of things and take human form? There were light and dark casters, succubuses and sirens, sibyls and diviners. I remembered the previous verse of the song, the one about the demon queen, Possibly one who could take human form, like stepping into a mortal's body. There was only one demon queen I knew who could do that. Seraphine. Finally, a piece of information I could wrap my mind around. Even though Liv and Macon had spent every day of the last week with John, treating him like Frankenstein, visiting royalty or a prisoner of war, depending on the day— he hadn't told them anything that explained his role in all this. I still hadn't told anyone except Lena about my visits with Aunt Prue, but I was beginning to feel like it all fit together, the same way everything in the bowl ends up in the biscuits, as Amma would say. 
the wheel of fate, the one who is two. Ama and the Bukor, John Breed, the eighteenth moon, Aunt Prue, the shadowing song. If only I could figure out how, before it was too late. By the time I got to Ravenwood, Lena was sitting on the front porch. I could see her watching me as I drove through the crooked iron gate. I remembered what Aunt Prue had said when she gave me the gold rose. This is for your girl, to help me keep an eye on her. I didn't want to think about it. I sat down next to Lena on the top step. She held out her hand and took the charm from me, slipping it onto her necklace without a word. It's for you, from Aunt Prue. I know. She told me. I fell asleep on the couch and suddenly she was there, Lena said. It was exactly the way you described it. A dream, but it didn't feel like a dream. I nodded and she leaned her head against my shoulder. I'm sorry, Ethan. I looked out at the gardens, still green in spite of the heat and the lubbers and everything we had been through. Did she tell you anything else? Lena nodded and reached up to touch my cheek with her hand. When she turned toward me, I could tell she had been crying. I don't think she has much time. Why? She said she came to say goodbye. I never made it home that night. Instead, I found myself sitting alone on Marion's doorstep. Even though she was in there and I was out, I still felt better at her place than mine. For now, I didn't know how much longer she'd be there, and I didn't want to think about where I would be without her. I fell asleep on her carefully swept front porch, and if I dreamed that night, I don't remember. November 1st, Crucibles You know, babies are born without kneecaps. Aunt Grace wedged herself between the sofa cushions before her sister could get there. Grace, Anne, how could you say such a thing? It's downright disturbing. Mercy, it's the God's honest truth. I read it in Reader's Digestive. Those readers are full of information. Why on God's green earth are you talking about babies' knees anyhow? Can't say as I know. Just got me to thinking about the way things change. If babies can just grow them some kneecaps, why can't I learn to fly? Why don't they build stairs to the moon? Why can't Thelma get married to that handsome Jim Clooney boy? You can't learn to fly because you got no wings. It wouldn't make a lick of sense to build stairs to the moon because they don't have any breathing air up there. And that boy's name is George Clooney. And Thelma can't marry him because he lives all the way over there in Hollywood. And he's not even a Methodist. I listened to them talk in the next room while I ate my cereal. Sometimes I understood what the sisters were saying, even when it sounded like crazy talk. They were worried about Aunt Prue. They were preparing for the possibility she was going to die. Babies grew kneecaps, I guess. Things changed. It wasn't a good thing or a bad thing, any more than kneecaps were good or bad. At least, that's what I told myself. Something else had changed. Ama wasn't in the kitchen this morning. I couldn't remember the last time I'd left for school without seeing her. Even when she was mad and refused to cook breakfast, she would still be banging around in the kitchen, muttering to herself and giving me stink eye. The one-eyed menace was lying on the spoon rest, bone dry. It didn't feel right to leave without saying goodbye. I opened the drawer where Ama kept her extra sharp number two pencils. I grabbed one and tore a sheet of paper off the message pad. 
I was going to tell her I left for school. No big deal. I leaned over the counter and started writing. Ethan, loss and wait! I hadn't heard Ama come in, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. Jeez, Ama, you almost gave me a heart attack. When I turned around, she was the one who looked like she was going to have one. Her face was ashen, and she was shaking her head like a mad woman. Ama? What's wrong? I started to cross the room, but she put her hand out. Stop! Her hand was shaking. What were you doing? I was writing you a note. I held up the sheet of paper. She pointed her bony finger at my other hand, the one still holding her pencil. You were writing with the wrong hand. I looked down at the pencil in my left hand and let it drop, watching it roll across the floor. I had been writing with my left hand, but I was right-handed. Amma backed out of the kitchen, her eyes shining, and tore down the hall. Amma! I called after her, but she slammed her door behind her. I banged on it. Amma! You have to tell me what's wrong! What's wrong with me? What's all that ruckus out there? Aunt Grace called from the living room. I'm trying to watch my stories. I slid down to the floor, my back against Amma's door, and waited. But she didn't come out. She wasn't going to tell me what was happening. I was going to have to figure it out on my own. Time to grow a pair of kneecaps. I didn't feel the same way later that day when I ran into my dad again with Mrs. English. This time they weren't at the library. They were having lunch at my school, in my classroom, where anyone could see them, including me. I wasn't that ready for change. I made the mistake of dropping off the draft of my Crucible essay during lunch because I forgot to give it to her in English class. I pushed through the door without bothering to look through the little glass square, and there they were, sharing a basket of Amma's leftover fried chicken. At least I knew it would be rubbery. Dad? My dad smiled before he turned, which is how I knew he'd been waiting for this to happen. He had the smile ready. Ethan? Sorry to surprise you on your home turf like this. I wanted to go over a few things with Lillian. She has some great ideas about the 18th Moon Project. I bet she does. I smiled at Mrs. English, holding up the paper. My draft. I was going to put it in your inbox. Just ignore me. Like I'm going to ignore you. But I didn't get off that easy. Are you ready for tomorrow? Mrs. English looked at me expectantly. I braced myself. The automatic answer to that question was always no, but I had no idea exactly what I wasn't ready for. Ma'am? For the reenactment of the Salem witch trials, we're going to try the same cases the Crucible is based on. Have you been preparing your case study? Yes, ma'am. That explained the manila envelope marked English in my backpack. I hadn't been paying much attention in class lately. What an amazing idea, Lillian. I'd love to come watch, if you don't mind, my dad said. Not at all. You can videotape the trials for us. We can all watch it as a class afterward. Great, my dad beamed. I felt the cold glass eye rolling over me as I walked out of the classroom. Elle, did you know we're reenacting the Salem witch trials in English tomorrow? Haven't been memorizing your case file? Do you even look in your backpack anymore? Did you know my dad is videotaping it? I do, because I walked in on his lunch date with Mrs. English. Ew. What should we do? There was a long pause. I guess we should start calling her Ms. English? Not 
Funny, L. Maybe you should finish reading The Crucible before class tomorrow. The problem with having actual evil in your life is that regular, everyday evil, administrators giving you detention, the textbook evil that makes up most of high school existence, starts to feel less terrifying. Unless it's your father dating your glass-eyed English teacher. No matter how you looked at it, Lillian English was evil, the real kind or your everyday variety. Either way, she was eating rubbery chicken with my dad, and I was screwed. Turns out the crucible is more about bitches than witches, as Lena would be the first to say. I was glad I waited until the end of the unit to finish reading the play. It made me hate half of Jackson High and the whole cheer squad even more than usual. By the time class started, I was proud that I actually did the reading and knew a few things about John Proctor, the guy who gets completely shafted. What I hadn't anticipated was costumes, girls in gray dresses and white aprons, and guys in Sunday school shirts with their pants tucked into their socks. I didn't get the memo, or it was still in my backpack. Lena wasn't wearing a costume either. Mrs. English doled out our respective one-eyed glares and five-point deductions, and I tried to ignore the fact that my father was sitting in the back of the room with the school's 15-year-old video camera. The classroom was rearranged to look like a courtroom. The afflicted girls were on one side, led by Emily Asher. Apparently, their job was to act like phonies and pretend they were possessed. Emily was a natural. They all were. The magistrates were on one side of them and the witness box on the other. Mrs. English turned her good eye side on me. Mr. Wait. Why don't you start off as John Proctor, and then we'll switch around later on in the period? I was the guy who was about to have his life destroyed by a bunch of Emily Ashers. Lena, you can be our Abigail. We'll start with the play and then spend the rest of the week on the actual cases the play was based on. I went over to my chair in one corner and Lena went to the other. Mrs. English waved to my dad. Let's start rolling, Mitchell. I'm ready, Lillian. Everyone in class turned to look at me. The reenactment went off without a hitch, which really meant it went on with all the customary hitches. The camera battery died in the first five minutes, the chief magistrate had to use the bathroom, the afflicted girls got caught texting, and the confiscation of their phones was a bigger affliction than the one the devil was supposed to have brought on them in the first place. My father didn't say a word, but I knew he was there. His presence kept me from speaking, moving, or breathing when I could help it. Why was he here? What was he doing hanging out with Mrs. English? There was no rational explanation. Ethan, you're supposed to give your defense. What? I looked up at the camera. Everyone in the room was staring at me. Start talking or I'm going to have to fake an asthma attack, like Link did during the biology final. My name is John Proctor. I stopped. My name was John. Just like John at County Care and John sitting on Ridley's pink shag carpet, once again, there was me and there was John. What was the universe trying to tell me now? Ethan? Mrs. English sounded annoyed. I looked back down at my paper. My name is John Proctor and these allegations are false. I didn't know if it was the right line. I looked back at the camera, but I didn't see my father standing behind it. I saw something else. My reflection in the lens started to shift like a ripple in the lake. Then it slowly came back into focus. For a second, 
I was staring at myself again. I watched my image as the corners of my mouth turned up into a lopsided smile. I felt like someone had punched me. I couldn't breathe. Because I wasn't smiling. What the hell? My voice was shaking. The afflicted girls started laughing. Ethan, are you okay? Do you have anything else to add to that poignant defense, Mr. Proctor? Mrs. English was more than annoyed. She thought I was screwing around. I shuffled through my notes, my hands shaking, and found a quote. How may I live without my name? I have given you my soul. Leave me my name. I could feel her glass eye on me. Ethan, say something. Leave me my soul. Leave me my name. It was the wrong line, but something about it felt right. Something was following me. I didn't know what it was or what it wanted. But I knew who I was. Ethan Waite, son of Lila Jane Evers Waite and Mitchell Waite, son of a keeper and a mortal, disciple of basketball and chocolate milk, of comic books and novels I hid under my bed, raised by my parents and Amma and Marion, this whole town and everyone in it, good and bad. And I loved a girl. Her name was Lena. The question is, who are you? And what do you want from me? I didn't wait for an answer. I had to get out of that room. I pushed my way through the chairs. I couldn't get to the door fast enough. I slammed against it as hard as I could and ran down the hall without looking back, because I already knew the words. I'd heard them a dozen times, and every time they made less sense, and every time they made my stomach turn. I'm waiting. November 1st, Demon Queen One of the things about living in a small town is you can't get away with ditching class in the middle of a historical reenactment that your English teacher spent weeks organizing. Not without consequences. In most places, that would mean suspension, or at least detention. In Gatlin, it meant Amma forcing you to show up at your teacher's house with a plate full of peanut butter cookies, which is exactly where I was standing. I knocked on the door, hoping Mrs. English wasn't home. I stared at the red door, shifting my weight uncomfortably. Lena liked red doors. She said red was a happy color, and casters didn't have red doors. To casters, doors were dangerous. All thresholds were. Only mortals had red doors. My mom had hated red doors. She didn't like people who had red doors either. She said having a red door in Gatlin meant you were the kind of person who wasn't afraid to be different. But if you thought having a red door would do that for you, then you really were just like the rest of them. I didn't have time to come up with my own theory on red doors, because right then, this one swung open. Mrs. English was standing there in a flowered dress and fuzzy slippers. Ethan, what are you doing here? I came to apologize, ma'am. I held out the plate. I brought you some cookies. Then I suppose you should come in. She stepped back, opening the door wider. This wasn't the response I was expecting. I figured I'd apologize and give her Amma's famous peanut butter cookies. She would accept, and I would be out of there. Not following her into her tiny house. Red door or not, I definitely wasn't happy. Why don't we have a seat in the parlor? I followed her into a tiny room that didn't look like any parlor I'd ever seen. It was the smallest house I'd ever been in. The walls were covered with black and white family portraits. They were so old and the faces so small that I would have had to stop and stare to look at any of them, which made them all strangely private. 
at least strange for Gatlin, where our families were on display at all times, the dead and the living. Mrs. English was strange, all right. Please, have a seat. I'll bring you a glass of water. It wasn't a question. It seemed to be mandatory. She stepped into the kitchen, which was about the size of two closets. I could hear the running water. Thank you, ma'am. There was a collection of ceramic figurines on the mantel over the fireplace. A globe, a book, a cat, a dog, a moon, a star. The Lillian English version of the standard junk the sisters had collected and never let anyone touch until it was smashed to rubble in their front yard. In the middle of the fireplace was a small television with rabbit ear antennas that couldn't have worked for about twenty years. Some kind of spidery-looking houseplant sat on top of it, making the whole thing look like a big planter. Except the plant looked like it was dying, which made the planter that wasn't a planter, on top of the TV that wasn't a TV, on top of the fireplace that wasn't a fireplace, all seem pointless. A tiny bookcase sat next to the fireplace. It actually appeared to be what it was, seeing as it actually had books on it. I bent down to read the titles. To Kill a Mockingbird, The Invisible Man, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Great Expectations. The front door slammed and I heard a voice I never would have expected to hear in my English teacher's house. Great Expectations, one of my personal favorites. It's so tragic. Seraphine was standing inside the doorway her yellow eyes watching me. Abraham had ripped into a worn, flowered chair in the corner of the room. He looked comfortable, as if he was just another guest. The Book of Moons was resting in his lap. Ethan, did you open the front? It only took a minute for Mrs. English to come back from the kitchen. I don't know if it was the strangers in her parlor or Seraphine's yellow eyes, but Mrs. English dropped the water, broken glass raining down onto her flowered rug. Who are you people? I looked at Abraham. They're here for me. He laughed. Not this time, boy. We came for something else. Mrs. English was shaking. I don't have anything of value. I'm just a teacher. Seraphine smiled, which made her look even more deranged. Actually, you have something that is very valuable to us. Lillian. Mrs. English took a step back. I don't know who you people are, but you should leave. My neighbors have probably already called the police. This is a very quiet street. Her voice was rising. I was pretty sure Mrs. English was only a minute away from a meltdown. Leave her alone. I started to walk towards Seraphine, and she flung open her fingers. I felt the force, ten times stronger than any hand, slam against my chest. I fell back against the bookcase, sending dusty books falling around me. Have a seat, Ethan. I think it's fitting for you to watch the end of the world as you know it. I couldn't get up. I could still feel the weight of Seraphine's power on my chest. You people are crazy, Mrs. English whispered, her eyes wide. Seraphine fixed her terrifying eyes on Mrs. English. You don't know the half of it. Abraham stubbed his cigar out on Mrs. English's side table and rose from the chair. He opened the Book of Moons as if he had marked a specific page. What are you doing? Calling more vexes? I shouted. This time they both laughed. What I'm calling will make a vex look like a house cat. He started to read in a language I didn't recognize. It had to be a caster language, niadic maybe. The words were almost melodic until he repeated them in English, and I realized what they meant.
From blood, ash, and sorrow, for the demons imprisoned below. Stop! I shouted. Abraham didn't even look at me. Seraphine twisted her wrist slightly, and I felt my chest tighten. You are witnessing history, Ethan, for both casters and mortals. Be a little more respectful. Abraham was still reading. I call their creator. The moment Abraham spoke the last word, Mrs. English gasped, and her body arched violently. Her eyes rolled back in her head, and she crumpled to the floor like a rag doll. Mrs. English's neck was resting against her chest awkwardly, and all I could think about was how lifeless she looked. Like she was dead. Abraham started to read again, but I felt like I was underwater. Everything was slow and muffled. How many more people were going to die because of them? To avenge them, and to serve. Abraham's voice echoed through the tiny room, and the walls began to shake. He snapped the book shut and walked closer to the body of Mrs. English. The spidery-looking plant fell off the TV, and the pot broke against the stone of the fireplace. The tiny figurines were rocking back and forth, the pieces of Mrs. English's life breaking apart. She's coming, Seraphine called to Abraham, and I realized they were both staring at Mrs. English's body. I tried to get up, but the weight was still bearing down on my chest. Whatever was happening, I couldn't stop it. It was already too late. Mrs. English's neck lifted first, her body slowly following, rising from the floor as if an invisible string was pulling it. It was horrible, the way her lifeless body moved like a puppet's. When her body straightened, her eyelids snapped open. But her eyes were gone. In their place were only dark shadows. The shaking stopped, and the whole room was still. Who calls me? Mrs. English was speaking, but the voice wasn't hers. It was inhuman. There was no variation in tone, no inflection. It was haunting and ominous. Abraham smiled. He was proud of whatever he had done. I do. The order is broken, and I call you to bring forth the soulless, those who wander the abyss of the underground, to join us here. Mrs. English's empty eyes stared past him, but the voice answered, It cannot be done. Seraphine looked at Abraham, panicked. What is she? He silenced Seraphine with a look and turned back to the creature inhabiting the shell of Mrs. English. I was not clear. We have bodies for them. Bring forth the soulless and offer them the bodies of the light casters. This will be the new order. You will bind it. There was a rumbling sound within Mrs. English's body almost as if the creature was laughing in some sick way. I am the Lilum, time, truth, destiny, the endless river, the wheel of fate. You do not command me. Lilum, Lillian English. It was like a sick cosmic joke, except for the part that wasn't a joke the part I couldn't stop repeating in my mind. The wheel of fate crushes us all. Abraham looked stricken, and Seraphine staggered backward. Whatever this Lilum thing was, the two of them had clearly believed they could control it. Abraham tightened his grip on the Book of Moons and changed tactics. Then I appeal to you as the Demon Queen. Help us forge a new order, one where the light will finally be eclipsed by darkness forever. I froze. 
It was all coming together. The shadowing song was right. Even if I hadn't heard a word about this Lilum thing, the song had warned me about the Demon Queen and the Wheel of Fate more than once. I tried not to panic. The Lilum answered, her voice unnervingly even. Light and dark hold no meaning for me. There is only power, born from the dark fire, where all power was created. What was she talking about? She was the Demon Queen. Didn't that make her dark? No. Seraphine's voice was a whisper. It's not possible. The Demon Queen is true darkness. My truth is the dark fire, the origin of power, both light and dark. Seraphine looked confused, something I had never seen in her outside of the visions. That's when I realized she and Abraham didn't understand the Lilum at all. I couldn't pretend that I did, but I knew she wasn't dark in the way they believed. She was something all her own. Maybe the Lilum was gray, a new shade in the spectrum. Or maybe it was the opposite, and the Lilum possessed neither dark nor light. She was the absence of both. Either way, she wasn't one of them. But you can forge a new order, Seraphine said. Mrs. English's head jerked toward the sound of Seraphine's voice. I can, but a price must be paid. What's the price? I called out without thinking. The head jerked toward me. A crucible. The Demon Queen, the Wheel of Fate, whoever she was, she wasn't talking about my English homework. I don't understand. Shut up, boy, Abraham snapped. But the Lilum was still staring blankly in my direction. This mortal has the words I require. The Lilum paused. She was talking about Mrs. English. Crucible. A pot for melting metals, a mortal allegory. Was she searching Mrs. English's mind for the right words? A severe test. She stopped. Yes, a test. On the eighteenth moon. What's the test? On the eighteenth moon. She repeated. For one who will bring the order back. You. It was the message from my shadowing song, most of it anyway, the one who is two. Who, Abraham demanded, tell me now, who will bring back the order? Mrs. English's neck jerked unnaturally toward Abraham, the black shadowed eye sockets facing him. A thunderous sound ripped through the house. You do not command me. Before he could respond, a blinding light streaked from the dark sockets where Mrs. English's eyes should have been, directly at Abraham and Seraphine. Abraham didn't even have time to rip. The light hit them and exploded around them, filling the room. Seraphine's invisible grip disappeared, and I threw my arm over my eyes to shield them from the light but I could still sense it, as if I was looking into the sun. Within seconds, the impossible brightness dimmed, and I pulled my arm away from my face. I looked at the place where Abraham and Seraphine had been standing. Black splotches clouded my vision. Abraham and Seraphine were gone. Are they dead? I found myself hoping... Maybe Abraham had used the Book of Moons one time too many. The book always took something in return. Dead? The Lilum paused. No, it is not their time to be judged. I disagreed, but I wasn't about to argue with a creature powerful enough to make Abraham and Seraphine disappear. What happened to them? I willed them away. 
I do not wish to hear their voices. She didn't really answer the question, but I had another one, and I had to find the courage to ask it. The one who has to face the test on the 18th moon. Are you talking about the one who is two? The darkened sockets of her eyes turned toward me, and the voice began to speak. The one who is two, in whom the balance is paid. The dark fire from which all power comes will make the order anew. So we can fix it. The order, I mean. If the balance is paid, there will be a new order. Her voice was completely flat, as if what I had been hoping for meant nothing. What do you mean by the balance? Balance, payment, sacrifice. Sacrifice. By the one who is two. Not Lena, I whispered. I couldn't lose her again. She can't be the sacrifice. She didn't mean to break the order. Both dark and light. Perfect balance. True magic. The Lilum was quiet. Was she thinking, searching for words in the mind of Mrs. English? Or just getting tired of hearing my voice, too. She is not the crucible. The child of darkness and light will bind the new order. It wasn't Lena. I took a deep breath. Wait, then who is it? There is another. Maybe she didn't understand what I was asking. Who? You will find the one who is too. The empty black shadows stared at me from the face of Mrs. English. Why me? Because you are the wayward, the one who marks the way between our worlds, the demon world and the mortal world. Maybe I don't want to be the wayward. I said it without thinking, but it was true. I didn't know how to find this person and I didn't want the fate of the mortal and caster worlds resting with me. The walls began to shake again, the ceramic figurines knocking against one another. I watched as the little moon moved dangerously close to the edge of the mantle. I understand. We cannot choose what we are in the Order. I am the Demon Queen. Did she mean that she didn't want to be what she was either? The order of things exists beyond. The river flows. The wheel turns. This moment changes the next. You have changed everything. The walls ceased shaking, and the moon stopped just before it fell over the edge. This is the way... There is no other. I understood that. It was the last thing the Lilum said before the possessed body of Mrs. English dropped to the floor. November 1st. Bad Eye Side. With her glasses knocked off, her glass eye closed, and her hair unraveled from its maniacal bun, Lillian English almost looked like a person. A nice person. I called 911. Then I sat in the worn, flowered chair, staring at Mrs. English's body, waiting for the ambulance. I wondered if she was dead. Another casualty in this war I wasn't sure we could win. Another thing that was my fault. The ambulance arrived not long after that, by the time Woody Porter and Bud Sweet found a pulse, I could breathe again. I watched as they loaded the gurney into the back of the bus, as Woody called it. Anyone you can call for? Bud asked as he slammed the ambulance doors. There was one person. Yeah, I'll call someone. I went back into Mrs. English's tiny house, through the hall and into the kitchen with the hummingbird wallpaper. I didn't want to call my dad, but I owed Mrs. English that much after everything she'd been through. 
I lifted the pastel pink receiver off the cradle and stared at the rows of numbers. My hand started to shake. I couldn't remember my phone number. Maybe I was in shock. That's what I kept telling myself, but I knew it was more than that. Something was happening to me. What I didn't know was why. I closed my eyes, willing my fingers to find the right numbers. Combinations of numbers marched through my mind. Lena's number and Link's and the Gatlin County Libraries. There was only one phone number I couldn't remember. My own. Lillian English missed her first day of school in about 150 years. The actual diagnosis was severe exhaustion. It made sense, I guess. Abraham and Seraphine could do that to anyone, even without the help of a demon queen. Which left Lena and me hanging out alone in the classroom a few days later. Class was over, and Principal Harper had collected the pile of papers he would never grade, but we were still sitting at our desks. I think we both wanted to stay a while longer, in the place where Mrs. English had never been a puppet, where she'd been a demon queen all her own. The real Mrs. English was the hand of justice, even if she wasn't the wheel of fate. There was never a curve in her class. Between that and the whole crucible thing, I could see why the Lilum had thrived in Mrs. English's body. I should have known. She was acting creepy all year. I sighed. And I knew her glass eye was on the wrong side at least once. You think the Lilum was teaching our English class? You said the Lilum talked really weird. We would have noticed. Lena was right. The Lilum must have been inside Mrs. English some of the time, because Abraham and Seraphine showed up at her house. And trust me, they knew what they were looking for. We were sitting in silence at opposite ends of the room. Today, I was on the bad eye side. It was that kind of day. I had recounted every detail of the other night to Lena three times, except the part about forgetting my phone number. I didn't want her to worry, too. But she was still having trouble wrapping her mind around it all. I couldn't blame her. I had been there, and I wasn't doing much better. Lena finally said something from the good eye side. Why do you think we have to find this one who is two? She was more upset than I was, maybe because she had just found out about it, or maybe because it involved her mother. Did you miss the whole crucible speech? I told her everything I could remember. No, I mean, what is this one going to do that we can't? To forge the new order, or whatever. She left her seat and sat on the edge of Mrs. English's desk, her legs dangling. The new order. No wonder she was thinking about it. Lena knew the Lilum said that she would be the one to bind it. How do you bind a new order, anyway? I asked her. She shrugged. No clue. There had to be some way to find out. Maybe there's something in the Lunai Libri about it. Lena looked frustrated. Sure, look under N for new order, or B for binding, or P for psycho, which is how I'm starting to feel. Tell me about it. She sighed, swinging her legs harder. Even if I knew how to do it, the bigger question is, why me? I broke the last one. She looked tired, her black t-shirt damp with sweat, and her charm necklace tangled in her long hair. Maybe it needed to be broken. Sometimes things have to break before you can fix them. Or maybe it didn't need fixing. You want to get out of here? I've had enough crucible talk for today. She nodded, grateful. Me too. We walked down the hall, holding hands, and I watched as Lena's hair began to curl, the casting breeze, so I wasn't surprised when Miss Hester didn't even look up from painting her long purple nails as we passed by, leaving the demon and the mortal worlds behind us. 
Lake Moultrie really was as hot and brown as Link said. There wasn't a drop of water in sight. Nobody was around, though there were a few souvenirs from Mrs. Lincoln and her friends stuck in the cracked mud of the sloping shore. Community Watch Hotline Report All Apocalyptic Behavior She'd even written her home phone number across the bottom. What exactly constitutes apocalyptic behavior? Lena tried not to smile. I don't know, but I'm sure if we asked Mrs. Lincoln to post a clarification, she'd have it up here tomorrow. I thought about it. No fishing, no dumping, no calling up the devil, no plagues of heat and lubbers or vexes. Lena kicked the dry dirt. No rivers of blood. I told her about my dream. That one, anyway. And no human sacrifice. Don't give Abraham any ideas. Lena put her head on my shoulder. Do you remember last time we were here? I poked her with a dry piece of river grass. You ran away on the back of John's Harley. I don't want to remember that part. I want to remember the good part, she whispered. There are a lot of good parts. She smiled, and I knew I would always remember this day. Like the day I found her crying in the garden at Greenbrier. There were times when I looked at her, and everything stopped. When the world fell away, and I knew nothing could ever come between us. I pulled her against me and kissed her harder, in a dead lake where no one could see us and no one cared. With every passing second, the pain was building in my body, the pressure of my pounding heart. But I didn't stop. Nothing else mattered but this. I wanted to feel her hands on my skin, her mouth tugging on my bottom lip. I wanted to feel her body against mine until I couldn't feel anything else. Because unless we found whoever it was and convinced the one who is two to do whatever had to be done by the eighteenth moon, I had a sinking feeling it didn't matter what happened to either of us. She closed her eyes and I closed mine, and even though we weren't holding hands, it felt like we were. Because what we had, we knew. November 20th. The Next Generation. Back off, Boy Scout. I've told you everything I know. Why would I hide anything now? John smiled and looked over at Liv. I only wear the pants around here. She's the one wearing the belt. It was true. His scorpion belt was slung around Liv's waist. Lena had given it to Liv since she seemed to be John's babysitter when Macon wasn't with him. They never left him alone. At night, Macon even bound the study with concealment and confinement casts. But if John was telling the truth about his abilities, he would only have to touch Macon to gain some of his powers. The question was, why didn't he? I was beginning to think he didn't want to leave. But it made no sense. Lately, nothing did. Since my conversation with the Lilum, Wheel of Fate, Demon Queen, Mrs. English, who was not Mrs. English, I had more questions than answers. I had no idea how to find the one who is two, and I didn't know how much time we had left. I needed to figure when the eighteenth moon was coming. I couldn't give up on the idea that it had something to do with John Breed, ever since the John in County Care scribbled that message. This John didn't seem to care. He was lounging around on a cot against the wall, alternating between sleeping and pissing me off. Lena was frustrated. John's charm didn't get him anywhere with her. Abraham must have said something to you about the 18th moon. He shrugged, looking bored. Your boyfriend's the one who can't shut up about it. Yeah? You want to get off your ass and shut me up? Ethan, calm down. Don't let him get to you. Liv stepped in. 
Ethan, I think we can keep things a little more civil down here. For all we know, John is as much a victim of Abraham's reign of terror as the rest of us. She sounded sympathetic, too sympathetic. Did he bite any of your best friends lately? I snapped. Liv looked embarrassed. Then I don't want to hear about being civil. John pushed himself up from the cot. You don't have to talk to her like that. You're pissed at me. Don't take it out on Olivia. She's busting her ass to help you. I looked at Liv. She was blushing as she checked the dials on her selenometer. I wondered if John's incubus magnetism was having an effect on her. No offense, but shut the hell up. Ethan! Lena gave me her version of the look. Now I was getting it from all sides. John was amused. You want me to talk, you want me to shut up, let me know when you make up your mind. I didn't want to talk to him at all. I wanted him to disappear. Liv, what's the point of keeping him around? He hasn't told us anything. I bet he used his caster power-sucking abilities to send a message to Abraham and Seraphine, and they're on their way here right now. Liv crossed her arms disapprovingly. John hasn't been sucking anyone's powers. Most of the time he's alone with me, or Macon and me. She started to blush. And yelling at him isn't going to get you anywhere. John is basically a victim of torture. You can't imagine the way Silas and Abraham treated him when he was growing up. Nothing you can say comes close to what he's endured. I turned to John. So this is what you've been doing down here, telling Liv sob stories so she'll feel sorry for you? Man, you really are a manipulative asshole. John stood up and walked over to where I was standing. Funny. I was thinking what a charming asshole you are. Really? I made a fist. No. So did he. That's enough. Lena stepped between us. This isn't helping. And it isn't scientific, polite, or even remotely entertaining, Liv added. John wandered back to his cot. I don't know why everyone is so convinced this has to do with me. I wasn't about to tell him about the messages from a kid who had suffered a head injury and didn't speak. This has something to do with the 18th moon. Lena's isn't until February, unless Seraphine and Abraham are pulling moons out of time again. Lena crossed her arms, watching John. He shrugged, revealing the black tattoo on his arm. So you have a few months. Better get cracking. I told you she didn't say it was Lena's 18th moon. We may not have that much time. Liv whipped around to look at me. Who didn't say that? Crap. I didn't want to tell her about the Lilum yet, especially not in front of John. Lena wasn't the only girl I knew who was two things. Liv wasn't a keeper anymore, but she was still acting like one. No one. It's not important. Liv was watching me carefully. You said a guy named John at County Care knew about the 18th moon, the one in the creepy birthday room. I thought that was the reason you're here hounding John. Hounding John? Is that what you think I'm doing? I couldn't believe how quickly he had gotten to her. Actually, I'd call it harassing. John looked smug. I ignored him. I was too busy trying to cover my tracks with Liv. It was a guy named John, but he wasn't in the birthday. I stopped. A guy named John. Lena looked back at me. The birthday room. We were thinking the same thing. What if we've been looking at this all wrong? John, when's your birthday? He was stretched out, tossing a ball above the spot where his boots were propped against the wall. Why, you gonna throw me a party, mortal? I'm not big on cake. Just answer the question, Lena said. 
the ball hit the wall again. December 22nd. At least, that's what Abraham told me, but it's probably some random day he picked. He found me, remember? It's not like I had a note pinned to my shirt with my birthday written on it. He couldn't be that stupid. Does Abraham seem like the kind of guy who would care if you had a birthday or not? The ball stopped hitting the wall. Liv was flipping through an almanac. I heard her breath catch. Oh, my God. John walked to the table and leaned over Liv's shoulder. What? December 22nd is the winter solstice, the longest night of the year. John dropped into the chair next to her. He tried to look bored, his general expression, but I could tell he was curious. So it's a long night. Who cares? Liv closed the almanac. Ancient Celts considered winter solstice the most sacred day of the year. They believed the wheel of the year stopped turning for a short time at the moment of the solstice. It was a time of cleansing and rebirth. Liv was still talking, but I couldn't hear anything but my own thoughts. The wheel of the year. The wheel of fate. Cleansing and rebirth. A sacrifice. It's what the Lilum was trying to tell me at Mrs. English's house. On the eighteenth moon, the night of the winter solstice, the sacrifice would have to be made to bring forth the new order. Ethan? Lena was staring at me, concerned. Are you okay? No. None of us are. I looked at John. If you're telling the truth and you aren't waiting around for Abraham and Seraphine to come to the rescue, I need you to tell me everything you can about him. John leaned across the table toward me. If you think I can't break out of a little study in the tunnels, you're a bigger idiot than I thought. You have no idea what I can do. I'm here because, he glanced at Liv, I have nowhere else to go. I didn't know if he was lying, but all the signs, the songs, the messages, even Aunt Prue and the Lilum, pointed to him. John handed Liv a pencil. Get out that red notebook, and I'll tell you whatever you want to know. After listening to John talk about his childhood with Silas Ravenwood, who sounded like a military drill sergeant who spent most of his time beating the crap out of John or forcing him to memorize Silas's anti-caster doctrine, even I was starting to feel a little sorry for him. Not that I would ever admit it. Liv was writing down every word. So, basically, Silas hates casters. Interesting, considering he married two of them. She glanced at John and raised one. John laughed, and there was no way to miss the bitterness in his voice. I wouldn't want to be around if he heard you call me that. Silas and Abraham never considered me a caster. According to Abraham, I'm the next generation. Stronger, faster, impervious to sunlight, and all that good stuff. Abraham is pretty apocalyptic for a demon. He believes the end is coming, even if he has to bring it around himself, and the inferior race will finally be wiped out. I rubbed my hands over my face. I wasn't sure how much more of this I could take. I guess that's bad news for us mortals. John gave me a strange look. Mortals aren't the inferior race. You're just the bottom of the food chain. He's talking about casters. Liv tucked her pencil behind her ear. I didn't realize how much he hated light casters. John shook his head. You don't get it. I'm not talking about light casters. Abraham wants to get rid of all the casters. Lena looked up, surprised. But Seraphine, Liv started to say, he doesn't care about her. He only tells her what she wants to hear. John's voice was serious. 
Abraham Ravenwood doesn't care about anyone. There were a lot of nights when I couldn't sleep, but tonight I didn't want to. I wanted to forget about Abraham Ravenwood plotting to destroy the world and the Lilum promising it would destroy itself. Unless, of course, someone wanted to sacrifice themselves. Someone I had to find. If I fell asleep, those thoughts would twist themselves into rivers of blood as real as the mud in my sheets when I first met Lena. I wanted to find a place to hide from all of it, where the nightmares and the rivers and reality couldn't find me. For me, that place was always inside a book. And I knew just the one. It wasn't under my bed, it was in one of the shoe boxes stacked against my walls. Those boxes held everything that was important to me, and I knew what was inside all of them. At least, I thought I did. For a second, I couldn't move. I scanned the brightly colored cardboard boxes, searching for the mental map that would lead me to the right one. But it wasn't there. My hands started shaking, my right hand, the one I used to write with, and my left, the one I used now. I didn't know where it was. Something was wrong with me, and it had nothing to do with casters or keepers or the order of things. I was changing, losing more and more of myself every day, and I had no idea why. Lucille jumped off my bed when I started tearing through the boxes, tossing the lids, dumping everything from bottle caps and basketball cards to faded pictures of my mom all over my bedroom floor. I didn't stop until I found it in a black Adidas box. I flipped the lid, and it was there. My copy of John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. It wasn't a happy story the kind you'd expect a person to reach for when they were trying to chase away whatever was haunting them. But I chose it for a reason. It was about sacrifice. Whether it was self-sacrifice or sacrificing someone else to save your own skin, that was a matter of debate. I figured I could decide tonight, as I turned the pages. It was too late when I realized someone else must have been searching for answers within the covers of a book. Lena! She was turning pages, too. When Seraphine turned nineteen, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. The baby was a surprise, and although Seraphine spent hours staring at her daughter's delicate face, the child was a mixed blessing. Seraphine had never wanted to have a baby. She didn't want a child to live the life of uncertainty that came with being a Duquesne. She didn't want her child to have to fight the darkness that Seraphine knew was lurking inside her. Until the child would get her real name at sixteen, Seraphine called her daughter Lena because it meant the Bright One in the futile hope of staving off the curse. John had laughed. It sounded like something mortals would do, hanging their hopes on a name. Seraphine had to hang her hopes on something. Lena wasn't the only unexpected person to show up in her life. Seraphine was walking alone when she saw Abraham Ravenwood standing on the same corner where she had first met him almost a year before. He seemed to be waiting, as if he knew she was coming, as if he could somehow see the war being raged on the battlefield of her mind, a war she never knew if she was winning. He waved as though they were old friends. You look troubled, Miss Duquesne. Is something bothering you? Is there anything I can do to help? With his white beard and cane, Abraham reminded Seraphine of her grandfather. She missed her family, even though they refused to see her. I don't think so. Still fighting your nature, have the voices grown stronger? They had, but how could he know? 
Incubuses didn't go dark. They were born into the darkness. He tried again. Have you been starting fires by accident? It's called the wake of fire. Seraphine froze. She had inadvertently started several fires. When her emotions intensified, it was as if they actually manifested into flames. Only two thoughts consumed her now. Fire and Lena. I didn't know it had a name, she whispered. There are a number of things you don't know. I would like to invite you to study with me. I can teach you everything you need to know. Seraphine looked away. He was dark, a demon. His black eyes told her everything she needed to know. She couldn't trust Abraham Ravenwood. You have a child now, don't you? It wasn't really a question. Do you want her to walk the world beholden to a curse that dates back to before you were born? Or do you want her to be able to claim herself? Seraphine didn't tell John she was meeting Abraham Ravenwood in the tunnels. He wouldn't understand. For John, the world was black or white, light or dark. He didn't know they could exist together, within the same person, as they did in her. She hated lying, but she was doing it for Lena. Abraham showed her something no one in her family had ever spoken of. A prophecy related to the curse. A prophecy that would save Lena. I'm sure the casters in your family never told you about this. He held the faded paper in his hand as he read the words that promised to change everything. The first will be black, but the second may choose to turn back. Seraphine felt her breath catch. Do you understand what it means? Abraham knew the words meant everything to her, and she clung to his as if they were part of the prophecy. The first natural born into the Duquesne family would be dark, a cataclyst. He was talking about her, but the second will have a choice. She can claim herself. Seraphine found the courage to ask the question, eating away at her. Why are you helping me? Abraham smiled. I have a boy of my own, not much older than Lena. Your father is raising him. His parents abandoned him because he has some very unusual powers. And he has a destiny as well. But I don't want my daughter to go dark. I don't think you truly understand darkness. Your mind has been poisoned by light casters. Light and dark are two sides of the same coin. Part of Seraphine wondered if he was right. She prayed he was. Abraham was also teaching her how to control the urges and the voices. There was only one way to exorcise them. Seraphine set fires, burned down huge cornfields and stretches of forests. It was a relief to allow her powers free reign, and no one got hurt. But the voices still came for her, whispering the same word again and again. Burn. When the voices weren't haunting her, she could hear Abraham in her head, bits and pieces of their conversations looping over and over again. Light casters are worse than mortals, filled with jealousy because their powers are inferior. They want to dilute our bloodlines with mortal blood. But the order of things will not allow it. Late at night, some of the words made sense. Light casters reject the dark fire from which all power comes. 
Some she tried to force deep into the shadows of her mind. If they were strong enough, they would kill us all. I was lying on the floor of my trashed bedroom, staring at my sky-blue ceiling. Lucille was sitting on my chest, licking her paws. Lena's voice found its way into my mind so quietly I almost didn't hear it. She was doing it for me. She loved me. I didn't know what to say. It was true, but it wasn't that simple. Seraphine was sinking deeper and deeper into darkness in every vision. I know she loved you, El. I just don't think she could fight what was happening to her. I couldn't believe I was defending the woman who had killed my mom. But Isabel wasn't Seraphine, at least not right away. Seraphine killed Isabel, just like she killed my mother. Abraham was what happened to her. Lena was looking for someone to blame. We all were. I heard pages turning. Lena, don't touch it. Don't worry. It doesn't trigger the visions every time. I thought about the arc light, the way it pulled me out of this world and into another randomly. What I didn't want to think about was the last thing Lena said. Every time. How many times had she opened Seraphine's book? Lena was Kelting again before I could decide whether or not to ask. This one's my favorite. She wrote it over and over inside the covers. Suffering has been stronger than all other teaching and has taught me to understand what your heart used to be. I wondered whose heart Seraphine had meant. Maybe it was her own. November 24th. More wrong than right. It was Thanksgiving Day, which meant two things. A visit from my Aunt Caroline and the annual bake-off between Amma's pecan pie, Amma's apple pie, and Amma's pumpkin pie. Amma always won, but the competition was fierce, and the judging the subject of lots of noise around the table. I was looking forward to it more than usual this year. It was the first time Amma had baked a pie in months, and part of me suspected the only reason she'd done it today was so no one else would notice. But I didn't care. Between my dad dressed in his sport coat instead of pajamas like last year, Aunt Caroline and Marion playing Scrabble with the sisters, and the smell of pies in the oven, I almost forgot about the lubbers and the heat and my great-aunt missing from the table. The hard part was that it reminded me of all the other things I'd been forgetting lately. The things I hadn't meant to forget. I wondered how much longer I would be able to remember. There was only one person I could think of who might know the answer to that question. I stood in front of Amma's bedroom door for a good minute before I knocked. Getting answers out of Amma was like pulling teeth, if the teeth belonged to a gator. She had always kept secrets. It was as much a part of her as her red hots and crossword puzzles, her tool apron and her superstitions. Maybe it was part of being a seer, too. But this was different. I'd never seen her walk away from the stove on Thanksgiving while her pies were still baking, or skip making Uncle Abner's lemon meringue altogether. It was time to grow those kneecaps. I reached up to knock. You gonna come in already, or wear a hole in the carpet? Amma called from inside her room. I opened the door, prepared to see the rows of shelves lined with mason jars, full of everything from rock salt to graveyard dirt, bookshelves crammed with cracked volumes that had been handed down, and notebooks with Amma's recipes. It wasn't long ago that I realized those recipes 
might not have anything to do with cooking. Amma's room had always reminded me of an apothecary, brimming with mystery and the cure for whatever ailed you, like Amma herself. Not today. Her room was torn apart, the way mine was after I dumped the contents of twenty shoeboxes all over my floor, like she was looking for something she couldn't find. The bottles that were usually lined up neatly on the shelves, labels facing out, were pushed together on top of her dresser. Books were stacked on the floor, on her bed, everywhere but on the shelves. Some of them were open, old diaries handwritten in Gola, the language of her ancestors. There were other things I had never seen in here before, black feathers, branches, and a bucket of rocks. Amma was sitting in the middle of the mess. I stepped inside. What happened in here? She held out her hand, and I pulled her up. Nothing's what happened. I'm cleaning up. Would do you some good to try it in that mess you call a room. Amma tried to shoo me out, but I didn't move. Go on now. Pies are almost done. She pushed past me. In a second, she'd be out in the hall and on her way to the kitchen. What's wrong with me? I blurted it out, and Amma stopped dead in her tracks. For a second, she didn't say a word. You're seventeen. I expect there's more wrong with you than right. She didn't turn around. You mean like writing with the wrong hand and hating chocolate milk and your scrambled eggs all of a sudden? Forgetting the names of people I've known my whole life? Is that the kind of stuff you're talking about? Amma turned around slowly, her brown eyes shining. Her hands were shaking, and she pushed them into the pockets of her apron so I wouldn't notice. Whatever was happening to me, Amma knew what it was. She took a deep breath. Maybe she was finally going to tell me. I don't know about any of that, but I'm looking into it. Might have something to do with all this heat and these darn bugs, the problems the casters are having. She was lying. It was the first time Amma had ever given what sounded like a straight answer in her life, which made it even more crooked. Amma, what aren't you telling me? What do you know? I know that my Redeemer lives. She looked at me, defiant. It was a line from a hymn I grew up hearing in church while making spitballs and trying not to fall asleep. Amma, what comfort this sweet sentence gives. She clapped her hand on my back. Please. Now she was all out singing, which sounded kind of crazy. The way you sound when you think something terrible is about to happen, but you're trying to convince yourself that it isn't. The terrible shows up in your voice, even when you think you can hide it. You can't. He lives, he lives who once was dead. She shoved me out of the room. He lives, my ever-living head. The door slammed behind me. Now. She was already halfway down the hall, still humming the rest of the hymn. Let's go eat before your aunts get into the kitchen and burn the house down. I watched her scurry down the hall, shouting before she was halfway to the kitchen. Everybody get on into the dining room before my food gets cold. I was starting to think I might have more luck asking my ever-living head. When I ducked under the doorframe and walked into the dining room, everyone else was already taking their seats. Lena and Macon must have just arrived. They stood at one end of the dining room, while Marion was deep in conversation with my Aunt Caroline at the other. Amma was still shouting orders from the kitchen, where the bird was resting. Aunt Grace shuffled toward the table, waving her handkerchief. Don't y'all keep this fine bird waiting any longer. 
he died a noble death, and it's downright disrespectable. Thelma and Aunt Mercy were right behind her. If you call a noble death a buckshot in the behind, then I reckon you're right. Aunt Mercy pushed past her sister so she could sit in front of the biscuits. Don't you start, Mercy Lynn. You know vegetablism is one step closer to a world without panties and preachers. That there is a documented fact. Lena took the seat next to Marion, trying not to laugh. Even Macon was having trouble keeping a straight face. My dad was standing behind Amma's chair, waiting to push it in for her when she finally came in from the kitchen. Listening to Aunt Mercy and Aunt Grace peck away at each other made me miss Aunt Prue even more. But as I slid into my seat, I realized someone else was missing— Where's Liv? Marion glanced at Macon before she answered. She decided to stay in tonight. Aunt Grace caught enough to add her two cents. Well, that just ain't American. Did you invite her, Ethan? Liv isn't American, and yeah. I mean, yes, ma'am, I invited her. It was nearly true, I had asked Marion to bring her. That was an invitation, right? Marion unfolded her napkin and placed it on her lap. I'm not certain she felt comfortable coming. Lena bit her lip like she felt bad. It's because of me. Or me, Elle. I didn't exactly invite her myself. I feel like a jerk. Me too. But there was nothing more to say because right then Amma came in, carrying the green bean casserole. All right, it's time to thank the good Lord and eat. She sat down and my dad pushed in her chair and took his own seat. We all joined hands around the table and my Aunt Caroline bowed her head to say the Thanksgiving prayer the way she always did. I could feel the power of my family. I felt it the same way I did when I joined a caster circle. Even though Lena and Macon were the only actual casters here, I still felt it. The buzz of our own kind of power, instead of lubbers chewing up the town or incubuses ripping up the sky. Then I heard it, too. Instead of the prayer, all I could hear was the song thundering into my mind so loud I thought my head would split. time Aunt Caroline stopped praying, I was ready to start. Six pies later, Pecan, and as usual, Amma, had been declared the winners. My dad was falling into his customary post-turkey nap on the couch, wedged in between the sisters. Dinner was cut short when we were all too full to sit upright in our hard wooden chairs. I didn't eat as much as usual. I felt too guilty. All I could think about was Liv, sitting alone in the tunnels on Thanksgiving, whether it was a holiday to her or not. I know. Lena was standing in the kitchen doorway, staring at me. Elle, it's not what you think. Lena walked over to the counter where the leftovers were piled up. What I think is that you should pack up some of Amma's pie and take it down to the tunnels. Why would you want me to do that? Lena looked embarrassed. I didn't understand how she felt until the night Ridley cast the furor. I know what it's like not to have friends. 
It must be worse to have them and lose them. Are you saying you want me to be friends with Liv? I didn't buy it. She shook her head. I could see how hard this was for her. No, what I'm saying is, I trust you. Is this one of those tests guys don't understand and always fail? She smiled, covering the leftover pecan pie with tinfoil. Not today. Lena and I hadn't even opened the front door when Amma caught us. Where do you think you're going? We're going to Ravenwood. I'm going to take Liv some of your pecan pie. Amma tried to give me the look, but somehow it was just a look to me. What you mean is you're going down into those tunnels. Only to see Liv, I promise. Amma rubbed her gold charm. Straight there and back. I don't want to hear about any casts or fires, vexes, or any other demons. Not a one. You hear me? I always heard her, even when she wasn't talking. Lena lifted the outer door cut into the floorboards in Ridley's room. I still couldn't believe she was letting me go down alone. But then again... If you could sense it when your boyfriend was thinking about kissing another girl, it wasn't that big a leap. Lena handed me the pie. I'll be in here when you're finished. I've been meaning to look around. I wondered if she had been in here since the night we found John. I knew Lena was worried about Ridley, especially now that she was powerless. I won't be long. I kissed her and stepped down onto the stairs I couldn't see. I heard their voices before I saw their faces. I'm not sure this is a proper southern Thanksgiving, since I've never had Thanksgiving dinner anywhere, but it's quite posh, what with the frozen dinner and all. Liv, she sounded suspiciously happy. I didn't have to hear the next voice, to know who it was. You're in luck. I've never had one either. Abraham and Silas weren't big on holidays. Then there's the whole not needing to eat thing. So I have nothing to compare it to. John. What? No Halloween? No Christmas? No Boxing Day? Liv was laughing, but I could tell it was a real question. None of the above. That's a bit grim. I'm sorry. It's no big deal. So this is our first Thanksgiving, then. I heard her laugh. Together, he added. The way he said it made me feel sick, like I had eaten too many pieces of pie and then gone back for a turkey and stuffing sandwich. I stuck my head around the corner. Sure enough, John and Liv were leaning over the table in the study Macon had set up for her. It was set with two candles and one TV dinner in a lopsided aluminum tray. Turkey. I felt terrible, especially after the dinner Amma made. Liv was holding what had to be John's lighter, trying to light the candles on the table between them. Your hand is shaking. No, it's not. She looked down at her hand. Well, it is a bit drafty down here. Do I make you nervous? John smiled. It's okay. I won't hold it against you. Nervous? Please. Liv's cheeks turned a familiar shade of pink. I'm not afraid of you, if that's what you think. They stared at each other for a second. Ouch! Liv dropped the lighter, shaking her hand. She must have burned her finger. Are you okay? Let me see. John grabbed her hand, opening it so he could see her fingers. He put his hand on top of Liv's, his huge palm covering her small one. Liv bit her lip. I think I need to run it under cold water. Hold on. What? Liv stared down at their hands. John moved his, and Liv lifted hers, wiggling her fingers. It doesn't hurt anymore. 
It's not even red. How did you do that? John looked embarrassed. Like I said, if I touch a caster, I get some of their power. I don't steal it or anything. It just happens. You're a thaumaturge, a healer, like Lena's cousin Ryan. You didn't... Don't worry, it wasn't her. Picked it up from a girl I bumped into. I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic or not. Relief flooded Liv's face. It's remarkable. You do know that, don't you? She examined her finger again. I don't know anything, except that I'm a freak of nature. I'm not so sure nature had much to do with it, since there isn't another person like you in the entire universe, as far as I know. But you are special. She said it so matter-of-factly, I almost would have believed it, if she wasn't talking to John Breed. I'm so special, no one wants me around. He laughed, but it sounded bitter. So special, I do stuff I can't even remember. Back home, we call that a pub crawl. I've lost whole weeks, Olivia. I hated the way he said her name, Olivia, like he wanted to stretch out every syllable and take as long as he could. Does it happen all the time? Now Liv sounded curious, but it seemed like it was more than the wheels in her scientific mind turning, because she also sounded sad. He nodded, except when I was in the arc light, nothing to remember in there. I cleared my throat and stepped into the room. Yeah? Then maybe we should stick you back in that thing. They were startled. I could tell because John's face went dark, and the guy who had been talking to Liv disappeared. Ethan, what are you doing here? Liv looked flustered. I brought you some of Amma's famous pecan pie. We missed you at dinner. I didn't mean to interrupt. Except I did. Liv tossed her napkin down on the table. Don't be ridiculous. You're not interrupting anything. We were just sitting down to a supper of somewhat questionable hen pots. Hey, that's our first Thanksgiving you're talking about, sweetheart. John grinned at her and stared at me. I ignored him. Liv, do you think you can help me with something for a minute? She pushed her chair away from the table. Lead on, wayward. I could feel John's eyes on me as we left the room. Sweetheart. I grabbed Liv by the arm as soon as we were out of Incubus earshot. What are you doing? Trying to eat my Thanksgiving dinner? Her cheeks went pink, but she didn't slow down. I meant... What are you doing with him? She pulled her arm free. Are you looking for something in particular? Was there a reason you needed me? We had made our way to the Lunai Libri and disappeared into the stacks, and I watched the torches light along the wall, marking the way we had come. She took one from the wall. Last I heard, he doesn't eat anything but Doritos. He doesn't. He was keeping me company, being a friend. I stepped in front of her, and she stopped walking. Liv, he's not your friend. She was annoyed. Then what is he, if you're such an expert? I don't know what he is or what he's doing, but I know he's not your friend. What do you care? Liv, you could have come over today. You were invited. Macon and Marion were there. They wanted you to come. That's quite an invitation. I can't imagine how I missed it. I knew her feelings were hurt, but I didn't know how to fix it. I should have invited her myself. I mean, we all wanted you to come. I'm sure you did, just as I'm sure I still have the bruises to show from the last time I saw Lena. The furor was a spell, and believe me, you gave as good as you got. She softened. 
I know I could have come to your house today, but I didn't belong there. I don't belong anywhere, and I suppose neither does John. Maybe mortals and incubuses aren't so different after all. You do belong, Liv, and you don't have to stay down here with him. You're not a monster, like he is. Ethan, is everything okay? Lena was reaching out to me. Yeah, El, be there in a minute. No rush. It was Lena's way of saying she didn't mind me talking to Liv. Whether or not I would ever get Liv to believe that, I wasn't sure I believed it myself. Liv was staring at me. What are you doing here, really? Because I'm fairly certain you aren't concerned about my social life. You're wrong. I was still holding the pie tin. She took it, opening the foil and breaking off a piece of pie. Delicious. So there is nothing new I should know about? She broke off another corner. Amma's pie was a good distraction. What do you know about the Wheel of Fate? She looked surprised. Funny you should ask. And just like that, the subject of Liv's personal life was closed, and we returned to her favorite subject, anything else. Why? I've been thinking about it ever since we found the Temporis Porta. Liv pulled out her red notebook and opened it to a page in the middle. There was a sketch of three perfectly formed circles, each divided by spokes set in varying patterns. This was all I could remember from the door. That looks right. You said it was some kind of code? She nodded. I'm not certain, because you opened the door without using them, but I've been researching the symbol in Macon's library. And? She pointed at the drawing. The repeated circle. I think it has something to do with what you're calling the Wheel of Fate. And the Temporis Porta? I think so, but there's one thing I can't understand. What is it? Something Liv didn't understand was a bad sign. The door opened by itself. You didn't even touch any of the circles. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. I remembered the rough feel of the rowan wood beneath my forehead. And I couldn't go through it at all. But you said you didn't understand why. I wasn't sure where she was going with this. Whatever the wheel of fate is, I think it has something to do with you, not me. I let her believe it, but I knew better. I could still hear Amma's voice echoing in my head. The wheel of fate crushes us all. December 6th Fractured Soul Ethan! Lena was screaming, and I couldn't find her. I tried to run, but I kept falling because the ground was moving beneath my feet. The pavement on Main was shaking so hard that dirt and rocks were flying up into my eyes. The road rolled on, and it felt like I was standing on the edge of two tectonic plates, battling it out. I stood there, one foot on each plate, while the world shook and the chasm between the plates widened. The crack was so big I knew I was going to fall, and it was getting bigger. It was only a matter of time. Ethan! I heard Lena's voice, but I couldn't see her. I looked through the crack and saw her far below me, and then I was falling. My floor hit me harder than usual. Lena? I heard her voice, groggy and half asleep. I'm here. It was just a dream. I flipped over onto my back, trying to catch my breath. I balled up the sheet and threw it across the room. Everything's fine. I knew I didn't sound very convincing. Seriously, Ethan, 
Is your head okay? I nodded, even though she couldn't see me. My head's fine. It's the Earth's tectonic plates I'm worried about. She didn't answer for a moment. And you're worried about me. Yeah, El. And you. She knew when I woke up screaming her name that she had suffered another violent, frightening end in one of my dreams we hadn't shared since the seventeenth moon. And the dreams were getting worse, not better. It's because of everything we went through last summer, Ethan. I'm still reliving it, too. But I didn't tell her it was happening to me every night, or that she wasn't the one in danger this time. I didn't think she wanted to know how much reliving I was doing. I didn't want her to feel like it was getting in the way of living. There was something else getting in the way of living, at least for me. The answer to the question that Ama wouldn't give me, and I couldn't figure out. But I was pretty sure there was someone else who knew, and I finally had enough guts to go see him. The only question left was whether or not I could get him to tell me. It was pitch black outside as I pulled the front door closed behind me. When I turned around, Lucille was sitting on the porch watching me. Didn't get enough of the tunnels last time? Lucille cocked her head to one side, her standard answer. Let's get going. I heard a rip. Actually, it sounded more like a nasty tear. I spun around. I wasn't ready for another visit from Abraham. But this time, it wasn't him. Far from it. Link was lying on his back, caught in the bushes. Man, this traveling thing takes some serious practice. He climbed out of the bushes and brushed himself off. Where are we headed? How did you know I was going somewhere? Were you fishing around in my head? If he was, he was dead. I told you before. I don't want to mess around in that temple of doom. He brushed off his Iron Maiden t-shirt. I don't sleep, remember? I was wandering around outside, and I heard you sneaking downstairs. It's one of my superpowers. So, where are we going? I wasn't sure if I should tell him, but the truth was, I didn't want to go alone. New Orleans. You don't know anybody in... Link shook his head. Dude... Why does it always have to be graveyards and crypts with you? Can't we hang out somewhere that isn't full of dead bodies? Another question I couldn't answer. The tomb of voodoo queen Marie Laveau was exactly the same. I stared at the X's carved into the door and wondered if we should leave our own, in case we never came back out. But there was no time to think about it, because Link had the door open in seconds, and we were inside. The rotted, crooked stairs were still there, leading down into the darkness. So were the smoke and the putrid smell that clung to your skin, even after you took a shower. Link coughed. Licorice and gasoline. That's nasty. Shh, be quiet. We reached the base of the stairs, and I could see the workshop, or whatever this awful place was called. There was a dim light coming from inside, illuminating the jars and bottles. My skin crawled at the sight of reptiles and tiny mice frantically trying to escape. Lucille hid behind my leg as if she was afraid she might end up in one of those jars. How do we know if he's home? Link whispered. Before I could answer, a voice rose from behind us. I am always home, in one form or another. I recognized the Bacor's gravelly voice and heavy accent. He looked even more dangerous up close. His skin was unwrinkled, but scars marred his face. They looked like scratches and puncture wounds, as if he'd been attacked by a creature that wasn't in one of those jars. His long braids were ratty, and I could see tiny objects tied into them. 
Metal symbols and charms, bits of bone and beads laced so tightly that they'd become part of the hair itself. He was holding his snakeskin staff. We're... we're sorry to show up like this, I stammered. Was it a dare worth taking? His hand tightened on the staff. Trespassing is a violation of the law, yours and mine. We didn't come here on a dare. My voice was still shaking. We came to find you. I have questions, and I think you're the only person who can give me the answers. The Bacor's eyes narrowed, and he rubbed his goatee, intrigued. Or maybe contemplating how to dispose of our bodies after he killed us. What makes you think I have the answers? Ama. I mean, Amarie Trudeau. She was here. I need to know why. I had his attention now. I think it was about me. He studied me carefully. So, you're the one. Interesting you would come here instead of to your Sia. She won't tell me anything. There was something in his expression beyond recognition. This way. We followed him into the room with the smoke and the fumes and the lingering residue of death. Link was next to me, whispering, You sure this is a good idea? I've got an incubus with me, right? It was a bad joke, but I was so scared I could barely think. A quarter? Link took a deep breath. Hope that's enough. The Bacor stood behind the wooden table as Link and I stood facing him on the other side. What do you know about my business with the Sia? I know she came to you about a spread she didn't like. I didn't want to reveal everything I knew. I was afraid he would realize this wasn't our first time here. I want to know what the card said, why she needed your help. He watched me carefully as if he could see right through me. It was the way Aunt Dell looked at a room when she was sorting through the layers. That's two questions, and only one of them matters. Which one? His eyes gleamed in the dark. Your Sia needs my help to do something she can't. To join the Tibonage, mend the seams she ripped herself. I had no idea what he was talking about. What seams had Amma ripped? Link didn't understand either. T-bone, what? What kind of steak are we talking about here? The Bacor's eyes locked on me. You really don't know what's waiting for you. It's watching us now. I couldn't speak. It's watching us now. What? What is it? I barely choked out the words. How do I get rid of it? The Bacor walked over to the terrarium filled with writhing snakes and lifted the lid. That's two questions again. I can only answer one. What's watching me? My voice was shaking, and my hands, every part of me. The Bacor lifted a snake, its body ringed in black, red, and white. The snake coiled around his arm, but the Bacor held its head as if he knew it might strike. I'll show you. He led us to the center of the room, close to the source of the nauseating smoke, a huge pillar that resembled a candle. It looked like it had been made by hand. Lucille crouched under a nearby table, trying to avoid the fumes. Or maybe the snake, or the crazy guy carrying what looked like eggshells over to a bowl at our feet. He crushed the shells with one hand, careful to keep his other hand on the head of the snake. The tibonage is meant to be one, never separated. He closed his eyes. I will call Kalfu. We need the help of a powerful spirit. Link elbowed me. I don't know if I like the sound of that. The Bacor closed his eyes and started to speak. 
I recognized traces of Twyla's French Creole, but it was mixed with a language I'd never heard before. The words were muffled, as if the Bacor was talking to someone close enough to hear him whisper. I wasn't sure what we were supposed to see, but it couldn't be any weirder than Aunt Prue outside her body or the Lilum inside Mrs. English's. The smoke started to swirl slowly, growing denser. I watched as it curved and began to take shape. The Bacor was chanting louder now. The smoke started to change from black to gray, and the snake hissed. Something was forming from the smoke. I'd seen this before, in Bonaventure Cemetery, when Twyla called my mother's shear. I couldn't take my eyes off the smoke. The body formed from the bottom up, just as my mom's had, the feet and the legs. What the hell? Link tried to back up, but he tripped. The torso and the arms. The face was the final element to emerge. It stared back at me, a face I would have known anywhere. My own. I jumped away, scrambling backward. Holy crap! Link shouted, but his voice seemed far away. Panic gripped me like two hands wrapping themselves around my neck. The figure started to fade, but before it did, the sheer spoke. I'm waiting. Then it was gone. The Vakor stopped chanting, the sickening candle blew out, and it was over. What was that? I was staring at the Bacor. Why is there a shear that looks like me? He walked back to the terrarium and dropped the snake inside with the others. It doesn't look like you. It's your tibonage, the other half of your soul. What did you say? The Bacor took a match and relit the candle. Half your soul is with the living and halves with the dead. You left it behind. Left it behind where? In the other world, when you died. He sounded almost bored. When I died? He was talking about the night Lena and Ama brought me back on the sixteenth moon. How? The Bacor flicked his wrist and the match went out. If you come back too fast, the soul can be fractured, divided. One part of the soul goes back with the living, and the other half stays with the dead. Caught between this world and the other, bound to the missing half until they're brought back together. Divided. He couldn't be explaining it right. That would mean I only had half a soul— it didn't even seem possible. How could a person only have half a soul? What happened to the rest of it? Where did it... Bound to the missing half. I knew what had been following me all this time, lurking in the shadows. Me. The other me. It was the reason I was changing, losing more and more of myself every day. The reason I didn't like chocolate milk anymore, or Amma's scrambled eggs. The reason I couldn't remember what was in the shoeboxes in my bedroom, or my phone number. The reason I was suddenly left-handed. My knees buckled, and I felt myself pitch forward. I could see the floor rising up to meet me. A hand grabbed my arm and hauled me back to my feet. Link. So how do you get the two halves back together? Is there a spell or something? Link sounded impatient, like he was ready to throw me over his shoulder and run home. The Bacor threw his head back and laughed. When he spoke, it felt like he was looking right through me. Takes more than a spell. That's why your seer came to me. But don't you worry. We have an agreement. I felt like someone had thrown a bucket of cold water on me. What kind of agreement? I remembered what he had said to Ama the night we followed her here. There is only one price.
What's the price? I was yelling, my voice echoing in my ears. The Bacor lifted his skin-covered staff and pointed it at me. I've told you more than your share of secrets tonight. He smiled, all the darkness and evil within him twisting itself into a human face. How come we don't have to pay you? Link asked. Your seer will pay enough for you all. I would have asked him again, but I knew he wouldn't tell us. And if there were deeper secrets than this, I didn't want to know. December 7th. Cards of Providence. When I got home, it was way past midnight. Everyone in my house was asleep, except one person. Amma's light was on, her room glowing between the two haint blue shutters. I wondered if she knew I was gone and where I'd been. I almost hoped she did. It would make what I was about to do a hundred times easier. Amma wasn't the kind of person you confronted. She was a confrontation all on her own. She lived by her rules, her law, the things she believed which to her were as sure as the sun rising. She was also the only mother I had left, and most days the only parent. The idea of fighting with her made me feel hollow and sick inside. But not as hollow as it made me feel to know I was only half of myself, half the person I'd always been. Amma knew, and she had never said a word. And the words she did say were lies. I knocked on her bedroom door before I had time to change my mind. She opened it right away, as if she'd been waiting for me. She was wearing her white robe with the pink roses on it, the one I gave her on her birthday last year. Amma didn't look at me. She looked past me, as if she could see something more than the wall behind me. Maybe she could. Maybe there were pieces of me scattered all over the place, like a broken bottle. Been waiting on you. Her voice sounded small and tired, and she stepped out of the doorway so I could come in. Amma's room still looked ransacked, but one thing was different. There were cards spread out on the little round table under the window. I walked over to the table and picked one up. The bleeding blade. They weren't tarot cards. Reading cards again? What are they saying tonight, Amma? She crossed the room and started pushing the cards into a stack. Don't have much to say. Think I've seen all there is to see. Another card caught my eye. I held it up in front of her. What about this one? The fractured soul. What does this one have to say? Her hands were shaking so hard that it took her three tries to grab the card from me. You think you know something, but a piece of something is the same as nothing. Neither one gets you much of anything. You mean like a piece of my soul? Is that the same as nothing? I said it to hurt her, to bust up her soul, so she could see how it felt. Where did you hear that? Her voice was shaky. She grabbed the chain around her neck and rubbed the worn gold charm hanging from it. From your friend in New Orleans. Amma's eyes went wide, and she grabbed the back of the chair to steady herself. I knew from her reaction that whatever she'd seen tonight, it wasn't me raising souls with the Bacor. Are you telling me the truth, Ethan Waite? Did you go to see that devil? I went because you lied to me. I didn't have a choice. But Amma wasn't listening to me. She was flipping the cards madly, pushing them around under her tiny palms. Aunt Avi, show me something. Tell me what this means. Amma! She was muttering to herself, rearranging the cards over and over again. I can't see anything. Has to be a way. There's always a way. Just have to keep looking.
I grabbed her shoulders gently. Amma, put the cards down. Talk to me. She held up a card. On the front was a picture of a sparrow with a broken wing. The Forgotten Future. Know what these cards are called? Cards of Providence, because they tell more than just your future. They tell your fate. Know the difference? I shook my head. I was afraid to say anything. She was coming unhinged. Your future can change. I looked into her dark eyes, which were filling with tears. Maybe you can change fate, too. The tears started falling, and she was shaking her head back and forth hysterically. The wheel of fate crushes us all. I couldn't stand to hear it again. Amma wasn't just going dark. She was going crazy, and I was watching it happen. She pulled away, gathered up her robe, and dropped to her knees. Her eyes were shut tight, but her chin was turned up to her blue ceiling. Uncle Abner, Aunt Ivy, Grandma Marcella, I'm in need of your intercession. Forgive me of my trespasses, as the good Lord forgives us all. I watched as she waited, mumbling the words over and over. It was a good hour before she gave up, exhausted and defeated. The greats never came. When I was little, my mother used to say that everything you needed to know about the South could be found in either Savannah or New Orleans. Apparently, the same was true about my life. Lena didn't agree. The next morning, we were arguing about it in the back of history class, and I wasn't winning. A fractured soul isn't two things, L. It's one thing split in half. When I said two souls, all Lena heard was two and assumed I was offering myself up as the one who is two. It could be any of us. I'm the one who is two, if anyone is. Take a look at my eyes. I could feel her rising panic. I'm not saying I'm the one who is two, L. I'm just a mortal. If it took a caster to break the order, it's going to take more than a mortal to restore it, don't you think? She didn't look convinced, but deep down she had to know I was right. For better or worse, that's all I was, a mortal. It was the source of the whole problem between us, the reason we could barely touch and couldn't really be together. How could I save the caster world when I could barely live in it? Lena lowered her voice. Link, he's two things, an incubus and a mortal. Shh. I glanced at Link, but he was oblivious, trying to carve Linkubus into his desk with a pen. I'm pretty sure he barely qualifies as either one. John is two things, a caster and an incubus. L. Ridley, there could still be a trace of Siren inside her, even as a mortal. Two. Now she was reaching. Amma is a seer and a mortal. Two things. It's not Amma. I must have been shouting because the whole class turned around in their seats. Lena looked hurt. It isn't, Mr. Waite, because the rest of us thought it was. Mr. Evans looked like he was ready to get out the little pink pad of detention slips. Sorry, sir. I ducked down behind my textbook and lowered my voice. I know it sounds weird, but this is a good thing. Now I know why all that crazy stuff has been happening, like the weird dreams and seeing the other half of myself all over the place. Now everything makes sense. It wasn't completely true, and Lena wasn't convinced, but she didn't say anything else, and neither did I. Between the heat and the bugs, Abraham and the vexes, John Breed and the Lillum possessing the body of our English teacher, I figured we had enough to worry about. At least, that's what I told myself. Let it snow. Time for a change in the weather. Buy your tickets now.
The posters were everywhere, as if the fact needed to be advertised. The winter formal was here, and this year the dance committee, made up of Savannah Snow and her fan club, decided to call it the Snowball. Savannah insisted it had nothing to do with her and everything to do with the heat wave, which is why everyone was calling it the Slush Ball, and Lena and I were going. She didn't want to go, especially after what happened at the winter formal last year. When I gave her the tickets, she looked like she wanted to set them on fire. This is a joke, right? It's not a joke. I was sitting across from her at the lunch table, stabbing at the ice in my soda with my straw. This wasn't going to go well. Why would you possibly think I want to go to that dance? To dance with me. I gave her a pathetic look. I can dance with you in my bedroom. She held out her hand. In fact, come here. I'll dance with you right now in the cafeteria. It's not the same. I'm not going. Lena was digging in her heels. Then I'll go with someone else, I said. Her eyes narrowed. Like Ama. She shook her head. Why do you want to go so badly? And don't say to dance with me. It could be our last chance. It would be a relief to worry about something as harmless as a disaster at the dance instead of the destruction of the world. I was almost disappointed Ridley wasn't around to ruin it with style. So in the end, Lena had caved, even though she was still mad about the whole thing. I didn't care. I was making her go. With everything going on, I didn't know if there would ever be another dance at Jackson. We were sitting on the hot metal bleachers by the field, eating lunch on what should have been a cold December day. Lena and I didn't want to run into Mrs. English, and Link didn't want to run into Savannah, so the bleachers had become our hideout. You're still driving tomorrow, right? I threw the crust of my sandwich at Link. Tomorrow night was the snowball, and between Link and Lena, there was only a fifty-fifty chance we'd get there at all. Sure, just trying to decide whether to wear my hair up or down. Can't wait till you see my smoking new dress. Link threw the crust back at me. Wait until you see mine. Lena took a rubber band off her wrist, pulling her hair into a ponytail. I think I'm wearing a raincoat and boots and bringing an umbrella in case anyone takes the whole slush ball thing literally. She didn't try to hide the sarcasm in her voice. It had been like this ever since I convinced them to go. You guys don't have to come with me, but this may be the last dance in Gatlin, maybe anywhere, and I'm going. Stop saying that. It won't be the last dance. Lena was frustrated. Don't get your panties in a twist. Link punched my shoulder a little too hard. It'll be awesome. Lena's gonna fix everything. I am? Lena smiled a little. Maybe John bit you harder than we thought. Sure. Don't you have some kind of don't let this dance suck cast? Link had been depressed since Ridley took off. Oh, wait. You don't because it's going to suck no matter what kind of cast you've got. Why don't you try a stay home and shut your trap cast, since you're the one taking Savannah Snow to the dance? I wadded up my sandwich wrapper. She asked me! She asked you to her party after the game, and look how well that turned out. Don't bring it up, Ethan. Well, it's true. Lena raised her eyebrow. You'll only make him feel worse. Trust me, Savannah's got that down. Link sighed. Where do you think she is right now? Who, I said, though we both knew exactly who he was talking about. He ignored me. Probably making trouble somewhere. Lena folded her lunch bag into tinier and tinier squares. Definitely making trouble somewhere. 
The bell rang. It's probably better this way. Link stood up. It's definitely better this way. I agreed. Could have been worse, I guess. It wasn't like I was that hung up on her, like I was in love with her or something. I wasn't sure who he was trying to convince, but he jammed his hands into his pockets and took off across the field before I could say anything. Yeah, that really would have sucked. I squeezed Lena's hand, letting it drop before I got lightheaded. I feel so bad for him. She stopped walking and slipped her hands around my waist. I pulled her close, and she rested her head against my chest. You know I'd do anything for you, right? I smiled. I know you'd go to a stupid dance for me. I would. And I am. I kissed her forehead, letting my lips stay on her skin as long as I could. She looked up at me. Maybe we can make tomorrow really fun, help Link forget about my cousin for a little while. That's what I'm talking about. I have an idea, something to fix a broken Linkubus heart. The tip of her ponytail began to curl, and I walked across the field wishing there was a cast for that. December 12th Slush Ball When Link pulled up in front of my house, Savannah was already in the front seat of the beater. He got out and met me at the curb like he had something to tell me. He was wearing a tacky, ruffled tux shirt that made him look like he was in a mariachi band and tux pants with his high-top vans. Nice threads. Thought Savannah would hate it. Thought she wouldn't get in the car. I swear, I tried everything. Normally, he would have been gloating. Tonight, he sounded miserable. Rid's really gotten to him, El. Just get him up here to the house. I have a plan. I thought you were meeting Savannah at the dance. Isn't she supposed to be there with Emily and the rest of the dance committee? I lowered my voice, but I didn't have to. I could hear a Holy Rollers demo track blasting from the stereo, as if Link had been trying to drown Savannah out. I tried that. She wanted to take pictures. He shuddered. Her mom and my mom. It was a nightmare. He broke into his standard impression of his mother. Smile! Wesley, your hair is sticking up! Stand up straight! Take the picture! I could only imagine. Mrs. Lincoln was fierce with a camera, and there was no way she was going to watch her son take Savannah Snow to the winter formal without documenting it for future generations. Mrs. Lincoln and Mrs. Snow were too much to take when you put them together in the same room especially when the room was Link's living room, where there wasn't a place to sit or look or even lean your hand against that wasn't shrink-wrapped in plastic. Bet you five bucks Savannah doesn't set foot in Ravenwood. Link finally cracked a smile. That's what I'm hoping. From the back seat of the beater, Savannah looked like she was sitting in a big puddle of pink whipped cream. She tried to talk to me a few times, but it was impossible to hear anything over the music. When we turned at the fork in the road that led to Ravenwood, she started to squirm. Link turned off the radio. You sure you're okay with this, Savannah? You know, folks say Ravenwood's been haunted ever since the war. He said it like he was telling a ghost story. Savannah lifted her chin. I'm not afraid. People say lots of things. Doesn't mean they're true. Yeah? You should hear what they say about you and your friends. She turned back to look at me. No offense. Link blasted the radio, trying to drown her out, as Ravenwood's gates creaked open. This church picnic ain't no picnic. You're my fried chicken. Holy finger licking. Savannah yelled at him over the music. Are you calling me a piece of fried chicken?
Nah, not you, slush queen. Never. He closed his eyes and pounded out the drums on the dashboard of the beater. As I got out of the car, I felt sorrier for Link than ever. Link started to open his door, but Savannah didn't move. The idea of setting foot inside Ravenwood must not have sounded so good after all. The door opened before I knocked. I saw a swirl of fabric, green with a gold shine to it, so it looked like both colors at the same time. Lena pulled the door wide and the fabric floated off her shoulders, hanging down toward her waist, almost like bits of wing. Do you remember? I remember. You look beautiful. I did remember. Lena was the butterfly tonight, like the moon on the night of her seventeenth moon. What it looked like magic then still looked like magic now. Her eyes sparkled, one green, one gold. One who was two. A chill swept over me, out of place on the warm December night. Lena didn't notice, and I forced myself to ignore it. You look... Wow. She twirled around, smiling. You like it? I wanted to do something different. Come out of my cocoon a little. You were never in a cocoon, L. Her smile widened, and I said it again out loud. You look... like you. Perfect. She pushed a curl back to show me her earlobe a tiny gold butterfly with one gold wing and one green. Uncle Macon had them made, and this, she pointed to a tiny butterfly that rested in the hollow of her neck, attached to a delicate gold chain. I wished she was wearing her charm necklace, too. The only times I'd ever seen her without it didn't end well, and I never wanted anything about Lena to change. She smiled. I know. I'll put it on my charm necklace after tonight. I leaned in and kissed her. Then I held up the small white box I was holding. Amma had made her a corsage by hand, like she did last year. Lena opened the box. It's perfect. I can't believe there's a flower still blooming anywhere near here. But there it was, a single golden blossom, nestled between looping green leaves. If you looked at them right, they were their own version of wings, almost as if Amma had known. Maybe there were still some things she could see coming. I slid the corsage onto Lena's wrist, but it snagged. As I tugged on it, I noticed she was wearing the thin silver bracelet from Seraphine's box. But I didn't say anything. I didn't want to ruin the night before it even started. Link honked the horn and cranked up the music even louder. We'd better go. Link's crashing and burning out there. At least, he wishes he was crashing and burning. Lena took a deep breath. Wait, she put her hand on my arm. There's one more thing. What? Don't be mad. There was no guy in the world who didn't know what those words meant. She was about to give me a reason to be mad. I won't. My stomach curled into a ball. You have to promise. Even worse. I promise. My stomach tightened and the ball became a knot. I told them they could come. She said it quickly, as if I would be less likely to hear her. You told who, what? I wasn't sure I wanted to know. There were so many wrong answers to that question. Lena pushed open the doors to Macon's old study. Through the crack, I could see John and Liv standing together in front of the fireplace. They're together all the time now. Her voice dropped to a whisper. I was pretty sure something was going on. Then Reese saw them repairing Macon's broken grandfather clock, and she saw their faces. A clock, like a selenometer or a motorcycle. 
things that worked the way Liv's mind did. I shook it off. Not John Breed. Not with Liv. Fixing a clock? I looked at Lena. That's the big giveaway? I told you Reese saw them, and look at them. You don't have to be a Sybil to figure it out. Liv was wearing an old-looking dress, like something she probably found in Marion's attic. It was low across her shoulders and hung in some complicated, lacy way that only the worn leather scorpion belt interrupted. She looked like someone out of a movie you would watch in your English class after you'd read the book. Her blonde hair was loose instead of in braids. She looked different. She looked happy. I didn't want to think about it. Al, what's going on? Watch. John was standing behind her, wearing what was probably one of Macon's suits. He looked like Macon used to, dark and dangerous. He was pinning a corsage to a lacy strap on Liv's shoulder. She was teasing him, and I recognized the tone. And Lena was right. Anyone who saw them together could tell something was going on. Liv caught his hand as he fumbled. I'd appreciate it if you didn't actually draw blood. He tried again. Then hold still. I am. It's the pin that's not. His hand was shaking. I cleared my throat and they looked up. Liv turned even pinker when she saw me. John stood taller. Hello there. Liv was still blushing. Hi. I couldn't think of what else to say. This is awkward. John smiled as if we were friends. I turned to Lena without answering, because we weren't. Even if this wasn't the weirdest idea you've ever come up with, and I'm not saying it isn't, how do you think we're going to pull this off? Neither one of them goes to Jackson. Lena held up two more tickets to the slush ball. You bought two? I bought two. She gestured to John. Meet my date. Excuse me? She looked at Liv. And yours. Why are you doing this? We can bring whoever we want as our dates. It's just until we get inside. Are you crazy, El? No, it's a favor for a friend. I looked at John and Liv. Which one is suddenly your friend? She reached up to put her hands on my shoulders and kissed my cheek. You. I don't understand. We're moving forward. Let things be as they are. I looked at John and Liv. This is your idea of moving forward? Lena nodded. Hello? If you two want to actually talk out loud, we can wait in the other room. John was watching us impatiently. Sorry, we're good now. Lena gave me a meaningful look. Right? Maybe we were, but I knew someone who wouldn't be. Do you have any idea what Link is going to have to say about this? He's waiting in the car with Savannah right now. Lena nodded at John, and I heard the ripping noise again, coming from outside. The music blasting from the beater suddenly stopped. Link's already at the dance, so I guess we go, right? John grabbed Liv's hand. You ripped Link? I felt my shoulders stiffen. You weren't even touching him. John shrugged. I told you, I'm not really a rules kind of guy. I can do a lot of things. Most of the time, I don't even know how. That makes me feel a lot better. Relax, it was your girlfriend's idea. What's Savannah gonna think? I could imagine her telling this story to her mom. She won't remember a thing. Lena grabbed my hand. Come on, we can take the hearse. Lena picked up her keys. I shook my head. 
Going to the dance alone with Savannah is the last thing Link wanted. Trust me. Two more words no guy wants to hear from his girlfriend. What are you up to? Help me out here. The band had to be there early. She dragged me after her. The band? You mean the Holy Rollers? Now I was really confused. Principal Harper wouldn't let the Holy Rollers play at a dance any more than... Actually, there was no comparison. It would never happen. Lena's hair curled in the non-existent breeze, and she tossed me the keys. December 12th. A Light in the Dark. I could see lights flashing through the upper windows of the gym all the way from the parking lot. The party was already in high gear. Lena pulled me by the arm. Come on, we can't miss this. I heard the unmistakable howl of Link's vocals and froze. The Holy Rollers were in there performing, just like Lena said they would be. I felt a moment of panic. The 18th moon was almost here, and we were about to walk into a dance at Jackson. It seemed stupid, but then so did staying home and worrying about the end of the world when there was nothing we could do to stop it. Maybe the stupidest part was thinking I could keep it from happening. So I did the only logical thing, which was keep my mouth shut and tighten my arm around the prettiest girl in the parking lot. All right, El, come clean. What did you do? I wanted him to have one good night without Ridley. Lena slid her arm through mine. And I wanted it for you. She looked over her shoulder to where John's low voice and Liv's laughter floated up behind us. For everyone, I guess. The weirdest part was that I understood why she did it. We had all been stuck since the summer, as if it never really ended. Ama couldn't read cards or talk to the greats. Marion wasn't allowed to do her job. Liv wasn't training to be a keeper. Macon barely came up from the tunnels. Link was still trying to figure out how to be an incubus and get over Ridley. And John had been stuck for real in the arc light. Even the heat stuck around, like the endless summer from hell. Everything in Gatlin was stuck. What Lena did tonight wasn't going to change any of that, but maybe we could leave the summer behind us. Maybe it would end one of these days, taking the heat and the bugs and the bad memories with it. Maybe we could feel normal again. Our version of normal, at least. Even if the clock was still ticking and the 18th moon was getting closer. We can do more than feel normal, Ethan. We can be normal. Lena smiled at me and I pulled her even closer as we walked into the gym. The inside of the gym had been transformed, and the theme seemed to be... Link. The Holy Rollers were on stage, lit by spotlights the dance committee could never afford to rent, and Link was in the center of it all, his ruffled shirt unbuttoned and drenched with sweat. He was alternating between playing the drums and singing sliding along the stage with the mic stand in his hand. Every time he moved near the edge, a group of freshman girls screamed. And for the second time in my life, the Holy Rollers sounded like a real band, without a cherry lollipop in sight. What did you do? I shouted to Lena over the music. Consider it a Don't Let the Dance Suck cast. So, I guess the whole thing was Link's idea in the first place. I smiled, and she nodded at me. Exactly. On the way to the dance floor, we walked past a cardboard backdrop. There was a stool, but the photographer was nowhere in sight. The whole thing looked a little suspicious. Where's the photographer, El? His wife went into labor. 
Lena wouldn't look at me. Lena, really? You can ask anyone. Well, don't ask her. She's a little busy right now. We passed Liv and John, who were sitting at a table near the dance floor. I've only seen this on TV, Liv said, taking it all in. An American high school dance? John smiled. It's my first, too. John reached out to tug on a length of her blonde hair. Let's dance, Olivia. An hour later, I had to admit, Lena was right. We were all having a good time, and it didn't feel like summer anymore. It felt like a regular high school dance, where you wait for the slow songs to get close to your girlfriend. Savannah was holding court in her puffy cotton candy dress, and she even danced with Earl Petty, once. The only exception was the return of Link as a rock god. But tonight, even that didn't seem so impossible. Fatty was busting the rest of the Holy Rollers for smoking in front of the gym while the dance committee's pre-approved playlist blasted through the speakers. But there wasn't much Fatty could do, since they were all around twenty-five and confirmed dirtbags. That was obvious when the lead guitarist whispered something in Emily Asher's ear that actually left her speechless for the first time in her life. I went to find Link, who was hanging out in the hallway by the lockers. The hallway was dark, except for one blinking fluorescent panel on the ceiling, which made it a good place to hide from Savannah. I figured I'd tell him how great he was on stage, because there was nothing you could say to Link that would make him happier than that. But I didn't get to tell him. He was wiping the sweat off his face when I saw her turn the corner. Ridley. So much for Link being happy. I ducked into the doorway of the biolab before they saw me. Maybe Ridley was going to tell him where she'd been all this time, she would definitely lie to Lena and me when we asked her. Hey there, Hot Rod. She was sucking on a cherry lollipop, wearing lots of black and showing lots of skin. Something was off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Where the hell have you been? Link threw his sweaty shirt onto the floor. Around. Everyone's been worried about you even after the stunt you pulled. Everyone meaning him. Ridley laughed. Yeah, I bet. So, where? For a second, he didn't say anything. Why are you wearing sunglasses, Rid? I pushed myself flatter against the wall and looked around the corner. Ridley was wearing black sunglasses, the kind she used to wear all the time. Take them off, he was almost shouting. If the music wasn't so loud, someone would have heard him. Ridley leaned up against the locker next to Link. Don't be mad, Shrinky Dink. I was never cut out to be a mortal. We both knew that. Link pulled her sunglasses off, and I could see her yellow eyes from where I was standing. The eyes of a dark caster. What did you do? Link sounded defeated. She shrugged. You know, I begged forgiveness and all that. I think everyone knew I'd been punished enough. Being a mortal was torture. Link was staring at the linoleum. I knew that look. It was the same one he had whenever his mom started on one of her tirades threatening moral damnation if he didn't bring his grades up or stop reading books she was trying to ban. It was the look that said, Nothing I do is going to make any difference. Who's everyone, Rid? Seraphine? Abraham? He was shaking his head. Did you go to them after everything they did to you? After they tried to kill us? The way you let John breed out of the Arclight after what he did to me? 
She stepped in front of him, resting her hands on his chest. I had to let him out. He gave me power. Her voice was rising, the sarcastic tone gone. Don't you understand? It was the only way I could feel like myself again. Link grabbed her wrists and pushed her away. I'm glad you feel like yourself. Guess I never really knew who you were. I'm the idiot. He started walking back toward the double doors that led into the gym. I did it for us. Ridley actually looked hurt. If you can't see that, then you really are an idiot. Link turned around. For us? Why would you do this to yourself for us? Don't you get it? We can be together now. We're the same. I'm not some stupid mortal girl you'll get sick of in six months. You think I cared about that? She laughed. You would have. Trust me. I was nothing. You were something to me. He looked up at the ceiling, as if the answer to this mess was written on the worn squares. Ridley closed the distance between them. Come with me, tonight. I can't stay here, but I came back for you. As I watched her, I saw Seraphine, the one from the visions, the one who was trying to fight her nature, the darkness taking hold within her. Maybe Lena's family was wrong. Maybe there was still light in the dark. Link leaned his head against hers, their foreheads touching for a second. I can't. Not after what they did to my friends and to you. I can't be one of them, Rid. I'm not like you. And I don't want to be. She was stunned. You could see it in her eyes, even if they were yellow. Rid? Take a good look, Hot Rod. This is the last time you're ever gonna see me. She was walking backward, still looking at him. Then she turned and ran. A cherry lollipop rolled across the floor. Link's voice was so quiet I barely heard him as his hand closed around it. Bad or not, you'll always be my girl. After seeing Ridley, Link didn't care about being a rock god. He was in bad shape, and he wasn't the only one. Lena had barely said a word since I told her about Ridley. The dance was over for us. The parking lot was deserted. No one left a Jackson dance this early. The hearse was parked at the far end of the lot under the broken streetlight. Link was behind us, and Liv and John were walking in front, holding hands. I listened to our shoes against the asphalt as we walked. That's how I knew John had stopped walking. No, not now, he whispered. I followed his eyes, but it was pitch black, and I couldn't see anything. What is it? What's up, man? Link stepped up next to me, his eyes focused on the hearse. I knew he could see in the dark, like John. Please tell me that isn't who I think it is. John didn't move. It's hunting and his blood pack. Liv tried to find them in the darkness, but it was impossible until hunting stepped into the pale glow of another street light. She pushed John. Go, get back in the tunnels. Liv wanted him to rip, dematerialize before hunting had the chance to do the same. He shook his head. I can't leave you. I won't. You can rip us out of here. Liv reached for his hand. I can't take all of you at once. Then go! It didn't matter what Liv said. There was no time. Hunting leaned against the streetlight, a cigarette burning between his fingers. Two more incubuses stepped into view. So, this is where you've been hiding out. High school. I never would have guessed.
You never were that smart. John pushed Liv behind him. How did you find me? Hunting laughed. We can always find you, kid. You've got your own personal lojack, which makes me wonder how you managed to hide out this long. Wherever you were, you should have stayed there. Hunting started walking toward us, his lackeys right behind him. Lena squeezed my hand. Oh my god, he was safe in the tunnels. This is all my fault. It's Abraham's fault. John stood his ground. I'm not going anywhere with you, Hunting. Hunting flicked his cigarette into the darkness. It's almost a shame I have to take you back. You've got a lot more fight in you when Abraham isn't messing with your head. Does it feel any different to think for yourself? I flashed on John wandering like a zombie through the cave at the Great Barrier. He swore he didn't remember what happened that night. Was it possible Abraham was controlling him then? John froze. What are you talking about? Guess you haven't been doing much thinking after all. Oh well, you won't miss it then. Hunting lowered his voice. You know what I won't miss? Watching you twitch all the time, like someone's poking you with a cattle prod. John's hands started to shake. Shut up. I remembered the way John's body used to jerk all the time, the way his muscles had seemed to seize involuntarily, the way it had gotten worse when he was with Abraham the night of Lena's seventeenth moon. I hadn't seen it happen once since we found him in Ridley's room. Hunting laughed. Come over here and make me. Or we can skip the part where I beat some sense into you before I take you back. Link stepped up next to John. So, tell me how it works. Is this like a regular fight, or do I need to use some kind of Jedi mind tricks I don't know about? I was stunned. Link was clearly trying to even the odds. John looked as surprised as the rest of us. I got this one but thanks. What are you? Link never had a chance to finish. John threw his hands out in front of him, the way Lena did when she was using her powers to tear up the ground or bring on torrential rain or hurricane force winds. John was using Lena's powers, the ones he absorbed the last time he touched her. The wind picked up so fast that it knocked hunting off his feet. The other two incubuses were thrown backward, skidding across the parking lot at a speed that would result in serious asphalt burn. But hunting ripped before the full force of the wind caught him. He started to materialize a few feet away, but the wind pulled him back again. He's still coming! Liv screamed. She was right. Lena pushed past me. I have to help John. He can't do it alone. She threw her own hands forward, her palms facing hunting. Lena's powers were stronger than ever, and as unpredictable. Rain poured from the sky as the clouds broke open. No, not now. The rain hammered down on us, and the wind, which was dying down fast. Hunting was dry, the rain running off his jacket in rivulets. Nice trick, kid. It's a shame Seraphine's daughter destroyed the Order. If her powers weren't so screwed up, you might have been able to save your ass. I heard a dog barking and caught a glimpse of Boo Radley running around the side of one of the cars. Macon was behind him, rain running down his face. As luck would have it, mine seemed to be developing in quite an interesting manner. Hunting was as shocked to see Macon as the rest of us, but he did a good job hiding it. He lit another cigarette, despite the rain. You mean, after I killed you? It'll be a pleasure to do it again. The members of Hunting's pack had picked themselves up and crossed the parking lot the old-fashioned way. Now they were standing behind Hunting. 
Macon closed his eyes. Everything went quiet and still. Too still, the way it feels right before something horrible is going to happen. I wasn't the only one who sensed it. Hunting vanished, ripping through the shiny black sky. As he materialized inches from Macon, a pulsating green light enveloped us. The light hummed with power. It was coming from Macon. Hunting froze in the eerie green glow, his hand outstretched, canines bared. What is that? Link was shielding his eyes. It's light, Liv said, transfixed. How can he create light? I asked. Liv shook her head. I have no idea. The light grew brighter, and hunting dropped to the ground, thrashing on the glowing concrete. An agonizing sound tore through him, like his vocal cords were shredding. The other two incubuses were writhing on the ground, too, but I couldn't take my eyes off hunting. The color started to leach out of him, beginning at the top of his head and moving down over his face. It was like watching a sheet being pulled off someone, slowly. But this sheet was a black mist, and as it moved down, his neck and his hair, his skin, his empty black eyes became almost translucent. It was happening to other members of his blood pack, too. What's happening to them? I don't know if I was expecting an answer, but it was John who had one. They're losing their power, their darkness. I could tell from the panicked look on John's face that he'd never seen this firsthand. That's what happens to incubuses when they're exposed to daylight. I looked at John. It wasn't affecting him. He's really creating light, Liv whispered. John said something else, but I wasn't listening anymore. I was staring at the other two incubuses, who were translucent now. The darkness had seeped out of them much faster. I watched as their bodies stiffened like statues, their eyes fixed and lifeless. But that wasn't the most disturbing part. The black mist, the dark power that had drained out of their bodies, was seeping into the ground. Where is it going? Lena asked. The underground. John took a step back, as if he didn't want to get too close to what he could have been. Energy can't be destroyed. It just changes form. I froze. The words replayed themselves in my mind. It just changes form. I thought about Twyla and the Greats and Aunt Prue, my mom and Macon. I remembered the green glow of the arc light. The same light that was washing over us now. Had something happened to Macon within its walls? Had my mother changed him somehow? Remade the man she had loved and lost? What will it become? Liv sounded frightened. John was actually telling her something she didn't know. The color had drained from Hunting's body all the way down to his hands. Macon hadn't moved, his eyes squeezed tightly shut like he was in the middle of a terrible nightmare. John didn't answer for a second. When finally he did, I wished he hadn't. Vexes Macon would never want to do that. Liv was as shocked as I was. John took her hand. I know, but he doesn't get to decide the way the universe operates, Liv. None of us do. Oh, my God. Lena was pointing at the two incubuses, now completely void of color. The air around them seemed to shift, but then I realized what was really happening. They were disintegrating. But they didn't turn to ash, the way zombies and vampires in the movies do. The tiny pieces of them vanished, as if they had never been at all. I heard Macon inhale sharply. 
This was draining him, too. I watched him fight to hold on long enough to finish off hunting, but the light began to dim until the black night swallowed up the parking lot again. Hunting's body dropped to the ground. He was moaning, dragging himself across the asphalt. His face and torso were still rigid and completely translucent. Macon dropped to his knees, and Lena knelt down next to him. How did you do that? Macon didn't reply right away. When his breath sounded regular again, he answered, I'm not entirely sure myself, but it seems I can channel my light energy, create light, for lack of a better explanation. John wandered over, shaking his head, and I thought I was different. You give new meaning to light caster, Mr. Ravenwood. Macon looked at John, the hybrid who could stand in the sunlight. In light there is darkness, and in darkness there is light. I heard the rip as hunting disappeared, his body marked by the light. December 13th. Tears and Rain. After what happened in the parking lot, Macon and Liv took John back down into the tunnels, where he would be safe under the veil of concealment casts and bindings. We hoped. There was no doubt hunting would tell Abraham everything, but Liv wasn't sure if he was strong enough. I didn't ask if she meant strong enough to make it back to Abraham or to survive at all. Later that night, Lena and I sat together on the steps of her uneven porch, my body pressed into hers. I tried to memorize the way it fit perfectly with mine. I buried my face in her hair. It still smelled like lemons and rosemary. One thing hadn't changed. I tilted her chin up and pressed my mouth against hers. I wasn't kissing her as much as I was feeling her lips against mine. I could have lost her tonight. She leaned her head against my chest. But you didn't. I know. I let my mind drift, but all I could think about was what it had felt like without her last summer, when I thought I'd lost her. The dull ache that never went away, the emptiness. It was the same way Link must have felt when Ridley walked away. I'd never forgotten the look on his face. He was so broken, and Ridley, with those haunting yellow eyes. I felt Lena's mind churning even harder than mine. Stop it, L. Stop what? Thinking about Ridley. I can't. She reminds me of Sarah, of my mom. And look how she turned out. Ridley's not Seraphine. Not yet. I slid the corsage off her thin wrist. There it was, her mother's bracelet. My hand brushed against the metal, and the second it did, I knew everything that belonged to Seraphine was tainted. The porch started to spin. It was getting harder and harder to keep track of the days. Seraphine felt as though she was in a constant fog, confused and detached from her everyday life. Emotions seemed beyond her grasp, floating on the periphery of her mind as if they belonged to someone else. The only place she felt grounded was in the tunnels. There was a connection to the caster world and the elements that had created the power running through her veins. It gave her comfort allowed her to breathe. Sometimes she spent hours down there, sitting in the small study Abraham had created for her. It was usually peaceful until hunting arrived. Her half-brother believed Abraham was wasting his time with her, and he didn't attempt to hide it. Here again, Seraphine could hear the contempt in hunting's voice. I'm just reading... She tried to avoid confrontations with hunting. He was vicious and cruel, yet there was always a thread of truth in his words. 
truth she tried desperately to ignore. Hunting leaned against the door, a cigarette hanging between his lips. I'll never understand why Grandfather Abraham wastes his time with you. Do you have any idea how many casters would kill to have him as a teacher? Hunting shook his head. She was tired of being bullied. Why am I a waste? You're a dark caster pretending to be light, a cataclyst. If that isn't a waste, I don't know what is. The word stung, but Seraphine tried to hide it. I'm not pretending. Hunting laughed, bearing his canines. Really? Have you told your light caster husband about your secret meetings down here? I wonder how long it would take him to turn on you. That's none of your business. Hunting dropped his cigarette into an empty soda can on the desk. I'll take that as a no. Seraphine felt her chest tighten, and for a second everything went black. The desk caught fire as Hunting pulled his hand away. There was no warning. One minute she was angry at Hunting, the next the desk was going up in smoke. Hunting coughed. Now that's more like it. Seraphine scrambled to put out the fire with an old blanket. Predictably, Hunting didn't help. He disappeared into Abraham's private study down the hall. Seraphine stared at her hands, covered in black ash. Her face was probably filthy, too. She couldn't go home to John like this. She wandered down the hall toward the small bathroom, but as soon as she came within a few feet of Abraham's door, she heard voices. I don't know why you're so obsessed with that kid. Hunting's voice was bitter. Who cares if he can go out in the daylight? He's barely old enough to walk, and Silas will probably kill him before he can be useful. He was talking about the boy Abraham told her about when they first met, the one who was a little older than Lena. Silas will control his temper and do what I tell him, Abraham snapped. Have some vision, boy. That child will be the next generation, an incubus with all of our strengths and none of our weaknesses. How can you be sure? You think I picked his parents by accident? Abraham didn't like being questioned. I knew exactly what I was doing. For a moment there was silence. Then Abraham spoke again. It won't be long before the casters are out of the way. I'll see it in my lifetime. I promise you that. Seraphine shivered. A part of her wanted to run for the door and never look back. But she couldn't. She had to stay for Lena. She had to stop the voices. When Seraphine got home, John was in the living room. Shh, the baby's asleep. He kissed her on the cheek as she sat down next to him on the couch. Where have you been? For a second, she considered lying telling him she was at the library or walking in the park, but Hunting's words mocked her. I wonder how long it would take him to turn on you. He was wrong about John. I was in the tunnels. What? John sounded as if he thought he had misunderstood her. I met one of my relatives, and he told me things about the curse, things I didn't know. The second natural born into the Duquesne family can claim herself. Lena can choose. It all came tumbling out, so many things she had longed to share with him. John was shaking his head. Wait a minute. What relative? There was no stopping now. Abraham Ravenwood. John stood up, towering above her. Abraham Ravenwood? The blood incubus? He's dead. Seraphine jumped up. No, he's alive, and he can help us save Lena. John was studying her face as if he didn't recognize it. 
help us. Have you lost your mind? He's a blood-drinking demon. How do you even know if anything he told you is true? Why would he lie? He has nothing to gain from telling me that Lena has a choice. John grabbed her by the shoulders. Why would he lie? How about because he's a blood incubus? He's worse than a dark caster. Seraphine cringed beneath his fingers. It didn't matter if John called her Isabel. Her eyes were still golden yellow and her skin ice cold. She was one of them. He can help Lena. He's helping me, too. That's what she wished she could tell him. John was so angry, he didn't notice how her face had crumbled. You don't know that. He could be lying. We don't even know if Lena's a natural. Seraphine felt something rising inside her, like the crest of a wave. She didn't recognize it for what it was. Rage. But the voices did. He doesn't trust you. He thinks you're one of them. She tried to push the thoughts away and focus on John. When she cries, it rains. That isn't proof enough for you? John let go of her shoulders and ran his hands through his hair. Isabel, this guy is a monster. I don't know what he wants with you, but he's playing on your fears. You can't speak to him again. Panic welled up inside her. She knew Abraham was telling the truth about Lena. John hadn't seen the prophecy, but there was something else. If she couldn't see Abraham, she couldn't control the voices. John was staring at her. Isabel, promise me. She had to make him understand. But John, he cut her off. I don't know if you are losing your judgment or losing control, but if you go anywhere near Abraham Ravenwood, I'll leave, and I'll take Lena with me. What did you say? He couldn't mean it. If what he says is true, and Lena has a choice, she will choose light. I will never allow any darkness into her life. I know you've been struggling. You disappear all day, and when you're here, you look distracted and confused. Was it true? Could he see it on her face? John was still talking. But it's my job to protect Lena, even if it's from you. He loved Lena more than he loved her. He was ready to walk away and take her daughter. And one day, Lena would claim herself. John would be sure she turned her back on Seraphine. Something clicked within her, two chambers locking into place. The rage wasn't cresting anymore. It was crashing down on her, drowning her beneath it, and she could hear the voice. Burn! The drapes ignited, sending fire racing up the walls behind John. Smoke started to fill the room black and dark, a living, breathing shadow. The sound was so loud as the flames ate away at the wall and spread to the floor. The fire created a perfect circle around John, following an invisible path only she could see. Isabel! Stop! John screamed, his voice twisted by the roaring of the fire. What had she done? How could you do this to me? I stood by you even after you turned. After you turned. He believed she was dark. He always had. She looked at him through the cloud of smoke quickly filling the room. Seraphine watched the flames with remove. She wasn't standing in her house, about to watch her husband burn to death. He didn't look like the man she loved or even a man she could love. He's a traitor. The voice was perfectly clear now, and there was only one. Seraphine recognized it right away, because it was her own.
Before she walked away from the house and the smoke, her life and memories that were already fading, she remembered something John used to say to her. She looked into his green eyes with her gold ones. I'll love you until the day after forever. Lena fell to her knees on the step beneath me, sobbing. I wrapped my arms around her, but I didn't say a word. She had just watched her mother kill her father and leave her for dead. There was nothing left to say. December 13th. The Verdict. A few hours later, Lena was shaking me. Wake up. You have to wake up, Ethan. I sat up with a start. I'm awake. Only I looked around, confused, because it wasn't Lena shaking me. It was Liv, even though I could still hear the echo of Lena's voice lingering in my head. Ethan, it's me. Please, you've got to wake up. I looked at her through half-open eyes. Am I dreaming? Liv frowned. I'm afraid not. This is real. I rubbed my hand through my hair, confused. It was still pitch dark outside, and I couldn't even remember dreaming. I only remembered Lena's voice and the urgent feeling something was wrong. What's going on? It's Marion. She's gone. Come on. Things were starting to fall into place. I was in my room. Liv was in my room. I wasn't dreaming, which meant... Wait, how did you get in here? Liv looked embarrassed. I hitched a ride. She pointed to the scorpion belt around her waist and glanced behind her. An incubus was sitting in the corner of my bedroom. Great. John picked up my jeans from the floor and tossed them at me. Hurry up, Boy Scout. For a guy who didn't have to sleep, he was as grouchy in the middle of the night as I was. Liv blushed, turning around, and a few seconds later, I heard the familiar ripping sound. Only for the first time, it was for me. Where are we? Nobody answered, then I heard John's voice in the darkness. No clue. Don't you have to know where you're going to rip? Isn't that the way it works? I asked. Is that some kind of mortal word for traveling? Real clever. He sounded annoyed, which I was used to by now. Sort of. Usually. The shadows were shifting, and I rubbed my eyes trying to see in the dark. I stretched out my hands, but I couldn't feel anything. Usually, I was following the signal. What signal? My eyes adjusted from the darkness of traveling to the darkness of wherever we had traveled to. As the blurry shadows lightened from black to gray, I realized we were crammed into a tiny space. Liv looked at John. An ad auxilium concitatio. It's an ancient homing cast, like a caster SOS, but only a cipher can detect one. John shrugged. I hung out with one at exile with Rid, and... He didn't finish, but we all knew who he was talking about. I picked up some cipher skills. I shook my head. Ciphers? There was so much about Lena's world I would never understand, no matter how hard I tried. You're a handy guy, I said, annoyed. Who sent it? Liv asked. I did. Lena was standing behind us in the darkness. I could barely see her face, but her green and gold eyes were shining. She looked over at John. I was hoping you would pick it up. Glad I'm good for something. The Far Keep is trying Marion for treason. It's going on right now. Lena sounded grim. Uncle Macon went after Marion, but he wouldn't let me come. He said it was too dangerous. Marion was on trial. It was really happening, the way I was afraid it would, ever since the day Liv and I found the Temporis Porta. Everything I'd been feeling, the doubt, the panic, the wrongness, 
caught up with me in a crashing wave that nearly knocked my feet out from under me, like I was drowning or falling. Don't worry, Liv tried to sound reassuring. I'm sure she's fine. This whole thing is my fault, not hers. The Council will have to admit that sooner or later. John held up his hand. Ignis! A warm yellow flame flickered from the center of his palm. New party trick? I asked. He shrugged. Fire was never really my thing. Guess I picked it up from hanging out with Lena. Normally, I would have punched him. At least, I would have wanted to. Lena grabbed my hand. These days, I can't even light a candle without torching the place. Light flooded the room, and I didn't have time to hit him, because now I knew exactly where we were. Again. I was on the other side of the pantry door, ten feet under my kitchen, in my own house. I grabbed the old lantern and took off down the crumbling tunnel toward the door in the ceiling no one ever opened, to the place where the ancient doors would be waiting for me. Wait up! You don't know where this tunnel ends, John called after me. It's all right, I heard Liv say. He knows where he's going. I heard their footsteps behind me, but I only ran faster. I started banging on the temporis porta as soon as I reached it. This time it didn't open. Splinters dug into my skin, but I didn't stop pounding on the thick wood. Nothing I did mattered. Nothing I did mattered. I rested my face against the wood. Aunt Marion, I'm here. I'm coming. Lena came up behind me. Ethan, she can't hear you. I know. John shoved me aside and touched the surface of the doors with his hand. Then he yanked it away as if the wood burned. That's some serious mojo. Liv grabbed his hand, but there wasn't a mark on it. I don't think there's anything we can do to open those doors, unless they want to be opened. She was talking about the last time they opened, for me, but they weren't opening this time. Liv examined the side of the doors, where the carvings were clearest. There has to be a way. I threw myself back against the thick, carved planks. Nothing. We have to think of something. Who knows what they might do to Marion? Liv looked away. I can imagine, but we can't help her if we can't get inside. Give me a minute. She pulled her red notebook out of her worn leather backpack. I've been trying to figure out these symbols since the first time we saw them. Lena shot me a look. The first time? Liv didn't look up. Didn't Ethan tell you? He found these doors weeks ago. They let him pass, but they left me behind. And he wouldn't tell me much about what he saw on the other side. But I've been studying the doors ever since. Weeks ago? I haven't the exact date, Liv answered. Ethan? I can explain. I was going to tell you the night at the Cineplex but you were already mad because I had invited Liv to the party. Secret doors with your secret friend? And something secret you found behind them? Why would that make me mad? I should have told you. It's not like you're worried about Liv. I wasn't getting off that easy. I tried not to look at Lena, focusing on a page of sketches in Liv's red notebook. That's it. I recognized the symbols in her notebook. Liv held the paper up against the symbols carved into the doors, moving it from one wooden panel to the next as she compared them. See the recurring pattern in these three circles? The wheel, I said automatically. You said they were the wheel of fate. Yes, but perhaps not only the wheel of fate. I think each circle might represent one of the three keepers, the Council of the Far Keep. The ones who showed up in the archive? Lena asked. She nodded. 
I've read everything I could find about them, which isn't much. From what I can determine, the three keepers must have been the ones who visited us. I thought about it. It makes sense. The first time I went through those doors, I ended up at the far keep. So you think these signs stand for the three of them? John looked over at me. Those freaks that wanted to take Liv? I nodded. And Marion. He seemed more concerned about Liv than Marion, which didn't surprise me, but it still made me angry. Like just about everything that came out of his mouth. Liv ignored us both, pointing to the first circle, the one with the fewest spokes. I think this one represents what's happening now, the present. And this, she pointed to the second circle, the one crossed with more spokes, symbolizes what has been, the past. Then what's that one? John pointed to the last circle, the one with no spokes. What will never be? or what will always be. Liv traced the drawing with her finger. In other words, the future. If each of these symbols represents one of the keepers, then which is which? I asked. Lena studied the circle with the most spokes. I think that huge guy is the past. He was carrying that empty hourglass when we saw him in the archive. Liv nodded. I agree. I reached out and touched the circles. They were hard and cool, different from the texture of the rest of the wooden door. I moved my hand to the empty circle with no spokes. The woman from the council, the one who looked albino, she's what hasn't happened yet, right? The future? Because she's nothing. I mean, she was practically invisible. Liv reached up to the circle with the fewest spokes which would make the tall one the present. The light in the room flickered, and John looked frustrated. This sounds like a whole lot of crap. What will be, what won't be. What are you talking about? What will be and what will not be are equally possible and impossible, Liv explained. I guess you could say they are the absence of history, the place the Castor Chronicles cannot touch. You can't tell a story or keep a record of what hasn't happened yet. That's Keeper 101. Liv sounded dreamy, and I wondered what she knew about the Castor Chronicles. The Castor what? John shifted the light from one hand to the other. It's a book, Lena said, without taking her eyes off the doors. The Keepers had it with them when they came to see Marion. Whatever. John looked bored. If you're talking about the future, how about we call it that? Liv nodded. But you have to remember, we're not just talking about the mortal future. We're talking about everything unknown for casters and mortals, including the unknown realm, the place where the demon world touches our own. Demon world? I felt the prickling of recognition. I had to tell Liv... I know the place where the demon world touches ours. I mean, I don't know it, but I know her. The Lilum, the demon queen. Liv went pale, but it was John who was the most freaked out. What are you talking about? The Lilum thing. There's no Lilum here. Liv was shaking her head. The very presence of the Lilum in our world would mean the total destruction of existence itself. What does that have to do with her? I asked. Her? Is that who you were talking about? The she who told you about the 18th moon was the Lilum? The demon queen? Liv knew from the look on my face that she was right. Great, John muttered. Liv froze. Where is the place, Ethan? She closed her eyes, which made me think she knew what I was going to say. I don't know for sure, but I can find it. I'm the wayward. The Lilum said it herself. I touched the circles again with my hands over and over, feeling the rough wood beneath my fingers. The past. The present. 
The future that will be and the future that will not. The way. The wood began to hum beneath my hands. I touched the carved circles again. The color drained from Liv's face. The Lilum said that to you? I opened my eyes, and everything was clear. When you look at the door, you see a door, right? Liv nodded. I looked at her. I see a path. It was true, because the temporis porta was opening for me. The wood turned to mist, and I slid my hand right through it. Beyond it, I could see a path leading into the distance. Come on! Where are you going? Liv grabbed my arm. To find Marion and Macon. This time, I made sure to grab Liv and Lena before I stepped inside the door. Liv grabbed John's hand. Hold on! I took a breath and ducked into the mist. December 13th. Perfidia. We found ourselves nearly crushed in the center of a mob. I recognized the robes. Only I was tall enough to see over them, but it didn't matter. I knew where we were. It seemed like the middle of a trial, or something like one. Liv's pencil was moving inside the red notebook as quickly as it could, trying to keep up with the words that were flying all around us. Perfidia, it's Latin for treason. They're saying she's going to be tried for treason. Liv was pale, and I could barely hear her voice over the clamor of the crowd surrounding us. I know this place. I recognized the tall windows with the heavy gold drapes and the wood benches. Everything was the same. The thick noise of the crowd, the stone walls, the beamed ceiling that was so high that it seemed to go on forever. I held on to Lena's hand, pushing my way to the front of the hall, directly under the empty wooden balcony. Liv and John threaded their way through the robed crowd behind me. Where's Marion? Lena was panicking. And Uncle Macon? I can't see anything over all these people. I don't like this, Liv said quietly. Something doesn't feel right. I felt it too. We were standing in the center of the same crowded hall where I stood the first time I crossed through the Temporis Porta. But last time, it seemed like I was somewhere in medieval Europe, in a place from an illustration in the world history textbook we never seemed to crack at Jackson. The room was so big I'd thought it might be a ship or a cathedral, a place that transported you somewhere whether it was across the sea or to the paradise the sisters were always talking about. Now it seemed different. I didn't know where this place was, but even in their dark robes, the people, the casters, mortals, keepers, or whatever they were, seemed like regular old people, the kind of people I knew something about because even though they were crowded on the glossy wooden bench that surrounded the perimeter of the room, they could have been sitting in the gym at Jackson, waiting for the disciplinary committee meeting to start. On the benches or the bleachers, these people were looking for the same thing. Drama. Even worse, they were looking for blood. Someone to blame. And to punish. It felt like the trial of the century, or a bunch of reporters waiting outside South Carolina's Broad River Correctional Institution when someone from death row was about to get a lethal injection. The executions were covered by every TV station and newspaper. A few people showed up to protest, but they looked like they had been bussed in for the day. Everyone else was hanging out, waiting to watch the spectacle. It wasn't much different from the burning of the witches in the crucible. The crowd rushed forward, murmuring, just as I knew they would, and I heard the banging of a gavel. Silentium. Something's happening. Lena grabbed my arm. Liv pointed across the room. I saw Macon. He's over there. John looked around. 
I don't see Marion. Maybe she's not here, Ethan. She's here. She had to be, because I knew what was about to happen. I forced myself to look up to the balcony. Look! I pointed up at Marion, once again hooded and robed, once again tied at the wrists with a golden rope. She was standing on the balcony, high above the room, just as she had been the last time. The tall keeper who had come to the archive was next to her. The people around us were still whispering. I looked at Liv, who interpreted. He's the council keeper. He's going to... Liv's eyes welled up. It's not a trial, Ethan. It's a sentencing. I heard the Latin, but this time I didn't try to understand. I knew what it meant before the council keeper repeated the words in English. Marion would be found guilty of treason. I listened without listening, my eyes locked on Marion's face. The council of the far keep, which answers only to the order of things, to no man, creature, or power, dark or light, finds Marion of the western keep guilty of treason. I remembered the first time I heard those words. These are the consequences of her inaction. The consequences shall be paid. The keeper, though mortal, will return to the dark fire from which all power comes. I might as well have been the one sentenced to death. Pain gutted my whole body. I watched as Marion's hood was pulled from her shaved head. I stared into her eyes, surrounded by dark rings, as if she had been hurt. I couldn't tell if it was physical pain or mental or even mortal. I imagined it was something worse. I was the only one prepared for it. Liv broke down sobbing. Lena stumbled against me, and I held her up by the arm. Only John stood there, unfazed, his hands jammed into his pockets. The council keeper's voice echoed through the room again. The order is broken. Until the new order comes forth, the old law must be upheld, and the consequences paid. All this courtroom drama. If I didn't know you better, Angelus, I would think you were vying for a spot on cable television. Macon's voice carried over the crowd, but I couldn't see him. Your mortal levity defiles this sacred space, Macon Ravenwood. My mortal levity, Angelus, is something you cannot understand. And I warned you, Angelus, that I would not stand for this. The council keeper shouted over the crowd, You have no power here. You have no business finding a mortal guilty of treason against the order. The keeper is of both worlds. The keeper knew the price. The keeper chose to allow the destruction of the order, he answered. The keeper is a mortal. Her name is Marion Ashcroft. She has already been sentenced to death like every mortal. In forty or fifty years, she will face that sentence. It is the mortal way. This is not your matter to speak of. The council keeper's voice was rising, and the spectators were getting restless. Angelus, she is weak. She has no powers, no way to protect herself. You cannot punish a wet child for the rain. I do not understand. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. Macon was quoting Harper Lee. I never knew any of Marion's quotes, 
that I remembered that one from reading To Kill a Mockingbird in English class last year, and from my mom. John's head was bent toward Liv's, and they were whispering about something. When he noticed me watching them, he stopped. This is crap, he said. For once, I agreed with him. But we can't stop it. Why not? There was no way he would understand. I know how it ends. They found her guilty of treason. She's going to be sent back to the dark fire, or whatever happens after that. There's nothing we can do, I said miserably. I was here before. Yeah, I wasn't. John stepped forward, clapping dramatically. The whole room went dead silent. He squeezed Lena's shoulder as he passed. Well, doesn't this suck? John shoved his way to the front of the hall where Macon was standing. I could finally see him. John held up his hand like he was waiting for Macon to give him a high five. Nice try, old man. Macon was surprised but held up his hand. His cuff was pulled down a little too far, as though his shirt was too long. What's going on, Al? I have no idea. Lena's hair started to curl. I smelled a faint trace of smoke in the air. Al, what are you doing? I think you mean what is he doing? John wove slowly toward the council keeper, who was holding Marion on the balcony. I'm starting to think you're not really listening to this fine former incubus brother of mine. He jumped up onto the pew, shoving a robed man out of his way. You're out of line, spawn of Abraham, and do not think the Castor Chronicles have been kind to you, breedling. Oh, I don't think they've been kind. Since when are people kind to me? I'm a jerk. On the other hand, you're kind of a jerk, too. John jumped up above the pew, barely catching the bottom of the wooden balcony. His black boots swung back and forth in the air. The massive gold drapes behind us exploded into flames. John kicked a bald, tattooed man in the head. I recognized the tattoo. It was the mark of a dark caster. Now John had climbed up onto the wooden balcony above us all. He put one arm around Marion, the other around the council keeper. Angelus, that's your name, right? Man, who came up with that one? Here's the thing. My friend Lena over there, she's a natural. There was a murmuring around us, and I saw the crowd part around Lena as they backed a few feet away. Why don't you show them? Lena smiled at him, and the drapes closest to the altar caught fire. The whole room was beginning to fill with smoke. And Macon Ravenwood? He's... Messed up. Okay, I don't really know what he is. It's a long story. There's this ball and this fire and some bad, bad casters. But you've probably read all about that, haven't you? John snapped in your little caster spy book. Between Marion and Angelus, I didn't know who looked more surprised. Anyway, back to Macon. Powerful guy. He likes to do this trick. Come on, don't be shy. Macon closed his eyes, and a green glow flared above him. The crowd tried to rush back toward the walls, but there was too much smoke. Which leaves me... I'm not a natural, John nodded in Macon's direction. I'm not whatever he is, either, John grinned. But the thing about me is, I've touched both of them. So now I can do whatever they can do. It's kind of my thing. Bet you don't have a caster like that in your little book, do you? As the keeper tried to pull away, John yanked him even closer. So, Angelus, let's go for a spin and see what a strange guy like you can do.
The keeper was furious and backed away, holding up his hand, fingers pointed at John. John imitated him exactly. There was a flash of light like lightning. We were all standing back on the other side of the temporis porta. Even Marion. December 13th, the day after forever. Was that real? Lena whispered. I pointed to the doors where smoke was snaking out from under the bottom of the wood. I grabbed Marion and hugged her, at the same time Liv did. I backed away awkwardly, and Lena took my place. Thank you, Marion whispered. Macon clapped his hand on John's arm. I can't decide if that was a brilliant act of pure selflessness back there, or if it was simply an attempt to collect all our powers for yourself. John shrugged. I noticed you didn't give me any skin. I remembered the cuff of Macon's shirt pulled down over his hand. You aren't quite ready to share my power. Either way, I owe you greatly. You showed real courage back there. I won't soon forget it. Oh, come on. Those guys were jerks. It was nothing. He walked away from Macon, but I could see the pride on his face. I could see it on Liv's face even more clearly. Marion took Macon's arm and he started helping her back through the tunnel. At the rate they were going, even the short span of the dirt tunnel was going to be a long hike. This is ridiculous, said John, and in a rip, we were all gone. In seconds, we were in Macon's study. What are Angelus's powers, exactly? I was still trying to figure out what we had witnessed. I don't know, but he certainly didn't seem to want us to find out. Macon was deep in thought. Yeah, he got us out of there pretty fast. I didn't get to touch him, John said. I feel horrible. Do you think I torched that beautiful old room? Lena was lost in a different thought entirely. John laughed. No, I did. It's an evil room, Macon said. We can only hope you did. Why would that guy, Angelus, involve himself so closely with this case? What could this be, like one page in the Castor Chronicles? John asked. Macon helped Marion into a chair. He loathes mortals. She was still shaking. Macon pulled a blanket from the foot of his bed and wrapped it around her. I remembered Marion doing the same for the sisters the night of the Vex attack. The world's... They weren't two separate universes anymore, caster and mortal. It was all crashing together now. Things couldn't stay like this, not for long. Liv pulled her chair next to Marion's and put her arms around her. Lena twitched a finger in the direction of Macon's fireplace grating. Flames lurched up from the logs, shooting ten feet up to the ceiling, at least it wasn't rain. Maybe it's not just him. Maybe it's Abraham, John sighed. He doesn't give up easily. Macon's brow furrowed. That's interesting. Angelus and Abraham. A common goal, perhaps? Liv spoke up. Are you suggesting that the Keepers are in collusion with Abraham? because that is so wrong on so many levels. It can't possibly be true. John warmed his hands in front of the fire. Did anyone notice how many dark casters were in that room? I noticed the one you kicked in the head, I smiled. That was an accident, John shrugged. Macon shook his head. Either way, the sentencing occurred. We have a week to figure something out before... We all looked at Marion. She was in shock, it was pretty clear. Her eyes were closed, and she pulled the blanket closer around her shoulders, rocking herself. I think she was reliving the whole night. Macon shook his head. 
hypocrites. Why? I asked. I have my own suspicions about what the Far Keep is up to, and I can't say it has anything to do with keeping the peace. Power changes people. I'm afraid they are no longer the principled leaders they once were. Macon had trouble hiding the disappointment in his face. And the exhaustion. He was making a good show of it, but he looked like he hadn't slept in days. And now that he did sleep, I was always surprised to find he needed it as much as the rest of us. But Marion is back home with us, safe and sound. He placed a hand on her shoulder. She didn't look up. For now... I wanted to go back, bash down the temporis porta, and beat the crap out of everyone in that room. I couldn't stand to see Marion like this. Macon sank into the chair next to her. For now, which is all I can say for any of us these days, we have a week until the sentence, since she was found guilty of treason. It should take that long for a perfidia proclamation to take effect. I won't let anything else happen to her, Ethan. That is more than a promise. Liv slumped at the study table, an inconsolable mess. If someone is going to make sure nothing else happens to Marion, it's me. If I hadn't gone with you, if I had stayed in the library like I was supposed to, now who's the emo caster girl? Lena poked Liv in the arm. That's my thing. You're supposed to be the chipper blonde brainiac, remember? How rude of me. I do apologize. Liv smiled and Lena smiled back, drawing her arm around Liv as if they were friends. I guess, in a way, they were. These days we were bound by the common threat of our fate because the eighteenth moon was almost here, and none of us had any answers. John sat down next to Liv protectively. It's not your fault. He shot me a dirty look. It's his. So much for friendship. I stood up. We've got to get Aunt Marion home. For the first time, she looked up at me. I can't. I understood. She wouldn't be sleeping alone, not any time soon. That was the first night Liv and Marion were under one roof again. Only this time it was in Liv's room, and their roof was the ceiling of the tunnels. I wondered if concealment casts worked against keepers, too. Mostly, I just hoped they worked. There was one place we could go no matter how badly our worlds were spiraling out of control. The place where it had all started for Lena and me. The place that was ours. The morning after Marion's trial, we went to find it again. The crumbling garden at Greenbrier was still black and charred, but you could see where the grass had started to grow. The tiny stems weren't green, though, they were brown, like everything else in Gatlin County. The invisible walls that protected Ravenwood from being ravaged didn't extend here. Still, it was our place. I led Lena through the garden to the hearthstone, where we first discovered Genevieve's locket. It seemed like it had all happened years ago, instead of the year before. Lena sat on the stone, pulling me down after her. Do you remember how beautiful it was here? I looked at her, the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. It still is. Do you think about what it would be like if this was all gone? If we can't fix this and there's no new order? I barely thought about anything else beyond heat and bugs and dried up lakes. What would be next, a flood? I don't know if it would matter. Maybe we'd be gone too, and we wouldn't even know the difference. I think we've both seen enough of the other world to know that's not true. She knew I was trying to make her feel better. How many times have you seen your mom? 
She knows what's happening, maybe better than anyone. There was nothing I could say. Lena was right, but I couldn't let her shoulder the burden of all this alone. You didn't do this intentionally, Elle. I don't know if that makes me feel any better about destroying the world. I pulled her against my chest, feeling the gentle rhythm of her heartbeat. The world isn't destroyed. Not yet. She picked at the dry grass. But someone's life will be. The one who is too has to be sacrificed to create the new order. Neither one of us could forget it, though we hadn't gotten any closer to figuring it out. And if the 18th moon really was on John's birthday, then we had only five days left to find the one. Marion's life, all our lives, hung in the balance. Him. Her. It could be anyone. Whoever it was, I wondered what they were doing now, if they had any idea. Maybe they weren't worried at all. Maybe they would never even see it coming. Don't worry. John bought us some time. We'll think of something. She smiled. It was cool to see him doing something for us instead of against us. Yeah, if he was. I don't know why, but I still couldn't give that guy a break, even if Lena was willing to give Liv a chance. What's that supposed to mean? Lena sounded annoyed. You heard, Macon. What if he was using the opportunity to siphon off all of your powers? I don't know. Maybe we have to take it on faith. I didn't want to do that. Why should we? Because people change. Things change. Everything and everyone we know has changed. What if I don't want to? I didn't. It doesn't matter. We change whether we want to or not. Some things don't, I said. We don't get to decide how the world works. Rain falls down, not up. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's the way it is. Why is that concept so hard for you casters to understand? I guess we're sort of control freaks. You think? Lena's hair curled. It's hard not to do things when you can do them. And in my family, there's not much we can't do. Really? I kissed her. She smiled underneath my lips. Shut up. Is it hard not to do this? I kissed her neck, her ear, her lips. How about this? She opened her mouth to complain, but no words came out. We kissed until my heart was faltering. Even then, I'm not sure we would have stopped. But we did. Because I heard a rip. Time and space opened up. I saw the tip of his cane as Abraham Ravenwood slipped through a hole in the sky, the air slamming shut behind him. He was wearing a dark suit and his stovepipe hat, which made him look like Abraham Lincoln's father. Did I hear something about the new order? He took off his hat and tapped the brim, shaking off non-existent dust. Turns out broken... Suits me just fine, and I'm sure my boy John will feel the same way once he's back where he belongs. Before I had a chance to respond, I heard the sound of footsteps in the dirt. A second later, I saw her black motorcycle boots. I would have to agree. Seraphine was standing outside the stone arch, her black hair as curly and wild as Lena's. Even though it was a hundred degrees, she was wearing a long black dress with strips of fabric crisscrossing her body. It reminded me of a straitjacket. Lena! She didn't answer, but I could sense her heart pounding. Seraphine's gold eyes fixed on me. The mortal world is in a state of beautiful chaos and destruction which will ultimately lead to an exquisite end. We couldn't have planned this better ourselves. 
That was easy for her to say, since their original plan failed. There was something chilling about seeing Seraphine here, after watching her set Lena's childhood home on fire, with Lena and her father still inside. But it was also impossible to shake the images of the girl, not much older than Lena, battling the darkness within her, and losing. I pulled Lena to her feet, her hand burning mine the moment our skin touched. Lena, I'm right here with you. I know. Her voice sounded empty. Seraphine smiled at Lena. My damaged half-shadow daughter. I would love to say how nice it is to see you again, but that would be a lie, and I am nothing if not honest. The color had drained from Lena's face, and she was standing so still I almost wasn't sure she was breathing. Then I guess you're nothing, mother, because we both know you're a liar. Seraphine flexed her fingers. You know what they say about glass houses and stones. I wouldn't throw any if I were you, darling. You are looking at me through one gold eye. Lena flinched, and the wind started to blow. It's not the same, I said. Lena has light and dark in her. Seraphine waved her hand as if I was an annoying insect, a lubber trying to crawl my way out of the sunshine. There is light and darkness within us all, Ethan. Haven't you learned that by now? A chill crawled up my spine. Abraham leaned forward on his cane. Speak for yourself, my dear. The heart of this old incubus is as black as the tar in hell. Lena wasn't interested in Abraham's heart or Seraphine's lack of one. I don't know what you want, and I don't care. You should leave before Uncle Macon senses you're here. I'm afraid we can't do that. Abraham's empty black eyes were fixed on Lena. We have business to attend to. Every time I heard his voice, the rage welled up inside me. I hated him for what he'd done to Aunt Prue. What kind of business? Destroying the whole town? Don't worry, I'll get to that. Abraham pulled a polished gold pocket watch from his jacket and checked it. But first... We have to kill the one who is two. How does he know who it is, El? Don't, Kelt. She can hear you. I held Lena's hand tighter, feeling my skin blister beneath hers. We don't know what you're talking about. Don't lie to me, boy. He lifted his cane in one hand, pointing it at me. Did you think we wouldn't figure it out? Seraphine was staring at Lena's eyes. She hadn't seen them the night she called the Seventeenth Moon. She had been locked in some kind of dark caster dream state. We do have the Book of Moons, after all. Thunder rumbled through the air, but even as angry as she was, Lena couldn't bring the rain. You can have the book. We don't need it to forge the new order. Abraham didn't appreciate being challenged, especially not by a caster who was half light. No, you're right, little girl. You need the one who is two. But we aren't going to let you sacrifice yourself. We're going to kill you first. I forced my thoughts into the part of my mind I could lock away from Lena, because if she knew what I was thinking... Seraphine would, too. Even in that private part of my mind, the same thought kept fighting its way out. They thought the one who is two was Lena. And they were going to kill her. I tried to push Lena behind me, but the second I moved, Abraham extended his hand and lifted it into the air. My feet rose off the ground, and I was thrown back, an iron grip locked around my throat. Abraham began to close his hand, 
and I could feel an invisible glove closing around my neck. You have caused me enough trouble for two lifetimes. That ends here. Ethan! Lena screamed. Leave him alone! But the hand only tightened. I could feel it beginning to crush my windpipe. My body was jerking and shaking, and I remembered John when he was in the tunnels with Lena. The weird jerking and twitching he seemed unable to control. Was this what it felt like to be in the grip of Abraham Ravenwood? Lena started to run toward me, but Seraphine flicked out her fingers and a perfect circle of fire flew up around Lena. It reminded me of Lena's father standing in the midst of the flames as Seraphine watched him burn to death. Lena threw her own palm forward and Seraphine flew back. She hit the ground hard, skidding across the dirt faster than was humanly possible. She stood up, brushing off her dirty dress with her bloody hands. Someone's been practicing, Seraphine smiled. Me too. She turned her hand in a circle in front of her, and a second ring of fire surrounded the first. Lena, get out of there! I couldn't choke out the words. I didn't have enough air. Seraphine advanced. There will be no new order. The universe has already brought darkness upon the mortal world, but things will get worse. Lightning sliced across the Carolina blue sky, touching down on the old stone arch, reducing it to rubble. Seraphine's golden yellow eyes were glowing, and Lena's gold and green ones started to glow, too. The flames of the outer circle around Lena were spreading, touching the perimeter of the inner one. Seraphine! Abraham shouted. Enough of these games! Kill her, or I will! Seraphine stalked toward Lena, her dress blowing around her ankles. The four horsemen had nothing on her. She was rage and vengeance, wrath and malice, in beautifully twisted human form. You have shamed me for the last time. The sky began to darken above us, forming a dense black cloud. I tried to pull away from the supernatural grip, but every time I moved, Abraham closed his hand more and the vice around my neck tightened. It was hard to force my eyes to stay open. I kept blinking, trying not to pass out. Lena thrust her open hands into the fire, and the circle pushed away from her. The flames didn't die down, but they were expanded outward at Lena's command. The black cloud followed Seraphine, swirling above her. I blinked harder, trying to concentrate. I realized it wasn't a storm cloud trailing Seraphine. It was a swarm of vexes. Seraphine called out above the hissing fire. On the first day, there was dark matter. On the second, an abyss from which, on the third day, the dark fire rose. On the fourth day, from the smoke and flame, all power was born. She stopped just outside the blazing circle. On the fifth, the Lilum, the Demon Queen, was spun from the ash, and on the sixth came the Order, to balance an energy that knew no bounds. Seraphine's hair began to singe from the heat. On the seventh, there was a book. The Book of Moons appeared on the ground in front of her, the pages flipping themselves. They stopped abruptly, and the book lay open at Seraphine's feet, impervious to the flames. Seraphine began to recite from memory. From the voices in the darkness I come. From the wounds of the fallen I am born. From the despair I bring forth I am claimed. From the heart of the book, I hear the call. When I seek its vengeance, it is answered. The moment she spoke the last word, the fire parted, creating a path through the center of the blaze. 
I saw Seraphine raise her hands in front of her and close her eyes. She flicked her fingers open on both hands and fire sparked on the tips. But her face twisted in confusion. Something wasn't right. Her powers weren't working. The flames never left her fingers, and the sparks rained down, igniting her dress. I struggled with the last bit of strength I had left in me. I was going to lose consciousness. I heard a voice in a remote corner of my mind. It wasn't Lena or the Lilum or even Seraphine. It was whispering something over and over, so softly I couldn't hear it. The death grip around my neck loosened, but when I glanced at Abraham, the position of his hand hadn't changed. I gasped, inhaling so fast the air choked me. The words in my head were getting louder. Two words. I'm waiting. I saw his face, my face, for a split second. It was my other half, my fractured soul. He was trying to help me. The invisible hand was ripped from my neck, and air tore through my lungs. Abraham's expression was a mixture of shock, confusion, and fury. I stumbled as I ran toward Lena, still trying to catch my breath. By the time I reached the edge of the burning circle, Seraphine was trapped inside another, clutching the bottom of her burnt dress. I stopped a few feet away. The heat was so intense I couldn't get any closer. Lena was standing in front of Seraphine, on the other side of the blazing ring. Her hair was singed from the heat, her face black from the smoke. The cloud of vexes was moving away from her and toward Abraham. He was watching, but he wasn't helping Seraphine. Lena, help me! Seraphine called, dropping to her knees. She looked so much like Isabel the night she was claimed, lying at her mother's feet. I never wanted to hurt you. I never wanted any of this. Lena's blackened face was filled with rage. No, you wanted me dead. Seraphine's eyes were watering from the smoke, which almost made it look like she was crying. My life has never been about what I wanted. My choices were made for me. I tried so hard to fight the darkness, but I wasn't strong enough. She coughed, trying to rub the smoke away. With her face streaked and her eyes swollen and red, the gold in them was hard to see. You have always been the strong one, even as a baby. That's how you survived. I recognized the confusion in Lena's eyes. Seraphine was a victim of the curse Lena had feared her whole life, the curse that had spared Lena. Was this who her mother could have been? What do you mean, how I survived? Seraphine coughed, black smoke swirling around her. There was a terrible storm, and the rain put out the fire. You saved yourself. She sounded relieved, as if she hadn't left Lena for dead. Lena stared at her mother. And today you were going to finish what you started. An ember fell onto Seraphine's dress, and it caught fire again. She slapped at the charred fabric with her bare hand until it went out. She lifted her eyes to meet Lena's. Please. Her voice was so hoarse it was hard to hear. She reached out her hand toward Lena. I wasn't going to hurt you. I just had to make him believe I was. She was talking about Abraham, the one who had lured Lena's mother into the dark, the one who was standing there watching her burn. Lena was shaking her head, tears streaming down her face. How can I trust you? But even as she said it, the flames began to die down in the space between them. Lena started to reach out her hand. Their fingertips were inches apart.
I could see the burns on Seraphine's arm as she reached for Lena. I've always loved you, Lena. You're my little girl. Lena closed her eyes. It was hard to look at Seraphine with her hair singed and her skin blistering. It had to be even harder if she was your mother. I wish I could believe you. Lena, look at me. Seraphine seemed to be breaking. I'll love you until the day after forever. I remembered the words from the vision, the last thing Seraphine said to Lena's father before she left him to die. I'll love you until the day after forever. Lena remembered too. I saw her face twist in agony as she yanked her hand back. You don't love me. You aren't capable of love. The fire surged up where it had died down only a minute before, trapping Seraphine. She was being consumed by the flames she once controlled, her powers as unpredictable as any caster's. No! Seraphine screamed. I'm sorry, Isabel, Lena whispered. Seraphine lunged forward, catching the sleeve of her dress on fire. You little bitch! I wish you had burned to death like your miserable father. I will find you in the next life. But screams reached a crescendo as the flames swept over Seraphine's body in seconds. It was worse than the blood-curdling shrieking of the vexes. It was the sound of pain and death and misery. Her body fell, and the flames moved over it like a swarm of locusts leaving nothing but the raging fire. At the same moment, Lena dropped to her knees, staring at the place where her mother's hand had hung in the air a minute before. Lena! I closed the distance between us, dragging her away from the fire. She was coughing, trying to catch her breath. Abraham came closer, the black cloud of demonic spirits above him, I pulled Lena to me as we watched Greenbrier burn for the second time. He was standing over us, the tip of his cane practically touching the melted toe of my sneaker. Well, you know what they say. If you want something done right, do it yourself. You didn't help her. I don't know why I said it. I didn't care that Seraphine was dead, but why hadn't he? Abraham laughed. Saved me the trouble of killing her myself. She wasn't worth her weight in salt anymore. I wondered if Seraphine had realized how expendable she was, how worthless she was in the eyes of the master she served. But she was one of you. Dark casters are nothing like me and my kind boy. They're like rats. Plenty more where Seraphine came from. He looked at Lena, his face darkening to match his empty eyes. Once your little girlfriend's dead, getting rid of them will be my next order of business. Don't listen to him, Elle. But she wasn't listening to Abraham. She wasn't listening to anyone. I knew because I could hear her stumbling over the same words in her mind again and again. I let my mother die. I let my mother die. I let my mother die. I pushed Lena behind me, even though she had a better chance of fighting Abraham than I did. My aunt was right. You are the devil. She's too kind, but I wish I was. He pulled out his gold pocket watch, checking the time. But I do know a few demons, and they've been waiting a long time to pay this world a visit. Abraham slid the watch back into his jacket. Looks like you kids are out of time. 
December 14th. Demon Door. Abraham lifted the Book of Moons, and the pages began to turn again, flipping so fast I was sure they would tear. When they stopped, he ran his fingers over the pages reverently. This was his Bible, framed by the black smoke behind him. Abraham began to read. On darkest days when blood is spilled, a legion of demons to avenge those killed. If a marked door cannot be found, the earth will open to offer one from the ground. Sanguine effuso atris diebus, orietur demonum legio ut interfectus ulciscatur. Si annua notata inveniri non potuerit, telus hiscat ut de terra ipsa ianuam offerat. I didn't want to hang around to see the legion of demons that Abraham was calling to finish us off. The vexes were enough for me. I grabbed Lena's hand and pulled her up, running from the fire and Lena's dead mother, from Abraham and the Book of Moons and whatever evil he was summoning. Ethan, we're going the wrong way. Lena was right. We should have been running toward Ravenwood instead of through the tangled cotton fields that used to be part of Blackwell, the plantation that once stood on the other side of Greenbrier. But there was nowhere else to go. Abraham was standing between Ravenwood and us, his sadistic smile revealing the truth. This was a game, and he was enjoying it. We don't have a choice. We have to— Lena cut me off before I could finish. Something's wrong. I can feel it. The sky darkened above us, and I heard a low, rumbling sound. But it wasn't thunder or the unmistakable screams of Vexus. What is that? I was dragging Lena up the hill that used to lead from the road to Blackwell Plantation. Before she could answer, the ground started moving beneath us. It felt like it was rolling under my feet, and I struggled to keep my balance. The rumbling sound was getting louder, and there were other noises, trees splitting and falling, the strangled symphony of thousands of lubbers, and a faint cracking coming from behind us, or below us. Lena saw it first. Oh my God! The earth was cracking down the middle of the dirt road, the split heading right for us. As the crack spread, the ground opened up, and dirt poured into the fissure like quicksand being sucked into a hole. It was an earthquake. It seemed impossible because quakes didn't happen in the south. They happened in places out west, like California. But I'd seen enough movies to recognize one. The sound was as terrifying as the sight of the ground consuming itself. The black streak of vexes above us reared back, heading straight for us. The ground behind us was splitting faster, tearing like a seam. We can't outrun it, or them, Lena's voice was ragged. We're trapped. Maybe not. I looked over the side of the hill and saw the beater skidding across the road below us. Link was driving like his mom had just caught him drinking in church. There was something in front of the beater, moving even faster than the car. It was Boo, not the lazy black dog that slept at the foot of Lena's bed. This was a caster dog that looked like a wolf and ran faster than one. Lena looked back. We'll never make it. Abraham was still standing in the distance, untouched by the winds swirling around him. He turned to look over the side of the hill where the beater was racing along the road below. I looked down, too. Link was hanging out the window, shouting at me. I couldn't hear him, but whatever he was urging us to do, jump, run, I didn't even know. There was no time. I shook my head silently, glancing back at Abraham one last time. Link's eyes followed mine. Then... He was gone. 
The beater was still moving, but the driver's seat was empty. Boo jumped out of the way as the car sped past him, ignoring the curve in the road. The beater flipped, crashing down onto the road over and over. I saw the roof cave in at the same time I heard the rip. A hand fumbled for my arm. I was pitched into the black void that transported incubuses from one place to another, but I didn't need to see to know it was Link's hand digging into my skin. I was still spiraling through the void when I felt his fingers slipping. Then I was falling, and the world came back into view, slices of the dark sky and flashes of brown. My back hit something hard more than once. I watched the sky pull farther and farther away as I got closer to the ground, but my body slammed against something solid, and suddenly I wasn't falling anymore. Ethan? My arm was caught, and the pain tore up my shoulder. I blinked. I was trapped in a sea of long, brown... branches? Dude, are you okay? I turned slowly toward the sound of his voice. Link was standing at the base of the tree, staring up at me. Lena was beside him, completely panicked. I'm trapped in a tree. What do you think? Relief spread across Lena's face. I think I just saved your ass with my superpowers. Link was grinning. Ethan, can you get down? Lena asked. Yeah. I don't think anything's broken. I untangled my legs from the branches carefully. I can rip you down, Link offered. No thanks. I got it. I was afraid of where I might end up if he gave it another shot. It hurt every time I moved, so it took me a few minutes to climb down. As soon as I hit the ground, Lena threw her arms around me. You're okay. I didn't want to mention that if she squeezed me any tighter, I wouldn't be. I could already feel what little energy I had left draining out of me. I think so. Hey, you two are heavier than you look, and it was my first time. Cut me some slack. Link was still grinning. I did save your lives. I held out my fist. You did, man. We'd be dead if it wasn't for you. He tapped his knuckles against mine. I guess that makes me a hero. Great, now your head's gonna be even bigger, if that's possible. He knew what I was really saying. Thanks for saving my ass and the girl I love. Lena hugged him. Well, you're my hero. I did sacrifice the beater. Link looked over at me. How bad was it? Bad, he shrugged. Nothing a little duct tape can't fix. Hope you've got a lot of it. How did you find us, anyway? You know how they say animals can sense tornadoes and earthquakes and stuff like that? Guess it's the same for incubuses. The earthquake, Lena whispered. Do you think it made it to town? It's already hit, Link said. Main Street split open right down the middle. Is everyone okay? I meant Amma, my dad, and my hundred-year-old aunts. I don't know. My mom took a mess of people down to the church, and they're holed up in there. She said something about the foundation and the steel in the beams and some show she saw on the Nature Channel. Leave it to Mrs. Lincoln to rescue everyone on her street with educational programming and a talent for ordering people around. When I left, she was screaming about the apocalypse and the seven signs. We have to get to my house. We didn't live as close to church as Link did, and I was pretty sure Waits Landing wasn't built to withstand earthquakes. There's no way. The road split right behind me as soon as I turned off a of Route 9. We're gonna have to go through perpetual peace. It was hard to believe Link was volunteering to go into the cemetery at night, in the middle of a supernatural earthquake. Lena put her head on my shoulder. I have a bad feeling about this. Yeah, 
Well, I've had a bad feeling since I got back from Neverland and turned into a demon. When we walked through the gates of his garden of perpetual peace, it was anything but peaceful. Even with the glowing crosses, it was so dark I could barely see. The lubbers were going nuts, buzzing so loud that it sounded like we were in the center of a wasp's nest. Lightning cut through the darkness, cracking the sky the way the earthquake had cracked the earth. Link was leading the way, since he was the only one who could see much of anything. You know, my mom's right about one thing. In the Bible, it says there'll be earthquakes at the end. I looked at him like he was nuts. When was the last time you read the Bible? In Sunday school when we were nine? He shrugged. Just saying. Lena bit her bottom lip. Link could be right. What if Abraham didn't cause this, and it's a result of the order being broken? Like the heat and the bugs and the lake drying up. I knew she felt responsible, but this wasn't caused by a mortal end of days. This was a supernatural apocalypse. And Abraham just happened to be reading about cracking open the earth to let all the demons out? Link looked over at me. What do you mean, letting the demons out? Letting them out of where? The ground started to tremble again. Link stopped, listening. It seemed like he was trying to determine where the quake was coming from or where it would hit next. The rumbling changed to a creaking sound, as if we were standing on a porch that was about to collapse. It sounded like a thunderstorm underground. Is another one going to hit? I couldn't decide if it was better to run or stand still. Link looked around. I think we should... The ground underneath us seized, and I heard the asphalt splitting. There was nowhere to go, and not enough time to get there anyway. The asphalt was crumbling around me, but I wasn't falling down. Pieces of the road were jutting up toward the sky. They scraped against each other, forming a crooked concrete triangle, until they stopped. The glowing crosses started flickering out. Tell me that isn't what I think it is. Link was backing away from the dead grass, dotted with plastic flowers and headstones. It looked like the headstones were shifting. Maybe another aftershock was coming. Or worse. What are you talking about? The first gravestone came out of the dirt before he had time to answer. It was another earthquake. At least, that's what I thought. But I was wrong. The gravestones weren't falling over. They were being pushed up from underneath. Stones and dirt were flying into the air and coming back down like bombs being dropped from the sky. Rotted caskets forced their way out of the ground. Hundred-year-old pine boxes and black lacquered coffins were rolling down the hill, breaking open and leaving decaying corpses in their wake. The smell was so disgusting, Link was gagging. Ethan! Lena screamed. I grabbed her hand. Run! Link didn't need to be told twice. Bones and boards were flying through the air like shrapnel, but Link was taking the hits for us like a linebacker. Lena, what's happening? I didn't let go of her hand. I think Abraham opened some kind of door into the underground. She stumbled, and I pulled her back to her feet. We reached the hill that led to the oldest part of the cemetery, the one I had pushed Aunt Mercy's wheelchair up more times than I could count. The hill was dark, and I tried to avoid the huge holes I could barely see. This way! Link was already at the top. He stopped, and I thought he was waiting for us, but when we made it up the hill, I realized he was staring out into the graveyard. The mausoleums and tombs had exploded, littering the ground with hunks of carved stone, bones, and body parts. There was a plastic fawn lying in the dust. It looked like someone had dug up every grave on the hill. 
there was a corpse standing at the far end of what used to be the good side of the hill. You could tell it had been buried for a while by the state of decay. The corpse was staring at us, but it had no eyes. The sockets were completely empty. Something was inside it, animating what was left of the body, the way the lilum had been inside Mrs. English. Link put up his arm to keep us behind him. The corpse cocked its head to one side, as if it was listening. Then a dark mist poured out of its eyes, nose, and mouth. The body went slack and dropped to the ground. The mist spiraled like a vex, then shot across the sky and out of the graveyard. Was that a shear? I asked. Link answered before Lena. No, it was some kind of demon. How do you know? Lena whispered as if she was afraid she might wake more of the dead. Link looked away. The same way a dog knows when it sees another dog. It didn't look like a dog to me. I was trying to make him feel better, but we were way past that. Link stared at the body lying on the ground where the demon stood only moments ago. Maybe my mom's right, and this is the end of days. Maybe she's gonna get a chance to use her wheat grinder and her gas masks and that inflatable raft after all. A raft? Is that what's strapped to the roof of your garage? Link nodded. Yep, yeah. for when the waters rise and the low country floods and God takes his vengeance on all us sinners. I shook my head. Not God. Abraham Ravenwood. The ground had finally stopped shaking, but we didn't notice. The three of us were shaking so hard, it was impossible to tell. December 17th. Passing Strange. Sixteen bodies were lying in the county mortuary. According to the shadowing song from my mom, there should have been eighteen. I didn't know why the earthquakes had stopped and Abraham's army of vexes had disappeared. Maybe destroying the town had lost its appeal once we were gone and the town was, well, destroyed. But if I knew anything about Abraham, there was a reason. All I knew was that this kind of broken math, the place where the rational met the supernatural, was what my life was like now. And I knew without a doubt that two more bodies would join the sixteen. That's how much I believed in the songs. Number seventeen and number eighteen. Those were the numbers I had in the back of my mind as I drove out to county care. The power was out there, too and I had a terrible feeling I knew who number 17 would be. The backup generator was flickering on and off. I could tell by the way the safety lights were flashing. Bobby Murphy wasn't at the front desk. In fact, nobody was. Today's catastrophic events at his garden of perpetual peace weren't going to raise too many eyebrows at county care, a place most people didn't know about, until tragedy struck. Sixteen. I wondered if there were even sixteen autopsy tables at the mortuary. I was pretty sure there weren't. But a trip to the mortuary was probably a regular event around here. There was more than one revolving door between the dead and the living as you made your way down these hallways. When you walked through the doors of county care, your universe shrunk, smaller and smaller, until your whole world was your hallway, your nurse, and your eight-by-ten antiseptic peach of a room. Once you walked in here, you didn't care much about what happened out there. This place was a kind of in-between world, especially since every time I took Aunt Prue's hand, it felt like I ended up in another one. Nothing seemed real anymore, which was ironic because outside these walls, things were more real than they'd ever been. And if I didn't figure out what to do about a few of them, like a powerful lilum from the demon world, an unpaid blood debt that was destroying Gatlin, and a few larger worlds beyond, 
there weren't going to be any antiseptic peaches left to call home. I walked down the dark hallway toward Aunt Prue's room. The safety lights flashed on, and I saw a figure in a hospital gown standing at the end of the hallway, holding an IV. Then the safety lights flashed off, and I couldn't see anything. The lights came on again, and the figure was gone. The thing is, I could have sworn it was my aunt. Aunt Prue? The lights went out again. I felt really alone, and not the peaceful kind of alone. I thought I saw something moving in the darkness, and then the safety lights flashed back on. What the? I jumped back, spooked. Aunt Prue was standing right in front of me, her face inches from mine. I could see every wrinkle, every mark from every tear, and every road, like a map of the Castor Tunnels. She beckoned me with one finger, like she wanted me to follow. Then she held her finger to her lips. Shh. The lights went out, and she was gone. I ran, fumbling my way through the darkness, until I found my aunt's room. I pushed on the door, but it didn't open. Leah, it's me! The door swung open, and I saw Leah holding a finger to her lips. It was almost exactly like the gesture Aunt Prue had made in the hallway. I was confused. Shh! Leah locked the door behind me. It's time. Amma and Macon's mother, Aurelia, were sitting next to the bed. She must have come to town for Aunt Prue. Their eyes were closed, and they held hands over Aunt Prue's body. At the foot of the bed, I could barely make out a shimmering presence, the flutter of a thousand tiny braids and beads. Aunt Twyla? Is that you? I saw a flash of smile. Amma shushed me. I felt Aunt Prue's gnarled hand clutching mine, patting me reassuringly. Shh. I smelled something burning and realized a handful of herbs was smoking in a painted ceramic bowl on the windowsill. Aunt Prue's bed was covered with her familiar bedspread, the one with the little balls stitched all over it, instead of her hospital sheets. Her flowered pillows were behind her head. Harlan James IV was curled by her feet. There was something different about Aunt Prue. There wasn't a tube or a monitor or even a piece of tape attached to her body. She was dressed in her crocheted slippers and her best pink-flowered housecoat, the one with the mother-of-pearl buttons, as if she were going out for one of her drives to inspect every front yard on the street and complain about who needed a new coat of paint on their house. I was right. She was number seventeen. I pushed between Amma and Aurelia and took Aunt Prue's hand. Amma opened one eye and shot me a look. Hands to yourself, Ethan Waite. You don't need to go where she's going. I stood taller. She's my aunt, Amma. I want to say goodbye. Aurelia shook her head without opening her eyes. No time for that now. Her voice sounded like it was drifting into the room from far away. Aunt Prue came to find me. I think she has something to tell me. Amma opened her eyes, raising an eyebrow. There's the world of the living, and there's the world of the done living. She's had a good life, and she's ready. And right now, I've got enough trouble keeping the folks I care about here with the living. So if you don't mind, she sniffed as if she was trying to get dinner on the table and I was getting in the way. I gave her a look I'd never given Amma before, one that said, I mind. She sighed and took my hand in one of hers, my aunt's hand in the other. I closed my eyes and waited. Aunt Prue? Nothing happened. Aunt Prue. I opened one eye. What's wrong? I whispered. Can't say as I know. 
All that fussing and those demons making all that racket probably scared her off. All those bodies, Aurelia whispered. Amma nodded. Too many folks move into the other world tonight. But it's not finished yet. There'll be eighteen. That's what the song said. Amma looked at me, her expression broken. Maybe the song's wrong. Even the cards and the greats are wrong sometime or another. Maybe not everything rolls down the hill as quick as you think. Those are my mom's songs, and she said eighteen. She's never wrong, and you know it. I know, Ethan Waite. She didn't have to say it. I could see it in her eyes, in the way her jaw was set and her face was lined. I held out my hand again. Please. Amma looked over her shoulder. Leah, Aurelia, Twyla, come give us a hand here. We joined hands, creating a circle, mortal and caster. Me, the lost wayward, Leah, the light succubus. Amma, the seer who was lost in the darkness, Aurelia, the diviner who knew more than she wanted to, and Twyla, who had once called the spirits of the dead a sheer in the other world, the light to show Aunt Prue the way home. They were all part of my family now. Here we were, holding hands in a hospital room, saying goodbye to someone who was in so many ways already long gone. Amma nodded to Twyla. You mind doing the honors? Within seconds, the room disappeared into shadow instead of light. I felt the wind blowing, even though we were inside. Or so I thought. The darkness solidified until we were standing in an enormous room, facing a vault door. I recognized it immediately, the vault in the back of exile, the club from the tunnels. This time the room was empty. I was alone. I put both hands on the door, touching the silver wheel that opened it. I pulled as hard as I could, but I couldn't make the wheel turn. You're gonna have to put a little more muscle into it, Ethan. I turned around, and Aunt Prue was standing behind me in her crocheted slippers and her housecoat, leaning heavily on her IV pole. It wasn't even attached to her body. Aunt Prue, I hugged her, feeling the bones behind her papery skin. Don't go. That's enough of your fussing. You're as bad as Amma. She's been here most every night this week, trying to get me to stay keeps putting something that smells like Harlan James' old diapers under my pillow. She wrinkled her nose. I've had my fill of this place. They don't even have my stories on the TV here. Can't you stay? There are so many parts of the tunnels left to map, and I don't know what Aunt Mercy and Aunt Grace are going to do without you. That's why I wanted to talk to you. It's important, so you pay attention, you hear? I'm listening. I knew there was something she needed to tell me, something none of the others could know. Aunt Prue leaned in on her IV and whispered, You gotta stop him. Stop who? The hair on the back of my neck was standing up. Another whisper, I know exactly what they're fixin' to do, which is invite half of the town to my party. Her party? She'd mentioned it before. You mean your funeral? She nodded. Been planning it since I was fifty-two, and I want it to go just the way I want. Good china and linens, the good punch bowl— and Sissy Honeycutt singing Amazing Grace. I left a list of the details underneath of my dresser, if it made it over to Waits Landing. I couldn't believe this was the reason she'd brought me here. But then again, it was Aunt Prue. Yes, ma'am. 
It's all about the guest list, Ethan. I get it. You want to make sure all the right people are there. She looked at me like I was an idiot. No, I want to make sure the wrong ones aren't. I want to make sure certain people stay out. This isn't a pig pic at the firehouse. She was serious, although I saw a sparkle in her eye that made it seem like she was about to break out into one of her infamously unharmonic fake opera versions of leaning on the everlasting arms. I want you to slam the door before Eunice Honeycutt sets foot in the building. I don't care if Sissy's singing or that woman brings the Lord Almighty on her arm. She's not having any of my punch. I grabbed her in a hug so big that I lifted her tiny crocheted feet right off the ground. I'm going to miss you, Aunt Prue. Course you are, but it's my time, and I got things to do and husbands to see, not to mention a few Harlan Jameses. Now, would you mind getting the door for an old woman? I'm not feeling like myself today. That door? I touched the metal vault in front of us. The very one? She let go of the IV stand and nodded at me. Where does it go? She shrugged. Can't tell you. Just know it's where I'm meant to go. What if I'm not supposed to open it or something? Ethan, are you telling me you're afraid to open a silly little door? Turn the darned wheel already. I put my hands on the wheel and yanked on it as hard as I could. It didn't move. You gonna make an old woman do the heavy lifting? Aunt Prue pushed me aside with one feeble hand and reached out to touch the door. It sprang open beneath her hand, blasting light and wind and spraying water into the room. I could see a glimpse of blue water beyond. I offered her my arm and she took it. As I helped her over the threshold... We stood there for a second on opposite sides of the door. She looked over her shoulder into the blue behind her. Looks like this here's my path. You want to walk me a ways like you promised you would? I froze. I promised I'd walk you out there? She nodded. Sure did. You're the one who told me about the last door. How else would I know about it? I don't know anything about a last door, Aunt Prue. I've never been past this door. Sure you have. You're standing past it this very minute. I looked out, and there I was, the other me, hazy and gray, flickering like a shadow. It was the me from the lens of the old video camera, the me from the dream. My fractured soul. He started walking toward the vault door. Aunt Prue waved in his direction. You going to walk me up to the lighthouse? The moment she said it, I could see the pathway of neat stone steps leading up a grassy slope to a white stone lighthouse. Square and old, one simple stone box on top of another, then a white tower that reached high into the unbroken blue of the sky. The water beyond was even bluer. The grass that moved with the wind was green and alive, and it made me long for something I had never seen. But I guess I had seen it, because there I was, coming down the stone pathway. A sick feeling turned in my stomach, and suddenly someone twisted my arm behind me, like Link was practicing wrestling moves on me. A voice, the loudest voice in the universe, from the strongest person I knew, thundered in my ear. You go on ahead, Prudence. You don't need Ethan's help. You've got Twyla now, and you'll be fine once you get up there to that lighthouse. 
Amma nodded with a smile, and suddenly Twyla was standing next to Aunt Prue. Not a maid of light, Twyla, but the real one, looking the same as she did the night she died. Aunt Prue caught my eye and blew me a kiss, taking Twyla's arm and turning back toward the lighthouse. I tried to see if the other half of my soul was still out there, but the vault door slammed so hard it echoed through the club behind me. Leah spun the wheel with both hands as hard as she could. I tried to help, but she pushed me away. Aurelia was there, too, muttering something I couldn't understand. Amma still had me in a hold so tight that she could have won the state championship if we really were at a wrestling match. Aurelia opened her eyes. Now. It has to be now. Everything went black. I opened my eyes, and we were standing around Aunt Prue's lifeless body. She was gone, but we already knew that. Before I could say or do anything, Amma had me out of the room and halfway down the hall. You! She could barely speak, a bony finger pointing at me. Five minutes later, we were in my car, and she only let go of my arm so I could drive us home. It took forever to figure out a way to get back to the house. Half of the roads in town had been closed off because of the earthquake that wasn't an earthquake. I stared at the steering wheel and thought about the wheel on the vault door. What was that? The last door. Amma turned and slapped me in the face. She'd never laid a hand on me, not in her entire life or mine. Don't you ever scare me like that again. December 19th. Cream of Grief. The cream-colored paper was thick and folded eight times, with a purple satin ribbon tied around it. I found it in the bottom drawer of the dresser, just like Aunt Prue said I would. I read it to the sisters, who argued about it with Thelma, until Amma stepped in. If Prudence Jane wanted the good china, we're using the good china. No sense arguing with the dead. Amma folded her arms. Aunt Prue had only been gone two days. It seemed wrong to be calling her dead so soon. Next you'll be telling me she didn't want funeral potatoes. Aunt Mercy wadded up another handkerchief. I checked the paper. She does, but she doesn't want you to let Janine Mayberry make them. She doesn't want stale potato chips crumbled on the top. Aunt Mercy nodded as if I was reading from the Declaration of Independence. It's the truth. Janine Mayberry says they bake up better that way, but Prudence Jane always said it was on account of her being so cheap. Her chin quivered. Aunt Mercy was a mess. She hadn't done much of anything but wad up handkerchiefs ever since she heard that Aunt Prue had passed. Aunt Grace, on the other hand, had busied herself with writing condolence cards letting everyone know how sorry she was that Aunt Prue was gone, even though Thelma explained that it was the other folks who were supposed to send them to her. Aunt Grace had looked at Thelma like she was crazy. Why would they send them to me? They're my cards, and it's my news. Thelma shook her head, but she didn't say anything after that. Whenever there was a disagreement about something, they made me read the letter again, and Aunt Prue's letter was about as eccentric and specific as my Aunt Prue herself. Dear girls, the letter began. To each other, the sisters were never the sisters. They were always the girls. If you're reading this, I've been called to my great reward. Even though I'll be busy meeting my maker... I'll still be watching to be sure my party goes according to my specifications. 
and don't think I won't march right out of my grave and up the center aisle of the church if Eunice Honeycutt sets one foot into the building. Only Aunt Prue would need a bouncer for her funeral. It went on and on from there, aside from stipulating that all four Harlan Jameses be in attendance, along with Lucille Ball, and selecting a somewhat scandalous arrangement of Amazing Grace and the wrong version of Abide With Me, the biggest surprise was the eulogy. She wanted Amma to deliver it. That's nonsense, Amma sniffed. It's what Aunt Prue wanted. Look, I held out the paper. Amma wouldn't look at it. Then she's as big a fool as the rest of you. I patted her on the back. No sense arguing with the dead, Amma. She glared at me, and I shrugged. At least you don't have to rent a tuxedo. My dad stood up from his seat on the bottom stair, defeated. Well, I'd better go start rounding up the bagpipes. In the end, the bagpipes were a gift from Macon. Once he heard about Aunt Prue's request, he insisted on bringing them in all the way from the Highlands Elks Club in Columbia, the state capital. At least, that's what he said. Knowing him and the tunnels, I was convinced they came from Scotland that same morning. They played Amazing Grace so beautifully when folks first arrived that nobody would walk into the church. A huge crowd formed around the front walkway and the sidewalk until the reverend insisted they all come inside. I stood in the doorway, watching the crowd. A hearse, a real hearse, not Lena and Macon's, sat parked out in front of the building. Aunt Prue was being buried in the Somerville Cemetery until his garden of perpetual peace reopened for business. The sisters called it the New Cemetery, since it had only been open about seventy years. The sight of the hearse brought back a memory, the first time I saw Lena drive through Gatlin on my way to school last year. I remembered thinking it was an omen, maybe even a bad one. Had it been? Looking back on everything that had happened, everything that had brought me from that hearse to this one, I still couldn't say. Not because of Lena. She would always be the best thing that had ever happened to me. But because things had changed. We both had. I understood that. But Gatlin had changed, too. And that was harder to understand. So I stood in the doorway of the chapel, watching it happen, letting it happen, because I didn't have a choice. The eighteenth moon was two days away. If Lena and I didn't figure out what the Lilum wanted, who the one who is two actually was, there was no way to predict how much more things would change. Maybe this hearse was another omen of things to come. We had spent hours in the archive, with nothing to show for it. Still, I knew that was where Lena and I would be again, as soon as the funeral was over. There was nothing left to do but try, even if it seemed hopeless. You can't fight fate. Was that what my mom had said? I don't see my horse-drawn carriage. White horses, that's what my letter said. I would have known that voice anywhere. Aunt Prue was standing next to me. No glimmer, no shine, just plain as day Aunt Prue. If she wasn't still wearing the clothes she died in, I would have mistaken her for one of the guests at her own funeral. Yeah, well, we had a little trouble finding one, since you're not Abraham Lincoln. She ignored me. I thought I made it clear. I wanted Sissy Honeycutt to be the one singing Amazing Grace, just like she did at Charlene Watkins's service. And I don't see her, but these fellas really put some lung into it, which I appreciate. Sissy Honeycutt said we'd have to invite Eunice if we wanted her to sing. 
That was explanation enough for Aunt Prue. We turned back to the Pipers. I think it's the only hymn they know. I'm not sure they're actually Southern. She smiled. Course they ain't. The music spun out over the crowd, drawing everyone a few feet closer. I could tell Aunt Prue was pleased, no matter what she said. Still, it's a fine crowd. Biggest one I've seen in years. Bigger than all my husbands put together. She looked at me. Don't you think so, Ethan? I smiled. Yes, ma'am. It's a fine crowd. I pulled on the collar of my tux shirt. In the hundred-degree winter heat, I was about to pass out. But I didn't tell her that. Now put your jacket on and show a little respect for the deceased. Amma and my dad reached a compromise on the eulogy. Amma wouldn't deliver it, but she would read a poem. When she finally told us what she was reading, nobody gave it much thought, except that it meant we got to cross off two items on Aunt Prue's list at the same time. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. The words hit me like bullets. The darkness was deepening, and though I didn't know what the eventide was, it felt like it was falling fast. It wasn't just comforts that were fleeing, and it was more than Earth's joys and glories that were passing away. Amma was right. So was the guy who wrote the hymn. Change and decay was all I could see. I didn't know if there was anyone or anything who changest not, but if there was, I would do more than ask them to abide with me. I wanted them to rescue me. By the time Amma folded the paper back up, you could have heard a pin drop. She stood at the podium, every bit Sulla the prophet as the original. That's when I realized what she had done. It wasn't a poem, not the way she had read it. It wasn't even a hymn anymore. It was a prophecy. December 20th. Hybrid. I was standing on the top of the white water tower, with my back to the sun. My headless shadow fell across the warm, painted metal, disappearing off the edge and into the sky. I'm waiting. There he was, my other half. The dream staggered on like a movie I'd seen so many times that I started to cut and recut it myself as it erupted into flashes. Hard hitting, chucks kicking, dead weight, falling. Ethan! I rolled out of my bed and landed on my bedroom floor. No wonder incubuses keep showing up in your room. You sleep like the dead. John Breed was standing over me. From where I was lying, he looked twenty feet tall. He also looked like he could kick my ass better than I had been kicking my own in my dream. It was a weird thought, but what came next was weirder. I need your help. John was sitting in the chair at my desk, which I had started to think of as the incubus chair. I wish you guys could figure out some way to sleep. I pulled my faded Harley Davidson shirt over my head. Ironic, considering I was sitting across from John. Yeah, that's not really an option. 
He stared up at my blue ceiling. Then I wish you could figure out that the rest of us need to... John cut me off. It's me. What? Liv told me everything. The one who is two guy. It's me. Are you sure? I wasn't even sure I believed him. Yeah. I figured it out today at your aunt's funeral. I glanced at the clock. He should have said yesterday, and I should have been asleep. How? He got up and paced across the room. I always knew it was me. I was born to be two things. But at the funeral, I knew this was something I had to do. I felt it when the seer was talking. Ama? I knew Aunt Prue's funeral had been emotional for my family, the whole town, really, but I hadn't expected it to affect John. He wasn't part of either of those things. What do you mean you always knew? It's my birthday tomorrow, right? My 18th moon. He didn't sound too happy about it, and I couldn't blame him, considering it was bringing on the end of the world and everything. Do you know what you're saying? I still didn't trust him. He nodded. I'm supposed to make the trade, like the Demon Queen said. My pathetic, screwed-up experiment of a life for a new order. I almost feel bad for the universe. I'm getting a bargain. Except for the fact that I won't be around to see it. But live will, I said. Live will. He dropped back down in the chair, holding his head in his hands. Damn. He looked up. Damn, that's the best you can come up with? I'm ready to lay down my life here. I almost couldn't imagine what was going through his mind. What would make a guy like him willing to die? Almost. I knew what it felt like to be willing to sacrifice yourself for the girl you loved, I was going to do the same thing at the Great Barrier when we faced Abraham and hunting. At Honey Hill when we faced the fires and Seraphine. I would have died for Lena a thousand times over. Liv's not going to be happy. No, she's not, he agreed. But she'll understand. I think things like this are pretty hard to understand, and I've been trying for a while now. You know what your problem is, mortal? The end of the world? John shook his head. You think too much. Yeah? I almost laughed. Trust me, sometimes you gotta trust your gut instincts. So what does your gut want me to do? I said it slowly without looking at him. I didn't know until I got here. He walked over to me and grabbed my arm. The place you were dreaming about. The big white tower. That's where I need to go. Before I could tell him what I thought about him digging through my dreams, incubus style, I heard the rip, and we were gone. I couldn't see John. I couldn't see anything but darkness and a silver streak of widening light. When I stepped through, I heard the ripping sound again and saw her face. Liv was waiting for us on the top of the water tower. She stormed toward us, furious, but she wasn't looking at me. Are you completely insane? Did you think I wouldn't know what you were up to, where you'd come? She started to cry. John stepped in front of me. How did you know where I was? She waved a piece of paper in the air. You left a note. You left her a note? I asked. It just said goodbye. And some other stuff. It didn't say where I was going. I shook my head. She's Liv. You didn't know she'd figure it out? She held up her wrist. The dials were practically exploding off her selenometer. The one who is too... You didn't think I would instantly know it was you? If you hadn't walked in on me writing about it, I would never have even told you. Liv, 
I've been trying to find a way around this for months now. She closed her eyes. He reached out for her. I've been trying to find a way around you. You don't have to do this. Liv shook her head, and John pulled her close against his chest, kissing her forehead. Yeah, I do. For once in my life, I want to be the guy who does the right thing. Liv's blue eyes were red from crying. I don't want you to go. We only just... I never had a chance. We never had a chance. He put his thumb on her lip. Shh. We did. I did. He looked out into the night, but he was still talking to her. I love you, Olivia. This is my chance. She didn't respond except for the tears running down her face. He took a step toward me, pulling me up by the arm. Take care of her for me, will you? I nodded. He leaned closer. If you hurt her, if you touch her, if you let anyone break her heart, I will find you and kill you. And then I'll keep hurting you from the other side. Understand? I understood better than he knew. He let go of me and took his jacket off. He handed it to Liv. Keep it, to remember me by. And there's something else. He reached into one of the pockets. I don't remember my mother, but Abraham said this belonged to her. I want you to have it. It was a gold bracelet with an inscription in Niatic, or some other caster language only Liv would know how to read. Liv's knees buckled, and she started sobbing. John held her so tight that the tips of her toes were barely touching the ground. I'm glad I finally met someone I wanted to give it to. Me too. She could barely speak. He kissed her gently and stepped away from her. He nodded at me and threw himself over the edge of the railing. I heard her voice echoing through the darkness, the lilum. The balance is not paid. Only the crucible can make the sacrifice. December 20th. The Wrong One. When I opened my eyes, I was back in my bedroom, I stared up at my blue ceiling, trying to figure out how I got here. We had ripped, but it couldn't have been because of John. I knew that much because he was lying on my bedroom floor, unconscious. It must have been someone else. Someone who was more powerful than an incubus. Someone who knew about the 18th moon. Someone who had known everything all along including the one thing I was just starting to figure out for myself right now. Liv was shaking John, still sobbing. Wake up, John. Please, wake up. He opened his eyes for a second, confused. What the hell? She threw her arms around him. Not hell, not even heaven. Where am I? He was disoriented. My room. I sat up and leaned against the wall. How did I get here? Don't ask. I wasn't about to try to explain that the Lilum had somehow transported us here. I was more worried about what it meant. It wasn't John Breed. And there was someone I had to talk to. December 21st plain English. I knocked on the door and stood waiting in a pale yellow circle of porch light. I stared at the door, shifting my weight uncomfortably, my hands jammed in my pockets, wishing I wasn't there, wishing my heart would stop pounding. She was going to think I was crazy. Why wouldn't she? I was beginning to think so myself. I saw the bathrobe first, then the fuzzy slippers and the glass eye. 
Ethan? What are you doing out there? Are you with Mitchell? Mrs. English peeked outside, patting her plastic curlers as if there was a way to make them look more attractive. No, ma'am. She looked disappointed and switched to her classroom voice. Do you have any idea how late it is? It was nine. Can I come in for a minute? I really need to talk to you. Well, not you. Not you, exactly. Now? It'll only take a minute. It's about the crucible. Just not the one you taught us about. That finally got her, like I knew it would. I followed her into the parlor for the second time, but she didn't remember. The collection of ceramic figurines on the mantel over the fireplace was lined up perfectly again, as if nothing had ever happened there. The only giveaway was the spidery plant. It was gone. I guess some things were too broken to fix. Please, have a seat, Ethan. I automatically sat in the flowered chair and then stood right up because there was nowhere else to sit in the tiny room. No son of Gatlin would sit while a lady stood. I'm fine standing. You go ahead, ma'am. Mrs. English adjusted her glasses as she sat down. Well, I have to say, this is a first. Any time now. Wait on in. Ethan, did you want to tell me something in particular about the crucible? I cleared my throat. This might sound sort of weird, but I need to talk to you. I'm listening. Don't think about it. Say the words. She'll hear you somehow. Yeah, well, that's sort of the thing. I don't need to talk to you. I need to talk to, you know, only you don't know, the other you. Pardon me? The Lilum, ma'am. First of all, it's pronounced Lillian, but I hardly think it's appropriate for you to call me by my first name, she faltered. It must be confusing, my friendship with your father. I didn't have time for this. The Demon Queen, is she there? I beg your pardon? Don't stop. The Wheel of Fate, the Endless River. Can you hear me? Mrs. English stood up. Her face was red and she was the angriest I'd ever seen her. Are you on drugs? Is this some kind of a prank? I looked around the room, desperate. My eyes stopped on the figurines on the mantel, and I walked over to them. The moon was a stone, pale and round, a full circle with a crescent shape carved on top of it. We need to talk about the moon. I'm calling your father. Keep trying. The eighteenth moon. Does that mean anything to you? Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her reach for the phone. I reached for the moon. The room filled with light. Mrs. English froze in her chair, holding the phone, the room fading around her. I was at the Temporis Porta, but the doors were wide open. There was a tunnel on the other side, the walls crudely covered in mortar. I stepped through the doors. The tunnel was small, the ceiling so low I had to crouch down as I walked. There were marks on the wall, thin lines that looked as if someone was using them to count. I followed the tunnel a half a mile or so when I saw the rotted wooden stairs. Eight steps. There was a wooden hatch at the top with an iron ring hanging down toward the stairs. I climbed them carefully, hoping they held my weight. When I reached the top, I had to slam my shoulder against the wooden hatch to get it open. Sunlight flooded into the tunnel as I pulled myself out. I was in the middle of a field, a path just beyond where I was standing. Not a path so much as two snaking parallel lines where the tall, waving grass was worn down to dirt. The fields on either side looked gold, like corn and sunshine, 
not brown like lovers and drought. The sky was blue, what I had come to think of as Gatlin blue, thin and cloudless. Hello? Are you there? She wasn't there, and I couldn't believe where I was. I would have recognized it anywhere. I had seen enough pictures of this place. My great-great-great-great-granddaddy Ellis Waite's plantation. He was the one who had fought and died on the other side of Route 9 during the Civil War, right here. I could see my house and his, Waite's landing in the distance. It was hard to tell if it looked the same, except for the haint blue shutters staring back at me. I looked down at the hatch, hidden by the dirt and grass, and understood instantly. It was the tunnel that led to the pantry in the cellar at my house. I had come out on the other side, the safe side, where slaves using the underground railroad could lose themselves in the thick fields. Why did the Temporis Porta bring me here? What was the Lilum doing at my family's farm more than a hundred fifty years in the past? Lilum, where are you? Half of a rusty bicycle lay in a heap by the side of the road. At least, it looked like part of a bicycle. I could see where the metal had been sawed off in the middle and a hose threaded through the frame. It had been rigged to water the field. A pair of muddy rubber boots stood in the dirt next to the bike wheel. In the distance, the fields stretched as far as I could see. What do I have to do? I looked back down at the rusted half of a bike, and I knew. A tide of helplessness washed over me. There was no way I could water the field. It was too big and I was just one person. The sun was growing hotter, and the leaves were turning browner, and soon the field wouldn't be gold at all, but burnt and dead, like everything else. I heard the familiar hum of a swarm. The lubbers were coming. Why are you showing me this? I sat down in the dirt and stared up at the blue sky. I saw a fat bee, drunkenly buzzing in and out of the wildflowers. I felt the soil beneath me, soft and warm, even though it was dry. I pressed my fingers deeper into the dirt, dry as coarse sand. I knew why I was here. Whether or not I could finish it, I had to try. That's it, isn't it? I yanked on the hot, muddy boots and picked up the rusting metal wheel. I held the handlebars, pushing the wheel in front of me. I started watering the field, one row at a time. The wheel groaned as it turned, and the heat prickled my neck as I bent into the job, pushing as hard as I could through the bumps and ruts of the field. I heard a sound, like a massive stone door opening for the first time in a century, or an enormous stone being pushed out of the mouth of a cave. It was water, slowly coming up, returning to the field from whatever old pump or well the hose was attached to. I pushed harder. Water started to run through the dirt in rivulets. As it ran down the dry trenches in the field, it created tiny rivers that formed small rivers, which formed decent-sized rivers that I knew would eventually flood the path entirely, to form even bigger ones as far as I could see. An endless river. I ran fast as I could. I watched the spokes of the wheel turn faster, pumping the water harder, until the wheel was moving so fast that it looked like a blur— the force of the water was so strong that the irrigation hose split open like the back of a gutted snake. There was water everywhere. The dirt was turning to mud beneath my feet, and I was soaking wet. It was like I was riding a bike for the first time, like I was flying, doing something only I could do. I stopped, out of breath. The wheel of fate. I was staring at it, 
Rusty and bent and older than dirt, my wheel of fate, here in my hands, in my family's old field. I understood. It was a test, my test. It was mine all along. I thought about John lying on my bedroom floor, the Lillam's voice when she said he wasn't the crucible. It's me, right? I'm the crucible. I'm the one who is too. It was always me. I watched the field as it started to turn green and gold again. The heat subsided. The fat bee flew off into the sky because the sky was real, not just a painted bedroom ceiling. I heard the rumble of thunder, then the crack of lightning, and I stood in the middle of the field holding the rusty wheel as the rain began to fall. The air hummed with magic, like the feeling I had the first time I stepped onto the beach at the Great Barrier only a hundred times stronger. The sound was so loud, my ears were ringing. Lilum! I shouted with my mortal voice, sounding small in the middle of the massive field. I know you're here! I can feel it! I am! The voice echoed down from above, from the blinding blue sky. I couldn't see her, but she was there. Not the Mrs. English Lilum, but the real Lilum, in her nameless, formless state, all around me. I took a deep breath. I'm ready. And? It was a question. I knew the answer now. I know who I am, and what I have to do. Who are you? The question hung in the air. I looked up toward the sky, letting the sun fall on my face. I said the words I had been dreading since the moment they first whispered themselves in the deepest, darkest reach of my mind. I am the one who is too. I shouted it as loud as I could. I have one soul in the mortal world and one soul in the other world. My voice sounded different, sure. The one who is two. I waited in the silence. It was a relief to finally say it, like a crushing weight had been lifted off my back, like I had been holding up the burning blue sky. You are. There is no other. There wasn't a trace of emotion in her voice. The price must be paid to forge the new order. I know. It is a crucible, a severe test. You must be sure by the solstice. I stood there for a long time. I felt the cool air and the stillness. I felt all the things I hadn't felt since the order had changed. If I do this, then everything goes back to the way it was. Lena will be okay without me. The Council of the Far Keep will leave Marion and Liv alone. Gatlin will stop drying up and cracking open. I wasn't asking. I was bargaining. Nothing is certain, but... I stood there and waited for the Lilum to answer. There will be order again, a new order. If I was going to die, there was one more thing I wanted. And Amma won't have to pay whatever price she owes the Bukor. That bargain was made willingly. I cannot alter it. I don't care. Do it anyway. But I knew she wouldn't, even as I said it. There are always consequences. Like me, the crucible. I closed my eyes and thought about Lena and Amma and Link, Marion and my dad, my mom, all the people I loved, all the people I'd lost, 
the people I couldn't risk losing. There wasn't a lot to decide, not as much as I thought there would be. I guess some decisions are made before you make them. I took a step and found my way back into the light. Promise me. It is binding, an oath, a promise, as you call it. That wasn't good enough. Say it. Yes, I promise. Then she said a word that wasn't in any language or even any kind of sound I could understand, but the word itself sounded like thunder and lightning, and I understood the truth in it. It was a promise. Then I'm sure. A second later, I was standing in Lillian English's parlor again, while she lay collapsed in the flowered chair. I could hear my father's voice coming from the other end of the phone in her hand. Hello? Hello? My brain shifted to autopilot. I picked up the phone, hung up on my dad, and called 911 for the very mortal Lillian English. I had to put the phone down without saying a word because Sissy Honeycutt worked dispatch down at the station house and she'd recognize my voice for sure. I couldn't get caught at my unconscious English teacher's house twice. But it didn't matter. Now they had the address. They would send out the ambulance, like they did before. And mortal Mrs. English wouldn't remember I had been there at all. I drove straight to Ravenwood without stopping, without thinking, without turning on the radio or rolling down the window. I didn't remember how I got there. One minute I was driving through town, and the next I was pounding on Lena's front door. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was trapped in the wrong atmosphere, in some kind of terrible nightmare. I remember slamming my fist on the caster moon as many times as I could, but it didn't respond to my touch. Maybe there was no way to hide how different I was, how incomplete. I remember calling and crying and kelting her name until Lena finally opened the door in her purple Chinese pajamas. I remembered them from the night she told me her secret, that she was a caster, sitting on my front steps in the middle of the night. Now, sitting on hers, I told her mine. What happened after that was too painful to remember at all. We lay in Lena's old iron bed, tangled together like we could never be taken apart. We couldn't touch, but we couldn't not touch. We couldn't stop staring at each other, but every time our eyes met, it only hurt more. We were exhausted, but there was no way we could sleep. There wasn't enough time to whisper all the things we needed to say, but the words themselves didn't matter. We were only thinking one thing. I love you. We counted the hours, the minutes, the seconds. We were running out of all of them. December 21st. The last game. It was the last day. There was nothing left to decide. Tomorrow was the solstice and my mind was made up. I lay in my bed and stared up at my blue plaster ceiling, painted the color of the sky to keep the carpenter bees from nesting. One more morning. One more painted blue sky. I got home from Lena's and went back to sleep. I left my window open in case anyone wanted to see me, haunt me, or hurt me. No one came. I could smell the coffee and hear my dad walking around downstairs. Amma was at the stove. Waffles, definitely waffles. She must have been waiting for me to wake up. I decided not to tell my dad. After everything he'd gone through with my mom, I didn't think he would be able to understand. I couldn't stand to think what this might do to him. 
the way he went crazy when my mom died, I understood now. I had been too scared to let myself feel those things before. And now, when it didn't matter how I felt, I was feeling every one of them. Sometimes life was weird that way. Link and I tried to have lunch at the Dairy Keen, but we finally gave up. He couldn't eat, and I couldn't either. You know how prisoners get to choose their last meal, and it's such a big deal? It didn't work that way for me. I didn't want shrimp and grits or brown sugar pound cake. I couldn't keep anything down. And they can't give you the one thing you really want anyway. Time. Finally, we went to the basketball court at the elementary school playground and shot some hoops. Link let me win, which was weird because I used to be the one who let him win. Things had changed a lot in the last six months. We didn't talk much. Once he caught the ball and held it after I passed it to him. He was looking at me the same way he had when he sat down next to me at my mom's funeral. Even though the section was all roped off and only the family was supposed to sit there. I'm not good at this stuff, you know? Yeah, me neither. I pulled out an old comic I had rolled up in my back pocket. Something to remember me by. He unrolled it and laughed. Aquaman? I gotta remember you and your lame powers with this sucky comic? I shrugged. We can't all be Magneto. Hey, man. He dribbled the ball from one hand to the other. Are you sure you want to do this? No. I mean, I'm sure I don't want to, but I don't have a choice. Link understood about not having choices. His whole life was about not having them. He bounced the ball harder. And there's no other way. Not unless you want to hang out with your mom and watch the end of days. I was trying to make a joke, but my timing was always off now. Maybe my fractured soul was holding on to it. Link stopped dribbling and held the ball under his arm. Hey, Ethan. Yeah? Remember the Twinkie on the bus? The one I gave you in second grade the day we met? The one you found on the floor and gave me without telling me? Nice. He grinned and shot the ball. It never really fell on the floor. I made that part up. The basketball hit the rim and bounced into the street. We let it go. I found Marion and Liv in the archive, back together where they belonged. Aunt Marion... I was so relieved to see her that I almost knocked her out cold as I hugged her. When I finally let go, I could tell she was waiting for me to say it. Something, anything, about the reason they let her go. So I waded in, slowly, giving them bits and pieces of the story that didn't quite fit together. At first, they were both relieved to hear some good news. Gatlin and the mortal world wasn't going to be destroyed in a supernatural apocalypse. Casters weren't going to lose their powers or accidentally set themselves on fire, although in Seraphine's case, it had saved our lives. They heard what I wanted them to hear. Everything was going to be okay. It had to be. I was trading my life for it. That's the part I left out. But they were both too smart to let the story end there, and the more pieces I gave them, the quicker their minds fit the pieces together to create the twisted truth of it all. I knew exactly when the last piece slid into place. There was the terrible moment when I saw their faces change and the smiles fade. Liv wouldn't look at me. She was winding her selenometer compulsively, and twisting the strings she always wore around her wrist. We'll figure something out. We always do. There has to be another way. There isn't. 
I didn't need to say it. She already knew. Without a word, Liv untied one of the frayed strings and tied it onto my wrist. Tears were running down her cheeks, but she didn't look at me. I tried to imagine myself in her place, but I couldn't. It was too hard. I remembered losing my mom, staring at my suit laid out on the chair in the corner of my room, waiting for me to put it on and admit she was dead. I remembered Lena kneeling in the mud, sobbing the day of Macon's funeral, the sisters staring glassy-eyed at Aunt Prue's casket, handkerchiefs wadded in their hands. Who would boss them around and take care of them now? That's what no one tells you. It's harder to be the one left behind. I thought about Aunt Prue stepping through the last door so calmly. She was at peace. Where was the peace for the rest of us? Marion didn't say a word. She stared at me like she was trying to memorize my face and freeze this moment so she could never forget it. Marion knew the truth. I think she knew something like this was coming the moment the Council of the Keep let her come back. Nothing came without a price. And if it had been her, she would have done the same thing to protect the people she loved. I was sure Liv would have too. In her own way, that's exactly what she did for Macon, what John tried to do for her on the water tower. Maybe she felt guilty that it was me instead of him. I hoped she knew the truth, that it wasn't her fault, or my fault, or even his fault, no matter how many times I wanted to believe it was. This was my life, and this was how it was ending. I was the wayward, and this was my great and terrible purpose. It was always in the cards, the ones Amma was so desperate to change. It was always me. But they didn't make me say any of that. Marion gathered me up in her arms, and Liv wrapped her arms around us both. It reminded me of the way my mom always hugged me, like she would never let go if she had a choice. Finally, Marion whispered something softly. It was Winston Churchill, and I hoped I would remember it wherever I was going. This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is, perhaps, the end of the beginning. December 21st. Remainders. Lena wasn't in her bedroom at Ravenwood. I sat down on her bed to wait, staring up at the ceiling. I thought of something and picked up her pillow, rubbing it against my face. I remembered smelling my mom's pillowcases after she was gone. It was magic to me, a piece of her that still existed in my world. I wanted Lena to at least have that. I thought about Lena's bed, the time we broke it, the time the roof caved in on it, the time we broke up and the plaster had rained down on everything. I looked at the walls, thinking about the words that wrote themselves there the first time Lena told me how she felt. You're not the only one falling. Lena's walls weren't glass anymore. Her room was the same as it was the day we first met. Maybe that was how she was trying to keep things, the way it was at the beginning, when things were still full of possibility. I couldn't think about it. There were bits of words everywhere, I guess because that's how Lena felt things. Who can judge the judge? It didn't work like that. You couldn't reset the clock, not for anyone, not even for us. Not with a bang, but a whimper. What was done was done. I think she must have known, because she left a message for me, written across the walls of her room in black sharpie, 
like the old days. Demon math. What is just in a world you've ripped in two, as if there could be a half for me, a half for you? What is fair when there is nothing left to share? What is yours when your pain is mine to bear? This sad math is mine, this mad path is mine. Subtract, they say, don't cry, back to the desk. Try, forget addition, multiply, and I reply, this is why. Remainders hate division. I rested my head against the wall next to the words. Lena. She didn't respond. L, you're not a remainder. You're a survivor. Her thoughts came slowly in a jagged rhythm. I won't be able to survive this. You can't ask me to. I knew she was crying. I imagined her lying in the dry grass at Greenbrier. I would look for her there next. You shouldn't be alone. Wait for me. I'm coming. There was so much to say that I stopped trying to say it. Instead, I wiped my eyes with my sleeve and opened my backpack. I pulled out the spare Sharpie Lena kept there, the way people have a spare tire in the back of their car. For the first time, I uncapped it and stood on the girly chair in front of her old white dresser. It groaned under my weight, but it held. And I didn't have long anyway. My eyes were stinging, and it was hard to see. I wrote on her ceiling, where the plaster had cracked, where so many times other words, better words, more hopeful words, had appeared above our heads. I wasn't much of a poet, but I had the truth, and that was enough. I will always love you, Ethan. I found Lena lying in the charred grass at Greenbrier, the same place I had found her the day she shattered the windows in our English class. Her arms were flung over her head the same way they were that day, too. She stared up at the thin stretch of blue. I lay down next to her. She didn't try to stop the tears. It's different, you know that? The sky looks different now. She was talking, not Kelting. Suddenly talking was special. All the regular things were. It does? She took an uneven breath. When I first met you, that's what I remember. I looked up at the sky and thought, I'm going to love this person because even the sky looks different. I couldn't say anything. My breath was caught in my throat, but she wasn't finished. I remember the exact moment I saw you. I was in my car. You were playing basketball outside with your friends, and the ball rolled off the court, and you went to get it. You looked at me. I remember that. I didn't know you saw me. She smiled. See you? I almost crashed the hearse. I looked back up at the sky. Do you believe in love before first sight, L? Do you believe in love after last sight, Ethan? After death, that's what she meant. It wasn't fair. We should have been complaining about our curfews, trying to find a place besides the Dairy Keen where we could get summer jobs together. Worrying about whether or not we would get into the same college. Not this. She rolled away from me, sobbing and pulling at the grass with her hands. I wrapped my arms around her, holding her close. I brushed her hair aside carefully and whispered in her ear. Yes. What? I believe in love after death. She took a ragged breath. Maybe that's how I'll remember, Elle. Maybe remembering you 
is life after death for me. She turned to look at me. You mean the way your mom remembers you? I nodded. I don't know exactly what I believe in, but because of you and my mom, I know I believe. I believe, too. But I want you here. I don't care if it's a hundred degrees and every blade of grass dies. Without you, none of that matters to me. I knew how hard this was for her, because all I could think about was how much I didn't want to leave her. But I couldn't say that. It would only make it worse. We're not talking about dead grass. You know that. The world will destroy itself and the people we love. Lena was shaking her head. I don't care. I can't imagine a world without you in it. Maybe you can imagine the world I always wanted to see. I reached into my back pocket and pulled out the folded, beat-up map, the one that had been on my wall for so many years now. Maybe you can see it for me. I marked the roots in green. You don't have to use it, but I wish someone would. It's kind of something I was planning for a while. My whole life, actually. They're places from my favorite books. I remember. Her voice was muffled. Jack Kerouac. Or you can make your own. I felt her breath catch. Funny thing is, until I met you, all I wanted to do was to get as far away from here as I could. Kind of ironic, isn't it? Can't get much farther away than where I'm going, and now I'd give anything to stay. Lena put her hands on my chest, pushing herself away from me. The map dropped on the ground between us. Don't say that. You aren't doing it. I bent down and picked up the map that marked all the places I'd dreamed of going before I finally figured out where I belonged. Just hold on to it for me, then. Lena stared at the folded paper like it was the most dangerous thing in the world. Then she reached up and unhooked her charm necklace from around her neck. If you hold this for me... L, no. But it was hanging in the air between us, and her eyes were begging me to take it. I opened my hand, and she dropped the necklace. The silver button, the red string, the Christmas tree star, all of her memories, into my hand. I reached out and lifted her chin so she was looking at me. I know this is hard, but we can't pretend it isn't happening. I need you to promise me something. What? Her eyes were red and swollen as she stared back at me. You have to stay here and bind the new order, or whatever your part is in all this. Otherwise, everything I'm about to do will be for nothing. You can't ask me to do that. I went through this when I thought Uncle Macon was dead, and you saw how well I handled that. Her voice cracked. I won't make it without you. Promise you'll try. No! Lena was shaking her head, her eyes wild. You can't give up. There has to be another way. There's still time. She was hysterical. Please, Ethan. I grabbed her and wrapped my arms around her, ignoring the way her skin burned mine. I would miss these burns. I would miss everything about her. Shh. It's okay, Elle. It wasn't. I swore to myself that I'd find a way back to her somehow, like my mom found her way back to me. That was the promise I made, even if I couldn't keep it. I closed my eyes and buried my face in her hair. I wanted to remember this. 
The feeling of her heart beating against mine as I held her. The smell of lemons and rosemary, which had led me to her before I even met her. When it was time, I wanted this to be the last thing I remembered. My last thought. Lemons and rosemary. Black hair and green and gold eyes. She didn't say a word, and I gave up trying, because you couldn't hear either one of us over the shattering noise of hearts breaking, and the looming shadow of the last word, the one we refused to say. The one that would come anyway, whether or not we said it. Goodbye. December 21st. Broken Bottles. Ama was sitting at the kitchen table when I got home. The cards and the crosswords and the red hots and the sisters were nowhere in sight. Only an old cracked Coke bottle sat on the table. It was from our bottle tree, the one that never caught the spirit Ama was looking for. Mine. I'd been rehearsing this conversation in my mind from the moment I realized the crucible was me, not John. Thinking of a hundred different ways to tell the person who loved me as much as my mom had that I was going to die. What do you say? I still hadn't figured it out, and now that I was standing in Amma's kitchen looking her in the eye, it seemed impossible but I had a feeling she already knew. I slid into the seat across from her. Amma, I need to talk to you. She nodded, rolling the bottle between her fingers. Did everything wrong this time, I reckon? Thought you were the one picking a hole in the universe? Turns out, it was me. This isn't your fault. When a hurricane hits, it's not the weatherman's fault any more than God's, no matter what Wesley's mama says. Either way, doesn't matter to those folks left without a roof over their heads, now does it? She looked up at me, defeated. But I think we both know this was all my doing, and this hole is too big for me to stitch up. I put my big hands over her small ones. That's what I needed to tell you. I can fix it. Amma jerked back in her chair, the worry lines in her forehead deepening. What are you talking about, Ethan Waite? I can stop it. The heat and the drought, the earthquakes, and the casters losing control of their powers. All of it. But you already knew that, didn't you? That's why you went to the Bokor. The color drained from her face. Don't you talk about that devil in this house. You don't know. I know you went to see him, Amma. I followed you. There was no time left to play games. I couldn't walk away without saying goodbye to her, even if she didn't want to hear it. I'm guessing this is what you saw in the cards, wasn't it? I know you were trying to change things, but the wheel of fate crushes us all, doesn't it? The room was so still that it felt like someone had sucked the air right out of it. That's what you said, isn't it? Neither one of us moved or breathed. For a second, Amma looked so spooked that I was sure she was going to bolt or douse the whole house in salt. But her face crumpled, and she rushed at me, clutching my arms like she wanted to shake me. Not you. You're my boy. The wheel doesn't have any business with you. This is my fault. I'm going to set it right. I put my hands on her thin shoulders, watching as the tears ran down her cheeks. You can't, Amma. I'm the only one who can. It has to be me. I'm going before the sun comes up tomorrow. Don't you say it. 
Not another word, she shrieked, digging her fingers into my arms like she was trying to keep from drowning. Amma, listen to me. No, you listen to me, she pleaded, her expression frantic. I've got it all worked out. There's a way to change the cards. You'll see, made a deal of my own. You just have to wait. She was muttering to herself like a madwoman. I've got it all worked out. You'll see. Amma was wrong. I wasn't sure if she knew it, but I did. This is something I have to do. If I don't, you and Dad, this whole town will be gone. I don't care about this town, she hissed. It can burn to the ground. Nothing's gonna happen to my boy. You hear me? Amma whipped her head around the room from one side to the other like she was looking for someone hiding in the shadows. When she looked back at me, her knees buckled and her body swayed dangerously to one side. She was going to pass out. I grabbed Amma's arms and pulled her up as her eyes locked on mine. Already lost your mama. Can't lose you, too. I lowered her into one of the chairs and knelt next to it, watching as she slowly came back to herself. Take deep breaths. I remembered hearing Thelma say that to Aunt Mercy when she had one of her fainting spells, but we were way past deep breaths. Amma tried to wave me off. I'm all right. Long as you promise me you won't do anything stupid, I'm gonna stitch this mess back together. I'm just waiting on the right thread. One dipped in the Bacor's brand of black magic, I was willing to bet. I didn't want the last thing I said to Amma to be a lie, but she was beyond reason. There was no way I'd be able to convince her that I was doing the right thing. She was sure there was some kind of loophole like Lena. All right, Amma, let's get you to your room. She held on to my arm as she stood up. You have to promise me, Ethan, wait. I looked her right in the eye. I won't do anything stupid. I promise. It was only half a lie, because saving the people you love isn't stupid. It isn't even a choice. But I still wanted the last thing I said to Amma to be as true as the sun rising. So after I helped her into her favorite chair, I hugged her tight and whispered one last thing. I love you, Amma. There was nothing truer. The front door slammed as I pulled Amma's bedroom door shut. Hey, everybody, I'm home, my dad's voice called from the hall. I was about to answer when I heard the familiar sound of another door opening. I'll be in the study. I have lots of reading to do. It was ironic. My dad spent all his time researching the 18th moon, and I knew more about it than I wanted to. As I walked back through the kitchen, I saw the old Coke bottle sitting on the table, exactly where Amma left it. It was too late to catch anything in that bottle, but I picked it up anyway. I wondered if there were bottle trees where I was going. On my way to my room, I passed the study where my dad was working, he was sitting at my mom's old desk, the light filling up the room, his work, and the caffeinated coffee he'd smuggled into the house. I opened my mouth to say something. I didn't know what, just as he rummaged in the drawer for his earplugs, twisting them into his ears. Goodbye, Dad. I rested my forehead on the doorway in silence. I let things be what they were. He would know the rest soon enough. It was after midnight when Lena finally cried herself to sleep. 
I was sitting on my bed reading of mice and men one last time. Over the last few months, my memories had faded so much that I couldn't remember a lot of it anyway. I still remembered one part, though. The end. It bothered me every time I read it. The way George shot Lenny while he was telling Lenny about the farm they were going to buy one day. The one Lenny would never see. When we read the novel in English class, everyone agreed that George was making this big sacrifice by killing his best friend. It was ultimately a mercy kill, because George knew Lenny was going to be hanged for accidentally killing the girl at the ranch. But I never bought it. Shooting your best friend in the head instead of making a run for it doesn't seem like a sacrifice to me. Lenny made the sacrifice, whether he knew it or not, which was the worst part. I think Lenny would have knowingly sacrificed himself for George in a minute. He wanted George to get that farm, to be happy. I knew my sacrifice wasn't going to make anyone happy, but it was going to save their lives. That was enough. I also knew none of the people who loved me would let me make that kind of sacrifice for them, which is why I was pulling on my jeans at one in the morning. I took one last look around my room, the shoeboxes stacked along the walls that held everything important to me, the chair in the corner where my mother sat when she visited me two months ago the piles of my favorite books hidden under my bed, and the swivel chair that hadn't swiveled the time Macon Ravenwood sat in it. I wanted to remember it all. As I swung my leg over the windowsill, I wondered if I would. The Somerville Water Tower loomed above me in the moonlight. Most people probably wouldn't have picked this place, but this is where it happened in the dreams, so I knew it was right. I was taking a lot of things on faith lately. Knowing you don't have much time left changes things. You get kind of philosophical, and you figure things out. More like they figure themselves out, and everything gets real clear. Your first kiss isn't as important as your last. The math test really didn't matter. The pie really did. The stuff you're good at and the stuff you're bad at are just different parts of the same thing. Same goes for the people you love and the people you don't, and the people who love you and the people who don't. The only thing that mattered was that you cared about a few people. Life is really really short. I took Lena's charm necklace out of my back pocket and looked at it one last time. Then I reached through the open window of the Volvo and dropped it on the seat. I didn't want anything to happen to it when this was all over. I was glad she gave it to me. I felt like part of her was here with me. But I was alone, I wanted it this way. No friends, no family, no talking, no Kelting, not even Lena. I wanted to let things feel the way they really were. The way things felt was terrible. The way things were was worse. I could feel it now. My fate was coming for me. My fate. And something else. The sky ripped open a few feet from where I was standing. I expected Link to step out of the darkness with a pack of Twinkies or something, but it was John Breed. What's going on? Are Macon and Liv okay? I asked. Yeah, everyone's fine, all things considered. Then what are you doing here? He shrugged, flipping the top of his lighter open and closed. I thought you might need a wingman. Why? To push me over the edge? I was only half kidding. He snapped the lighter shut. Let's just say it's harder than you think when you're up there. Besides, you were there with me, right?
It was twisted logic, but things were pretty twisted. I didn't know what to say. It was hard to believe he was the same dirtbag who'd kicked my ass at the fair and tried to steal my girlfriend. He was a halfway decent guy now. Falling in love can do that to you. Thanks, man. What's it like? I mean, on the way down? John shook his head. Trust me, you don't want to know. We walked toward the water tower. An enormous white moon blocked the light of the real one. The white metal ladder was only a few feet away. I knew she was behind me before John sensed her and spun around. Ama. Nobody else smelled like pencil lead and red hots. Ethan, wait! I was there the day you were born, and I'll be there the day you die, from this side or the other. I kept walking. Her voice grew louder. Either way, it won't be today. John sounded amused. Damn, wait. You sure have a creepy family, for a mortal. I braced myself for the sight of Ama armed with her beads and her dolls, and maybe the Bible, too. But when I turned around, my eyes fell on the tangled braids and snakeskin-wrapped staff of the Bacor. The Bacor smiled back at me. I see you haven't found your tibonage, or have you? It's easier to find than to capture, isn't it now? Don't you talk to him, Ama snapped. Whatever the Bacor was here for, it obviously wasn't to talk me down off the ledge. Ama! I called her name and she turned back to face me. For the first time, I could see how lost she was. Her sharp brown eyes were confused and nervous, her proud posture bent and broken. I don't know why you brought that guy here, but you shouldn't be mixed up with someone like him. The Bacor threw his head back and laughed. We have a deal, the seer and me, and I intend to fulfill my end of the bargain. What deal? I asked, but Ama shot the Bacor a look that said keep your mouth shut. Then she waved me over, the way she used to when I was a kid. That's nobody's business except mine and my makers. You come on home, and he'll go back to where he belongs. I don't think she's asking, John said. He looked over at Ama. What if Ethan doesn't want to go? Ama's eyes narrowed. I knew you'd be here, the devil on my boy's shoulder. I can still see a thing or two, and you're dark as a piece of coal in the snow, no matter what color your eyes are. That's why I brought some darkness of my own. The Bacor wasn't here for me or my fractured soul. He was here to make sure John didn't get in Amma's way. John put his hands up in mock surrender. I'm not trying to make Ethan do anything. I came as a friend. I heard the sound of bottles clinking. That's when I noticed the string of bottles tied to the Bacor's belt, like the kind you found on bottle trees. The Bacor held one in front of him, his hand on the corked stopper. I brought some friends, too. He uncorked the bottle, and a thin trail of dark mist escaped. It swirled slowly, almost hypnotically, until it formed the body of a man. But this sheer didn't look like the others I'd seen. His limbs were mangled and awkwardly bent in unnatural positions. His facial features were grotesque, and whole pieces were missing where they seemed to have rotted away. He looked like a zombie from a horror movie, torn and broken. His eyes were unfocused and vacant. John took a step back. You mortals are even more screwed up than supernaturals. What the hell is that? I couldn't stop staring at it. The Bacor threw some kind of powder on the ground around him. One of the souls of the unclaimed. When families don't tend to their dead, I come for them. 
Smiling, he shook the bottle in front of him. I felt sick. I thought trapping evil spirits in bottles was one of Amma's crazy superstitions. I didn't know there were evil voodoo practitioners trolling graveyards with old Coke bottles. The tortured spirit moved toward John, its expression frozen in a terrifying and silent scream. John opened his hands in front of him, the way Lena always did. Back up, Ethan. I don't know what this thing's gonna do. I stumbled back as flames surged from John's hands. He didn't pack as much power as Lena or Seraphine did, but there was still plenty of fire. The flames hit the spirit, enveloping it. I could see the outline of its limbs and body in the center of the blaze, its face frozen in an eternal scream. Then the mist dissipated, and the form vanished. Within seconds, the dark mist was spiraling in front of the fire, until the spirit was hovering a few feet away. Yes, that didn't work. John rubbed his hands on his jeans. I haven't. The unclaimed flew at John, but it didn't stop when it reached him. The dark mist flew inside him, almost disappearing completely when John ripped. The spirit was forced out violently, like it was being sucked backward into a vacuum. John materialized a few feet away, shocked. He ran his hands over his body, like he was trying to see if anything was missing. The spirit was spiraling up through the mist, unfazed. What did that thing do to you? John was still trying to shake it off. It was trying to get inside me. Dark spirits need a body to possess if they're going to do any real damage. I heard the sound of clinking glass again. The bakor was opening the bottles, and a shadowy mist rose slowly from each one. Look, he's got more of them. We're screwed, John said. Amma, stop it! I yelled, but it didn't matter. Amma's arms were crossed, and she looked more determined and crazy than I'd ever seen her. You come on home with me, and he'll fill those bottles back up faster than you can spill a glass of milk. This time Amma had gone so dark that I didn't know how to find her or bring her back. I looked at John. Can't you make them disappear or turn them into something? John shook his head. I don't have any powers that work on angry, unclaimed spirits. Circles of smoke floated into the air as someone stepped out from the shadows. Fortunately, I happen to have a few. Macon Ravenwood took a couple of puffs on the cigar he was holding. Ah, Marie, I am disappointed. This is not your finest hour. Ama pushed past the bakor, the bottle still tied to his belt, rattling dangerously. She pointed a bony finger at Macon. You would do the same thing for your niece, quicker than a sinner would steal money out of the collection plate, Melchizedek. Don't you stand there with your high and mighty, because I won't let my boy be your sacrificial lamb. The Bakor released another unclaimed spirit behind Amma. Macon watched it rise into the air. Excuse me, sir. I'm going to have to ask you to collect your belongings and be on your way. My friend was not thinking straight when she procured your services. Grief addles the brain, you know. The Bakor laughed, pointing his staff at one of the spirits and guiding it in Macon's direction. I'm not a hired hand, Caster. The bargain she made with me can't be undone. The spirit circled once and shot down toward Macon, its mouth torn and slack. Macon closed his eyes and I shielded mine, anticipating the blinding green light that had almost destroyed hunting. But there was no light. It was the opposite a complete absence of light. Darkness. A wide circle of absolute blackness formed in the sky above the unclaimed spirit. It looked like one of those satellite pictures of a hurricane, except there were no churning winds. This 
was a real hole in the sky. The unclaimed turned as the black hole pulled it across the sky like a magnet. When the spirit hit the outer edge of the hole, it disappeared, little by little, as it was sucked inside. It reminded me of the way my hand disappeared into the grate outside the Lunai Libri. Except this didn't look like an illusion. When the spirit's hazy fingers were finally swallowed by the void, the hole closed and vanished. Did you know he could do that? John whispered. I don't even know what he did. The Bokor's eyes widened, but he wasn't deterred. He pointed his staff at the remaining spirits one by one, and their broken forms jerked toward Macon. Ink black holes opened up behind each of them, dragging the unclaimed inside. Then the holes disappeared like the pop of fireworks. One of the empty bottles slipped out of the Bacor's hand and dropped to the ground. I heard it crack against the dry earth. Macon opened his eyes and met the Bacor's calmly. As I said before, your services are no longer required. I suggest you return to your hole in the ground before I create one for you. The Bacor opened a crude pouch and scooped a handful of the chalky white powder he had sprinkled on the ground around him. Amma backed away, raising the bottom of her dress so it didn't drag across the powder. The Bacor lifted his hand and blew the particles at Macon. They blew through the air like ash, but before they reached Macon, another black hole opened and sucked them in. Macon rolled his cigar between his fingers. Sir, and I use the term loosely, unless you have something more, I suggest you take your walking stick home. Or what, Castor? Or the next one will be for you. The Bacor's eyes glittered in the darkness. This was a mistake, Ravenwood. The old woman owes me a debt, and she will pay it, in this life or the next. You should not have interfered. He threw something to the ground, and smoke rose from the place where it hit. When the smoke cleared, he was gone. He can travel? That was impossible. Macon walked toward us. Parlor tricks from a third-rate magician. John stared at Macon in awe. How did you do whatever you just did? I knew you could create light, but what was that? Patches of darkness. Holes in the universe, I suppose, he answered. It's not a particularly pleasant business. But you're a light caster now. How can you create darkness? I'm a light caster now but I was an incubus long before that. In some of us, both light and darkness exist. You should know that better than anyone, John. John was about to say something else when Amma called out across the thin stretch of dirt between us. Melchizedek Ravenwood, this is the last time I'm asking you to stay out of my affairs. You take care of your family, and I'll see to mine. Ethan, wait. We're leaving this minute. I shook my head. I can't. Amma pointed at Macon with a venomous look in her eye. This is your doing. I will never forgive you for this. You hear me? Not today or tomorrow or when I see you in hell for the sins we've both committed for the one I'm about to commit. Amma sprinkled something around her feet, creating a circle. The white crystals glittered like snowflakes. Salt. Amari! Macon called out to her, but his voice was gentle. He knew she was coming unhinged. Aunt Delilah, Uncle Abner, Aunt Ivy, Grandma Masala, I'm in need of your intercession. Amma stared up into the black sky. 
You're the blood of my blood, and I call you to help me fight the one who's threatening what I love most. She was calling the greats, trying to turn them on Macon. I felt the weight of it, her desperation, her madness, her love. But it was too tangled with the wrong things to be right. Only she couldn't see it. They won't come, I whispered to Macon. She tried to call them before, and they didn't show. Well, perhaps they lacked the proper motivation. I followed Macon's eyes up beyond the water tower, and I could see the figures looming above us in the moonlight. The greats, Amma's ancestors from the other world, they had finally answered her. Amma pointed at Macon. He's the one trying to hurt my boy and take him out of this world. You stop him. Do what's right. The greats stared down at Macon, and for a second I held my breath. Sulla had strands of beads wrapped around her wrist like a rosary from a religion all her own. Delilah and Ivy were at her sides, watching Macon. But Uncle Abner was looking right at me, his eyes searching mine. They were huge and brown and full of questions. I wanted to answer them, but I wasn't sure what he was asking. He found the answers somehow, because he turned to Sulla and spoke to her in Gulla. Do what's right, Amma called out into the darkness. The greats looked at Amma and joined hands. Then they slowly turned their backs to her. They were doing what was right. Amma let out a strangled scream and dropped to her knees. No! The greats were still holding hands, facing the moon, when they disappeared. Macon put his hand on my shoulder. I'll take care of Amari, Ethan whether she wants me to or not. I started walking toward the rusty metal ladder. Do you want me to come with you? John called after me. I shook my head. This was something I had to do alone. As alone as you can be when half of your soul is trailing you everywhere you go. Ethan, it was Macon. I held the side of the ladder I couldn't turn around. So long, Mr. Waite. That was it, a handful of meaningless words, all there was left to say. You'll take care of her for me. It wasn't a question. I will, son. I tightened my hands on the ladder in front of me. No, my boy! I heard Amma screaming, and the sound of her feet kicking as Macon held her back. I started climbing. Ethan Lawson, wait! With every ragged scream, I pulled myself higher, the same thought playing over and over again in my mind. The right thing and the easy thing are never the same. December 22nd Finally, I was standing on the top of the white water tower, facing the moon. I had no shadow, and if there were any stars, I couldn't see them. Somerville was stretched out before me, a scattering of tiny lights, all the way to the blackness of the lake. This had been our happy place, mine and Lena's, one of them at least. But I was alone now. I wasn't feeling happy. I wasn't feeling anything but fear, and like I wanted to throw up. I could still hear Amma screaming. I knelt for a second, resting my hands on the painted metal. I looked down and saw a heart drawn in black sharpie. I smiled, remembering, and stood up. It is time. There is no turning back now. I stared out at the tiny lights, waiting to get up the courage to do the unthinkable. 
The dread turned in my stomach, heavy and wrong. But this was right. As I closed my eyes, I felt the arms slam into my waist, knocking the air out of me, dragging me down to the metal ladder. I caught a glimpse of him, of me, when my jaw hit the side of the railing and I stumbled. He was trying to stop me. I tried to throw him off. I leaned forward and saw my chucks kicking. Then I saw his chucks kicking. They were so old and thrashed, they could have been mine. This was how I remembered it from the dream. This was how it was supposed to be. What are you doing? This time, he was asking me. I threw him against the floor, and he landed on his back. I grabbed the collar of his shirt, and he grabbed mine. We looked into each other's eyes, and he saw the truth. We were both going to die. It seemed like we should be together when it happened. I pulled out the old Coke bottle Amma had left sitting on the kitchen table earlier. If a whole bottle tree could catch a whole lot of lost souls, maybe one Coke bottle could hold on to mine. I've been waiting. I saw his face change, his eyes widen. He lunged at me. I wouldn't let go. We stared into each other's eyes and clawed at each other's throats as we rolled over the edge of the water tower and fell. The whole way down, I was only thinking one thing. Lena. Acknowledgements Three moons and more than 1,600 pages from the day we sat down to prove to a few smack-talking teenagers that we could write a book, our extended caster family couldn't even fit on one or two pages if we tried to name you all. We are grateful to all of our incredibly talented publishers in the 38 countries that have welcomed the beautiful creatures' novels into their world. You have shown our readers, ourselves, and the casters of Gatlin County many kindnesses. We are grateful to our writer and reader friends, our agent and editor friends, our online and marketing PR friends, our teacher and librarian friends and our bookstore friends. We owe a huge debt to our translator friends, particularly Dr. Sarah Lindheim, our classicist and keeper. More than anything, we are grateful to the teens, and the teens at heart, who read our books, and particularly our caster girl and boy beta readers, who are infamously brutal editors, and who, we hope, will one day make other writers weep more loudly than they have us. Good Lord willin' and the creek don't rise.